Christianity, a faith embraced by over 2.4 billion people globally, has its roots deeply intertwined with the life and teachings of Jesus. However, many followers, often raised within the faith, may not have delved into its historical origins. Traditionally, researchers have primarily focused on Jewish influences in the formation of Christianity. Yet, this perspective overlooks the significant impact of the Roman world, a civilization rich with a plethora of deities and diverse cultural influences on the development of this religion. In our documentary, we embark on a fascinating journey to explore the true genesis of Christianity. We'll delve into its foundational texts and uncover the substantial influence of Greek and Roman culture and mythology on the core narratives of this globally practiced religion. Prepare to embark on an enlightening journey that may redefine your understanding of Christianity's beginnings. Are we on a pursuit of wanting to actually understand the origins of Christianity? Much of the world has pulled on the same yarn, which tells you that Jesus is absolutely unique with no comparisons. He is the one and only true son of God who was born by divine parentage into the troubling world, lived a noble life and faced death in a unique way. After his death, it was attributed to him that he overcame death by physically rising again, appearing to many of his disciples, then ascended into the heavens by a cloud where he was expected to return from this near end of all things. This was all prophesied long Long ago in the law and the prophets, according to the first and second century authors. What if I told you that most of the claims attributed to Jesus are not only found in other figures, but that many of such characters predate Jesus? Would this pique your interest? Are we still on a pursuit of truth? This documentary will reveal much about the original setting where Christianity was born. If we meet the parents of Christianity and visit the place where she was born, we could learn a ton about who she is, and why she acts a certain way. We hope to reveal ideas you will never hear taught in a church sermon. You will never hear accurately represented by Christian apologists, but will absolutely find from critical scholarship like Dr. Richard C. Miller. This video is based off of his 2015 Rutledge publication, Resurrection and Reception in Early Christianity. We will expose you to early Christian voices who not only saw Jesus compared to other figures, but couldn't avoid having to explain why he looked so much like the non-Jewish gods, demigods, Caesars, etc. The very air they breathed was Greek and Roman, and every street corner had the cult of some deity being venerated. The earliest literary works of Christianity happened to be penned by a Hellenized Jewish Pharisee named Paul, who believed it was his calling to target the non-Jewish world with his gospel of Jesus Christ. This non-Jewish world had already married the Jewish world centuries before with Hellenism, penetrating even the most devout Jewish circles among the Dead Sea sects. Did Paul really become all things to all men? Would his gospel be relatable to his Greek audiences? What we will learn. Have you ever wondered where the stories about Jesus rising from the dead come from? Let's dive deep into this mystery, looking way back to times even before these stories were written. One of the first clues comes from a piece written in 150 AD by a guy named Justin Martyr. He mentions that the tales of Jesus have a lot in common with old stories from Greek and Roman myths, where heroes had incredible adventures, sometimes even became gods. But Justin believed that these myths were actually copying the true story of Jesus, not the other way around. We will compare Jesus's story with ancient myths, like the one about Romulus, who was said to have started the city of Rome. Legends say he was taken up into the sky and became a god. Sounds familiar, right? The big question is whether stories like Romulus's influenced the ones about Jesus. 
The study isn't just about figuring out where the stories come from. It's also about understanding how the first followers of Jesus saw these stories. Were they making their own version of popular myths, or were they using well-known storytelling techniques from their time? This research hopes to show how the stories of Jesus fit into the bigger picture of ancient culture and books. We will learn how the Greek and Roman world plays a significant role in the origins of the Christ movement and its literature. We will show you how contemporary Caesars were competitive political models that the Christ movement tried to imitate and subvert with their own gospel. We will grasp the gospels in a way that you may never have understood before. Also, we will see why Jesus' body needed to go missing as part of the resurrection narratives. Most experts today think that the tales about Jesus' resurrection either come from old Jewish traditions or are totally unique. But this new study says it's not that simple. It suggests that these stories mixed both ancient local languages, and popular stories from Greece and Rome. By untangling these influences, researchers hope to get a clearer picture of the earliest Christian stories and what they truly meant. Understanding what a translation fable is and how it relates to Jesus will probably shock most. Let's dive into the earliest Christian fathers and reveal how it's related to Jesus. Now, Let's turn to what the earliest Christian intellectual defending Christianity has to say. Justin's Confession Not only do the earliest great minds of Christianity confess to Jesus comparing to other Greek-Roman deities and demigods, as well as the Caesars, they were forced to do so. What do I mean by forced? The apologist will happily grin to this admission because they love to try discounting their Christian fathers when they clearly compare Jesus with the other gods. They eloquently try escaping these admissions by fathers such as Justin Martyr by assuming he is actually exaggerating or even lying when comparing Jesus. Dr. Miller and MythVision actually take their words for what they actually say. That is the Christian apologist in antiquity. But we might ask, you said, forced, Derek? Why forced? The apologists assumed these Christians were forced to say what they said under threat of their lives. Meaning, we shouldn't actually believe them when they say things like, we will show soon. Dr. Miller and MythVision will say he was forced to compare because it was flat out obvious. Just an analogy. Imagine in the year 2030, that's 2030, a cult developed around a man who wore a black suit and cape. He had an underground lair. He fought off bad people and had a very close affinity to bats. Sometimes at night, his symbol can be seen in the sky with the shape of a bat. He's practically a genius and has been said to survive death before. We might scoff and shout, duh, that's Batman. Though Batman is extremely fictional, I want to point out a few things. You wouldn't know this was Batman if it weren't for the comic books and movies in the 20th and 21st centuries. This historical and cultural context might even help us nail down the where and why this 2030, the year 2030, cult started. We can safely say, without the knowledge of Batman, we might be scratching in the dark trying to explain this cult that had its origins in 2030. Well-known academic John Dominic Crossan had a debate with a Muslim scholar, Shabir Ali, and during their exchange, Crossan pointed out that if Muhammad existed in the first century and he didn't claim to be a son of a god, he would have been lost to history. No one would even care about who Muhammad was due to the obvious importance of having divine pedigree. If you weren't a son of a god, then you weren't important. You could say that these sons of gods were the Hollywood celebrities of antiquity. As Dr. Richard C. Miller points out, these sons of god usually have translation fables, which we will explain further in this documentary. That was the ancient hall of fame of anyone worthy of veneration or even worship. Now let's turn to the earliest Christian apology, aka, or better known as defense, for Christianity by Justin Martyr in 150 CE. Quote, when we affirm that the Logos, 
God's firstborn begotten without a sexual union, namely our teacher Jesus Christ, was crucified, died, rose, and ascended to heaven, we are conveying nothing new with respect to those whom you call the sons of Zeus, Hermes, the interpreting word and teacher of all, Asclepius, who though he was a great healer, was struck by a thunderbolt and so ascended to heaven, and Dionysus too, after he had been torn limb from limb, and Heracles, once he had committed himself to the flames to escape his toils, and the sons of Leda, and the Dioscuri, and Perseus, son of Danae, and Bellerophon, who though sprung from mortals, rose to heaven on the horse Pegasus. For what shall I say of Ariadne and those like her who have been declared to be set among the stars? And what about the emperors who die among you, whom you deem worthy to be forever immortalized, and for whom you bring forward someone who swears to have seen Caesar, once having been consumed by fire, ascend into heaven from the funeral pyre. Justin, one apology, 21. Wow. Did you catch that? Dr. Miller opens his book with a powerful one-liner. Quote, Although we say the same things as the Greeks, we alone are hated, end quote. Justin, one apology, 24-1. Justin Martyr, a long time ago, wrote a piece called One Apology. In it, he basically said that stories about Jesus are similar to the legends and myths Romans told about their heroes and rulers. Imagine him saying, quote, Hey Romans, we have stories about Jesus just like you have about your legends. So why are you attacking us? End quote. This old writing gives us a peek into how early Christians thought about their stories. Some people think Justin was hinting that the tales about Jesus being born miraculously, his dramatic death, and coming back to life were inspired by popular myths of that time. Now this idea can be pretty surprising. Some ask, did Justin really suggest that early Christians took ideas from other legends when talking about Jesus? And if he did, wouldn't that hurt Christianity's message, especially in its early days? What's even more surprising is that Justin seemed to mention this idea casually, as if everyone knew it. He even included himself and other Christians in this way of thinking. The big question is, was Justin really saying that the stories about Jesus weren't that unique compared to other tales from that time? In Justin's apology, he challenged classical figures of ancient history, claiming that these respected deities were in reality demons. This defense didn't use traditional argument styles, but instead straightforwardly called these gods evil. Despite similarities between early Christian stories and Greek myths, the defense argued that Greek stories were influenced by evil forces, while the Christian narrative about Jesus was the genuine tell. However, there's a bit of inconsistency in the apology. On one hand, it acknowledges the shared themes between Greek and Christian stories, suggesting some influence. On the other, it dismisses the Greek stories as deceptive tales inspired by evil. If someone expects logical consistency from early Christian writings, this defense might seem contradictory. These contradictions may be due to the way the authors frame their argument, focusing more on persuasive storytelling than doctrine trinal accuracy. They were trying to position Christianity within the broader context of ancient wisdom. They even went so far as to say that ancient thinkers like Socrates, by understanding the universal wisdom that pervades everything, essentially knew Jesus Christ. In fact, they claim anyone who understood this universal wisdom was in a way a Christian, listing famous figures from various cultures who fit the bill. The main takeaway is that early Christian thinkers were not trying to blend or replace Greek or Roman thought with Christian beliefs. Instead, they were articulating a belief that Christian ideas had always been part of a broader shared wisdom. The defense essentially suggests that the stories about Jesus weren't new or groundbreaking, but followed themes familiar to many in ancient times. This was not a new perspective, but simply an acknowledgement of what many already believed. The text discussed how early Christian writings tried to show that their teaching stories were not just imitations of classical tales, but were older and truer. They argued, quote, 
In order that this also may become plain to you, only the things which we say and which we learned from Christ and the prophets who came before him are true, and they are older than all those who were, quote, the classical, in quote, writers, it is not merely because we say the same things as they do that we ask to be accepted by you, but because we say what is true, in quote. Justin, 1 Apology 23, 1. However, the writings did not offer any evidence to back this claim. They just stated that classical stories were inspired by demons to look like Christian stories, to undermine their truth and importance. According to these writings, the classical writers were tricked into creating characters and stories that resembled Christian ones. This argument suggests that early Christian teachings were trying to move away from being seen as just another myth or story. Instead, they wanted to be seen as historical fact. In fact, in Apology 21, Justin confesses that the two groups were identical in kind. When he says the Christ and the Greek Roman figures are of the same kind, he is suggesting we are doing nothing different than what you have done with your figures. Of course, he denigrates these others in the process, which again sounds contradictory. However, he wants to put Christ as morally superior and establish a monotheistic perception which condemns the other deities. This is an evolution, not revolution, with the established societal norms of Greek and Roman deities. Philosophers were criticizing the lack of asceticism and moral examples for people to follow. They were doing this with their own gods. Zeus was known as a god who laid the pipe on many mortal females, sometimes forcing himself, which was not a moral example for people to follow. In fact, well before Christianity, the Greek philosophers were already doing this, condemning and trying to allegorize these horrific actions by a deity. Saddens me to see people are gullible enough to find this argument by Justin convincing. It appears Justin is being rhetorical rather than operating the way modern apologists do by trying to be precise in some scientific way. Justin is practically saying, quote, stop killing us. We're doing the same damn thing as you guys, end quote. By the second century, there was a shift in how early Christians wanted their stories to be perceived. Initially, they were content with their stories fitting in with the popular classical tales of the time. But later, they wanted to elevate the stories about Jesus and the teachings of Christianity above all else, making them more special and unique. This was part of a larger aim to change the dominant cultural stories of the Roman world at the time. They felt the need to stress that their stories were not just another version of older tales, but were superior and truer. This was the main message in Justin's writings, especially in the passage titled One Apology 21. Justin, as well as other church fathers, rhetorically condemned these other stories, which they admit in simple terms look just like Jesus. They do so in order to differentiate their cultic claims. In group, Outgroup language is a very powerful weapon, even when no evidence is provided. Look at our current state of politics in the United States. All it takes is one side to condemn the other with words and all hell breaks loose. The tension between two groups and the othering language is often rhetorical, as Professor Elaine Pagels spells out in her book on the origins of Satan. Christians othered Jews as children of the devil, a liar from the beginning. In simple terms, Christianity walked like these other myths, talked like these other myths, smelled like these other myths, and looked like these other myths. But this one is true? Christianity was a subversive philosophy, which borrows all of its features from the existent structures, but then simultaneously establishing it as the true version. The Christ followers could both say they were the true continuation of Israel as well as the true fulfillment of the Greek and Roman world. They say that much in Paul's letters, especially with being the descendants of Abraham. The true descendants of Abraham are not genetic, they're the people of faith, and it kind of replaces the older model, claiming to be the ones born through it. That same idea from the Israel perspective is also in the Greek and Roman world. In a way, 
One could look to how Muslims in the 7th and 8th centuries posit that they have the true stories about these age-old biblical stories and how the Jews have distorted their texts. This late bloomer called Islam grows out of the Abrahamic vein, subverting the existing Judeo-Christian framework. In a way, this is exactly what Justin is doing for Christianity. Christianity evolved in various settings even ones not so central to Roman and Greek myths. You can find its adaptations to Eastern philosophical schools from the East, with the rise of Manichaeism, which didn't carry much of these mythology tropes. This should not surprise anyone. The continued investigation of stories about Jesus and these legendary earlier followers get pointed in several different lights. The continued invention of stories about Jesus and these legendary early followers gets painted in several different lights, depending on the cultural settings the Christian exists in. Dr. Miller is in good hands with his points as the legendary Jonathan Z. Smith also aligns with these observations. Christian writers tried to make their stories more prominent than ancient Greek and Roman myths. The famous poet William Blake once said, quote, the foundation of empire is art and science. Remove them or degrade them and the empire is no more. Empire follows art and not vice versa." End quote. The early Christians wanted to show that their tales were better than the classic ones from Greece and Rome. They did this by using powerful words and ideas. In the old times, imitating someone else's story was a way of giving a compliment, but it was also a way of competing. For example, Virgil's famous story, the Aeneid, took inspiration from the older tales by Homer. Philip Hardy, said about Virgil's story, quote, the audacity of embarking on a comprehensive imitation of Homer was compounded by the prevalent ancient view that Homer was not only the earliest poet writing in the grandest genre, but that he was a universal poet, the source of all later literature and wisdom, of almost godlike stature, and one who saw into the deepest mysteries of the universe. It is a mark of the success of the Aeneid's ambition that later centuries saw Virgil himself as a universal and almost divine poet. This act of literary aggrandizement also makes the Aeneid a peculiarly apt complement to the ideology of the new princeps Augustus, buttressed as it is by a claim to the universal power of Rome. Virgil's poetic triumph, as vividly described at the beginning of the Third Georgic, makes of him the fitting poet for the triumphator Augustus, the literary imperialist rides by the side of the military imperialist." End quote. While Virgil's Aeneid was a clear example of this imitation, later Christian writers like Justin and Tatian took a more aggressive approach against these classical tales. By the time Tertullian came around in around 200 AD, he had a very negative view of these classic stories and cultures. Justin, in his writing, took a bold stance against the cultural norms of his time. It's worth noting that in Justin's works, he didn't give any historical evidence to support the story of Jesus' resurrection. This suggests that the early Christians weren't trying to prove it as a historical fact, but rather used it differently than modern Christian thinkers do. Zeus's Sons and Jesus how unique were the stories about Jesus compared to tales of demigods and ancient Mediterranean myths? A historical source, Justin's Apology, suggested there might be more similarities than some would like to admit. Justin didn't just say, Jesus' story was kinda like Zeus's son's stories. He implied that people of that time saw Jesus in the same way they saw Zeus's demigod children, powerful beings born from the union of a god and a human. In fact, in the worlds of ancient Greece and Rome, many saw the main god of the Christian faith as a version of Zeus, or Jupiter as the Romans called him. This means they thought of Jesus as a kind of brother to Zeus's other half-human, half-god children. This observation raises two big points. It highlights how the Greek culture influenced Jewish thoughts and beliefs at that time. It shows how early Christianity grew from these Greek-influenced Jewish beliefs. Understanding this helps us see how different religious ideas mixed and merged in the ancient world. This didn't stop at religious ideas. Cattell Bertolo, in her fabulous book, Jews and Their Roman Rivals, spells out 
how Jews as well as Christians adopted many of their legal interpretations from the pagan Roman world, such as ideas like adoption and the contagious and attractive idea of giving people citizenship in the Roman identity. The Hellenized Apostle Paul literally uses these Roman concepts in his letters, which are foreign in their Jewish scriptures, often using them as interpretive glasses when interpreting the scriptures. This is obvious in the Talmud and the Mishnah as well. Adopting and adapting ideas in complementary and subversive ways permeated all throughout the world, Christianity is no exception. Hellenistic Judaism living with Greek culture. In the times when the Romans ruled places like the Levant, many Jews lived in the heart of Greek-influenced cities. Almost every big Greek-style city had a part where mainly Jews lived. Even though these Jews lived amidst Greek culture, they still held on to their unique Jewish identity. This caused a kind of constant tension as they were part of the city, but also seen as different. Now, not just Jews, but many others in these cities were influenced by Greek culture. But here's an interesting thing. This Greek influence wasn't just about copying Greek ways. Instead, it was about taking the best of Greek culture and making it a part of daily life. People wanted to show off their knowledge and appreciation of Greek culture, a bit like wearing the latest fashion. But when Jews adopted Greek styles, they did so in their own unique way. They might use Greek ways of doing things, but keep their Jewish names. Or they might use their traditional methods, but give them a Greek name. A famous example is Philo of Alexandria's work, where he portrayed Moses, a key figure in Judaism, as an even greater philosopher than famous Greek thinkers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Although such writings by Jews were influenced by Greek literature, they often linked more clearly to Jewish holy books. Even as they blended their traditions with Greek and Roman ways, Jews always held on to their unique identity. There was always a balance between fitting in and standing out, and this balance was essential for their identity. Non-Jewish folks also had their challenges. They tried to figure out how to live alongside Jewish communities, which sometimes led to more misunderstandings. In simple terms, during these times, being a Jew in a Greek-influenced city was a constant dance between fitting in with the Greek culture and holding holding on to a unique Jewish identity. In simpler terms, think of a time when two cultures met and tried to find common ground in their beliefs. There's a fascinating example from history where some ancient Greeks and Jews believed that their top gods, Zeus for the Greeks, and the god of Judaism were actually the same. Historian George H. Van Kooten wrote about how both these groups saw similarities between their deities, much like how another god, Amun, was linked to Zeus in Egypt. Historically, when one culture spreads its influence over another, they often tried to find parallels in religious beliefs. This made it easier for people from different backgrounds to get along and understand each other. For instance, when the Greeks, led by Alexander the Great and later by his successors, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, expanded their influence empire. They aimed to blend Greek and local customs. Part of this effort was to show that the local gods were just different versions of Greek gods. This policy is known as interpretatio Greca. The Greeks also physically transformed eastern cities, making them look more Greek. They used their advanced building techniques and resources to add features like marketplaces, gymnasia, places for physical training and beautiful walkways. These changes were often welcomed by local residents. They also revamped religious spaces to make them align with Greek religious customs. A clear example of this blending of traditions can be seen in two temples in Jerusalem. One temple on Mount Gerizim and another on Mount Moriah underwent changes where they blended the worship of the Jewish god with that of Zeus. The temple on Mount Gerizim was dedicated to Zeus Xenios, and the one on Mount Moriah to Zeus Olympios. While there was support for this fusion, there was also resistance, especially at the Mount Moriah temple. The Romans followed in the footsteps of the Seleucids and Ptolemies, using similar methods to integrate and spread their culture throughout their vast empire. This practice was dubbed Interpretatio Romana, a term introduced by Tacitus. Cicero, a famous Roman orator, once said, quote, Come now, do we assert that the gods actually go by the same names that they are called by us? Yet the names of the gods are as many as the human language is spoken, for it is not an issue with the gods 
but with us. You are Vilius wherever you go, but Vulcan is not Vulcan in Italy and in Africa and in Spain." End quote. This means that while people may have different names for the same god based on their language and culture, the essence of that god remains unchanged. The Romans often adopted the gods of other cultures, but gave them Roman names. They not only took the best aspects of Greek religion, but also sometimes claimed that their version was superior. When it came to the city of Jerusalem, things got a bit complicated. Emperor Caligula once tried to place a huge statue of Jupiter, a primary Roman god, in the main temple of Jerusalem, but didn't succeed due to his untimely death. However, Emperor Hadrian later managed to rebuild Jerusalem naming it Aelia Capitolina, and transformed the temple for the worship of Jupiter Capitolinus. This change was not well received by many Jews, leading to resistance movements. In fact, both Emperor Hadrian and Emperor Antoninus Pius redesigned another temple, this time on Mount Gerizim, to include the worship of Jupiter. The repeated attempts by the Seleucids, Ptolemies, and Romans to integrate Judea into their empires led to negative stereotypes about Jews and the Greek-speaking world. Despite this, some Jews tried to bridge the gap by emphasizing elements of their culture that aligned with Greek and Roman values. The Romans generally found the Jews who adopted more Greek and Roman ways, especially those living outside of Judea, easier to govern than those who held on to their distinct traditions, especially these Hellenistic Jews, influenced by Greek culture, fit into the larger backdrop of classical studies and should be seen as part of the broader cultural landscape, even if Romans sometimes viewed them with a degree of prejudice. Early Christianity's Blend of Cultures Have you ever wondered about the diverse influences that shaped early Christianity? Imagine a melting pot of Greek, Roman, Jewish, and Persian cultures, each contributing its flavor to create something entirely new. In ancient times, a city like Neapolis in Samaria was a cultural hub. Here, Jewish beliefs met Greek Hellenistic ideas, causing both tension and blending. As different as these traditions were, they played a big role in the birth of early Christian movements. The intersection of these cultures, along with significant events like Jewish wars and Roman rules on Jewish practices, created a unique backdrop for the rise of Christianity. For new Christian communities in regions influenced by Greek culture, Hellenistic Judaism, a blend of Jewish and Greek beliefs, was a significant influence. When we look at early Christian writings like the letters of Paul, the Gospels, and the Acts of the Apostles, we see a move away from some traditional Jewish practices. These writings also adopted Greek themes such as divine birth and ascension. Interestingly, Paul, a key figure in early Christianity, seemed to have more in common with a traveling Greek philosopher than a typical Jewish teacher of his time. This suggests that while early Christianity had its roots in Jewish traditions, its structure and forms were largely influenced by broader classical cultures with just an outer layer of Jewish elements. But what's fascinating is the way early Christianity transformed these influences. Instead of staying within the confines of traditional Jewish quarters and cities, it reached out, adopting and adapting from both Jewish and Greek traditions. This dynamic blend created a movement that spread rapidly across the Mediterranean world. The early Christian texts, especially the Gospels and Acts of the Apostles, were written from a perspective that wasn't deeply rooted in local Jewish settings like Galilee or Judea. Instead, they seem to reflect a more general viewpoint like that of visitors or people returning after a long time. These works were also influenced by common stereotypes of Jewish Palestine at the time. Simply put, early Christianity was shaped by a rich blend of cultures and traditions. This unique combination allowed it to connect with diverse audiences and grow rapidly across the ancient world. Understanding the Connection the earlier summary emphasizes the significant tension that existed within ancient Abrahamic religions, particularly in their efforts to merge with larger theological perspectives of the Hellenistic kingdoms and the Roman Empire. Recognizing the influence of these Hellenistic and Roman elements, both within and outside the early Jewish milieu, helps us understand the deeper theological consequences of merging these diverse belief systems. This awareness aids in providing context and 
insight into the Christian term, quote, son of God, end quote. Such instances highlight the adaptation of Christian teachings to traditional Greco-Roman forms. It prompts a discerning observer to notice a resemblance. Does the Judeo-Christian narrative parallel the tales of Zeus Jupiter, featuring a demigod son born to a human woman? This blending of ideas is evident not only in stories of demigods, but also in early Christian attempts to incorporate Platonic concepts of God, thereby integrating classical philosophical traditions. It shouldn't shock anyone to find divine births of the Caesars by Apollo as noted in Suetonius. Justin specifically mentions Zeus, so we should keep that in mind as we move forward. Justin's arguments pivot on a fundamental premise, while acknowledging the parallels between Christian teachings and classical narratives, he simultaneously criticizes prior myths as misleading, unauthorized, and even malevolent. He often references the ethical shortcomings of figures like Zeus to make his point. In this context, the term apology delineates the wide-ranging implications of the title Son of God within gospel narratives. Aligning with Michael Peppert's analysis, this interpretation extends beyond the Roman concept of D.V. Phileas, divine son, to encompass the broader demigod narratives of ancient cultures, as emphasized by Justin. Apology 21 further elucidates this by suggesting that the divine status bestowed upon Roman emperors was inspired by age-old traditions from Hellenistic cultures rooted in the archetypal demigod narrative. Exploration of the Ancient Resurrection and Ascension Narratives this scholarly work done by Richard C. Miller delves into the age-old symbolism and importance of the resurrection and ascension tales of Jesus as presented in the New Testament. It specifically questions whether there's a semiotic linguistic connection between these accounts and what Plutarch labeled as a Mediterranean, quote, translation fable, end quote, during the classical period. With rigorous philological examinations of all four gospels, this research offers a robust analysis of the socio-cultural context in which the gospel resurrection stories were initially interpreted set against a comprehensive understanding understanding of the translation fable tradition in Mediterranean hero narratives and Roman apotheosis practices. Accordingly, the analysis draws upon a wide array of primary sources from both classical and early Christian literature, serving as a comprehensive repository for researchers in these fields, enhancing the accuracy of interpretations of this cultural convention in ancient Mediterranean writings. In 1942, author Stanley Pease, a classicist from Harvard, penned some aspects of invisibility. In it, he reviewed numerous tales of invisibility from Greek and Latin ancient literature. Upon approaching the intriguing topic of Jesus's empty tomb, following an examination of various translation fables, Pease cautiously noted, quote, whether Jesus was considered divine because of the possession of miraculous powers, including the faculty of invisibility, or was believed to possess such powers because he was considered divine, is hardly a question which can be decided by such studies as present. Or as Pfister puts the problem for classical antiquity, does legend develop from cult or cult from legend? From the same biblical data, the fundamentalist and the modernist and the skeptic will answer these questions in quite different ways. End quote. His circumspection implies he may have held a viewpoint, but opted to avoid explicitly stating it, likely to sidestep potential backlash. Historically, classicists have often refrained from directly challenging core beliefs of Western Christianity, choosing instead to express any critique indirectly within academic circles. Dr. Miller's book, Transdisciplinary in Nature, aspires to take forward the conversation initiated by Pease in the hopes that the contemporary academic community is better equipped to address and discuss its deeper implications. Yet, the answer to Pease's initial inquiry remains somewhat enigmatic within New Testament scholarly circles. Burton Mack, a generation ago, critiqued the prevailing discourse, suggesting, quote, all scholars seem to agree on the importance of the resurrection. Three terms are frequently used, Easter, appearance, 
and spirit. After in-depth reading, however, the repetition of these terms becomes strikingly evident. These coded terms don't clarify, but instead highlight a point where reasoned arguments cease. They've evolved into a tool for alluding to the myth of Christian origins without needing to explain it." End quote. The academic community often uses specific terms to denote an exceptional and mystical moment considered the genesis of Christianity, the resurrection, the empty tomb, the event, the mystery. Such a space in discourse where profound critical proclamations are seen as off-limits has been tacitly acknowledged and preserved. There's a prevailing reluctance to address the historicity of Jesus' narrated resurrection directly, often relegating it to an ambiguous realm of agnosticism. This study, however, finds such an approach intellectually unsatisfying. The early Christians did not highlight any specific event as the foundational drive of their faith, and there isn't substantial evidence to suggest early Christian martyrs died defending such a narrative. What should curious readers make of stories about Jesus rising from the dead? How might these tales have been understood in the context of ancient Greek and Roman cultures? This is exactly what we're trying to figure out. Instead of just comparing these stories side by side, we're diving deep to see if there's any shared themes between tales of Jesus' resurrection and similar stories from Greek and Roman literature. Our early research hints that there might be a common thread. Just as stories of Jesus' resurrection are central to Christian tradition, tales of heroes and great figures being translated or elevated in some special way were common in ancient cultures. For example, there's a Roman story about Romulus, the city's founder, which describes him in a way similar to how Jesus' resurrection is described. This raises the question, did stories like that of Romulus influence how early Christian stories were written and understood? To answer this, we're examining common storytelling techniques from that era. Were there patterns or themes in how Greek and Roman writers depicted their heroes that might have influenced the portrayal of Jesus or vice versa? If we find that Romulus's story played a big role in shaping early Christian tales, what does that tell us about how people at the time understood these stories? We will challenge some existing ideas about where Christian resurrection stories might have come from. Some believe they originated from earlier Jewish tales, while others argue they're entirely unique. Our research suggests these narratives might actually have drawn a lot from storytelling traditions of the broader Mediterranean world. Understanding Myths and Fables this piece is about understanding the concept of translation fables. But before diving in, let's clarify a few terms. Translation fable. This term was initially coined by Plutarch, a Greek philosopher. In this context, fable does not necessarily mean stories about talking animals, like the ones from Aesop's tales. Instead, it refers to culturally significant stories that might be serious or lighthearted. These stories often have hidden lessons. Some classic examples include Plato's Myth of Ur and Jesus' Parable of the Sower, Myth. The story Alan Dundee's described myths as sacred stories explaining the world's origins. However, this piece adds a twist to that definition. Here, a myth is any narrative that helps shape our understanding of the present. Myths can be about the end of the world, cosmic tales, or stories explaining why things are. The term fable is similar but is acknowledged as a kind of myth with added self-awareness. The role of myths. Our brains use myths to simplify and understand the world. Think of it as mental shortcuts. Some myths are accurate for specific purposes, like a simple map showing the way to a bakery. Myths can help communities come together, forming collective identities, but it's essential to recognize that our understanding of historical figures or events are also shaped by these myths, simplifying complex ideas into easily digestible narratives. Our goal is to explore how early Christian stories fit into broader Mediterranean and Greek narratives. 
Were they entirely new stories or adaptations of existing tales? Did they borrow from the literary traditions of their time, or were they trying to establish an entirely new category of literature? By understanding these early Christian narratives, this piece hopes to shed light on the birth and growth of Christianity in the broader context of the Mediterranean cultures. This study dives deep into the roots of early Christian stories, exploring their origins, their relationship with existing cultural narratives, and how they influenced and were influenced by the society of their time. Translation Fables in Hellenistic and Roman Antiquity Let's dive into the world of translation fables, those old tales from ancient Greece and Rome. We will take a broad look at many different fables. We want to understand common themes and patterns that appear in these tales, and also figure out if these stories were considered true or just make-believe back in the day. Our goal is to spot the signs that make a fable recognizable and see if there's any connection between different stories over time. Once we've got that figured out, we will explore how these ancient fables relate to the New Testament Gospels and analyze the stories of resurrection found there. By the end of it all, we hope to see what these findings might mean for both religious beliefs and general knowledge. But before we get there, let's start by understanding where translation fables came from and what they meant to the people of old. The Ancient Greek Origins of Translation Digging deep into the ancient Greek history, like diving into the mysteries of Fraser's Golden Bough, we find the beginnings of stories about translation. If you look at the works of famous ancient Greek poets like Homer and Hesiod, you'll see how they first came up with the idea of a special life after death. This idea was based on the belief that the human soul lives forever. Homer wrote about what happens to people after they die. He said that souls go to different places. Elysium, the home of the god of the dead, Hades, also known as the fields of Asphodel, or a scary place called Tartarus. These places were imagined to be far to the west, beyond a big ocean current. In one of his stories, the hero Odysseus talks to the ghost of his mother after making a sacrifice, just like the goddess Circe had told him to. His mother tells him about the state of the dead people, saying, quote, This is the way of mortals. When someone dies, the body falls apart because a soul has left, and the soul flies away like a dream, end quote. Jan Bremer, a scholar, said that in early Greek poems, the souls of the dead live in the underworld. They are like shadows and don't have the things that make them unique. Heroes, however, can be awakened when they taste blood, like what happened with Odysseus. But there's also a different version of the afterlife, where a hero, like King Menelaus, goes to a peaceful place called Elysium, which is different from the dull fields of Asphodel. Hesiod, another ancient poet, wrote about the family tree of the gods. He said some gods, especially Zeus, had relationships with human women. Hesiod also wrote about a time when half-gods and heroes lived among regular people. He talked about their special fate. Quote, Some of them died, but others were sent to live far away from people by Zeus, the main god. They live without sadness on the Isles of the Blessed, where the land gives them sweet fruits three times a year. End quote. Only some special people got a happy afterlife in early Greek beliefs, but they weren't like the gods who had bodies that could touch things. They were more like spirits. Pindar, another poet, also wrote about a paradise for heroes ruled by Zeus's son. This idea of a spirit afterlife continued for a long time, even during the Roman Empire. Like in the story where Odysseus tries to hug his ghostly mother but can't, there's another story of a hero named Aeneas trying to hug his ghostly father. They describe it as, quote, thrice did he try to hug him, thrice the ghost slipped away, like a dream, end quote. Over time, the idea of the afterlife changed. Instead of being at the edge of the world, it was seen as the underground. For example, to meet the god of the dead, Odysseus had to travel very far, but the hero Aeneas just had to find a special cave. By the time of poets like Virgil, the afterlife was imagined as a busier place, similar to how Dante later pictured it in his famous poem, Divina Commedia. There were also stories about people trying to reach the gods in heaven. For example, Bellerophon tried to fly to the home of the gods on a winged horse named Pegasus, but Zeus made him fall. However, Zeus kept Pegasus. 
Another story tells of a beautiful man named Ganymede who was taken to heaven to serve Zeus. And then there's the story of Tantalus who was allowed to live with the gods but was later punished for stealing their special food. This reminds us of another story about a king named Ixion who was invited to dine with the gods but then got into trouble for flirting with the main god's wife. These stories from ancient Greece show us how people imagined the afterlife and the relationship between humans and God. They give us insights into the beliefs and values of ancient cultures. The gods of ancient Greece and Rome were imagined with perfect bodies, unlike the faint spirits in the underworld. Jean-Pierre Vernant in his study explained this difference in clear detail. He said, quote, to pose the problem of the body of the gods is thus not to ask how the Greeks could have equipped their gods with human bodies, but to seek how this symbolic system functions, how the corporeal code permits one to think of the relationships between man and God under the binary figures of same and other, of near and far, of contact and separation, marking between the poles of human and divine that which associates an interplay of similarities, parallel parallels and overlap, and that which disassociates them by effects of contrast, opposition, incompatibility, and mutual exclusion." End quote. In simpler terms, the bodies of gods were envisioned as superior and timeless compared to humans. They had extraordinary abilities. They could change form, appear and disappear, move instantly from one place to another, and even be in multiple places at once. These gods could fully engage with our world, from fighting in battles to having relationships with humans. Understanding this difference between godly and human bodies is essential when we dive into ancient Mediterranean tales, especially when we consider how early Christian stories about resurrection were interpreted. The idea of transformation and change in bodies was popular in ancient stories, inspiring famous works like Ovid's Metamorphosis. These tales often highlighted the divine features of gods, with a common theme being the mysterious disappearance of a body. Before these tales became widespread, ancient Greeks had a way to honor missing or dead heroes. They made small statues, often called Colossi, Algomata, Idola, and Icons. To represent the lost individual, Jean-Pierre Vernant, using advanced methods of study, pointed out the duality in this custom, the everlasting nature of the statue versus the temporary nature of life. Deborah Steiner said this practice might come from two beliefs. Firstly, the idea that the spirit of the deceased could only find peace when given a proper burial. Secondly, to soothe a restless spirit upset about missing out on traditional honors due to an untimely or unfortunate death. In ancient times, statues were sometimes used to honor or appease spirits of notable figures. For example, according to some sources, a bronze statue of the Spartan general Pausanias was placed in a temple to calm his restless spirit. Similarly, in a story by the ancient historian Herodotus, two heroic brothers named Clebus and Biton were honored with the statues after they mysteriously fell asleep in a temple and never woke up. In another tale, a poet named Aristius, who had been dead for 240 years, reportedly reappeared to ask for a statue to be made in his honor beside Apollo's altar. After making this request, he disappeared again. The people did as he asked, and this story explained why that particular statue was there. This tradition of making statues or colossi in Greek wasn't just limited to ancient Greece. It continued into Roman times, where people also honored the dead with statues. This was especially true for those who had achieved great things in their lifetime. Penelope J. E. Davies described a Roman in practice where wax masks of the deceased were displayed in a prominent place in a house. During funerals, family members would wear these masks, mimicking the deceased while recounting their achievements. This was done to ensure their deeds were remembered and to inspire the living. As Davies explains, quote, Inevitably, as a Roman anticipated his own demise, he hoped to be remembered at his best. 
for beneficent works and good character. Yet admirable deeds could also offer a path to immortality through remembrance, since they transform the deceased into exemplum for the living. What spectacle could be more glorious than this?" End quote. Other stories like those of Alcamini, Espalus, and Britomartis show how this tradition of creating statues to honor the dead continued. These statues were usually placed in sacred areas associated with major gods, giving visitors a reason for the statue's presence. In conclusion on that, both in ancient Greek and Hellenistic cultures, statues played a key role in honoring the dead, remembering their achievements, and connecting them with divine or heroic traditions, understanding language and its meaning. We will look at how language was used in ancient Mediterranean practices to understand its deeper rules and meanings. It aims to figure out the unique features of these practices and their impact on ancient readers. Even though these practices had many forms, the core message of the story of transformation stayed consistent over a thousand years in the ancient Greek-influenced world. People back then seemed to understand this transformation story very well, much like we all understand the rules of our language. But where does the main meaning of a story or text come from? Is it from the author or the readers. An interesting perspective comes from Barthes, who believed, quote, once the author is removed, the claim to decipher a text becomes quite futile. To give a text an author is to impose a limit on that text. The multiplicity of writing, everything is to be disentangled, nothing deciphered. The structure can be followed. In precisely this way, literature liberates what may be called an anti-theological activity. To refuse to fix meaning in is, in the end, to refuse God and his representatives, reason, science, law." End quote. However, some believe that Barthes, in his 1967 essay, during a time of liberal thinking, might have stretched his point too far. Basic language understanding needs a common set of rules that everyone agrees to. Without this mutual understanding, words and their meanings would be unclear. Interestingly, even Barthes' own writings depended on everyone agreeing on the meaning of words. If, as Barthes suggests, the author's importance is gone, then the reader's is too. Words and their meanings are shared by everyone. Regardless of personal opinions, the basic meanings of words don't change unless society agrees to it. For instance, no matter how someone personally feels about a red traffic light, it universally means stop. The importance of understanding language is not just in an individual's interpretation, but in a shared understanding by society. When we read, we can separate the clear message of a text from our personal feelings or interpretations. Throughout a thousand years, even though stories about transformation had various ways of being told, their core message stayed consistent. It's like a tradition passed down through generations. Some experts, like Claude Levi Strauss, think this consistency is due to our human need for tradition and rituals. Now, with so many ways these stories have been told, can we really put them all into one category? This is a tricky question. Instead of defining a strict set of criteria, some thinkers, like Ludwig Wittgenstein, believe that we understand categories more by seeing similarities, like how family members look like each other. Wittgenstein used the idea of games to explain. Quote, consider, for example, the proceedings that we call games. I mean, board games, card games, ball games, Olympic games, and so on. What is common to them all? Don't say there must be something common or they would not be called games, but look and see whether there's anything common to all. I can think of no better expression to characterize these similarities than family resemblance. For the various resemblances between members of a family overlap and crisscross in the same way, and I shall say games form a family." End quote. In simpler terms, the way our minds work is by recognizing patterns and similarities, not by sticking to strict definitions. When it comes to understanding different types of stories or creative works, it's more about seeing the shared themes than trying to put them into a strict box.
The collection of translation tells doesn't follow a specific pattern or set of features. Instead, they often share a variety of common themes or elements. Here's a summary of the main themes found in these tells from Dr. Richard C. Miller's book. If you look at the list 2.1, he has, in more complex words, I'm going to dumb it down. One, a terrible wrong made right through translation, heinous or ignoble injustice rectified by translation. Two, transformation, or as we know the word, metamorphosis. Three, disappearing or missing person, vanished, missing body. Four, stories explaining the origin of a name or term, in the way he put it is eponymous etiology. 5. Transformation into a star or a constellation. Catasterism. 6. Speaking after being translated or post-translation speech. 7. Rising up or ascension. 8. Being translated after death, post-mortem translation. 9. Translation involving Zeus's lightning or same pretty much that he says, Zeus's thunderbolt. 10, appearance after translation, post-translation appearance. 11, translation involving a river or associated with a river. 12, translation involving a mountain or associated with a mountain. 13, an unpleasant or questionable alternative version. This is odious or dubious alternate account. 14, being carried away by winds or clouds, taken up by the winds or clouds. And then 15, pretending to be translated, a feigned translation. The act of changing the status of a person in these tales often meant that they were being accepted as a god or a divine figure. Unlike the hero worship seen in some ancient cultures where the remains of the hero were venerated, these tales required the complete absence of any remains. The key signs that this change was happening in the story would be superhuman acts like disappearing, reappearing, floating, and transforming. Ancient authors were very intentional when they used these translation tales in their works. For instance, Plutarch, while discussing the tale of Romulus's disappearance, said, quote, They tell many such fables, those who unreasonably defy the mortal elements of nature along with those that are divine, end quote. This quote shows Plutarch was well aware of this literary device, even if he found some examples amusing. Another ancient author, Justin, was also familiar with these tales and discussed them in his writings. By the Roman era, many famous figures from early times were associated with a tale of this kind, especially if no one knew where their remains were. Essentially, these stories were a way to honor and remember these figures, giving them a kind of immortal fame. The stories where historical figures are transformed or translated into a different form or status were incredibly popular during the time of ancient Rome. By this period, almost every famous person from previous times had a story like this written about them, especially if nobody knew what happened to their remains. These stories essentially gave the person a special type of honor, similar to a Hall of Fame called Exaltatio Memori. It's like being given the greatest honor of undying fame. There were also lesser known people who were remembered as local heroes. They had places dedicated to them where people could pay respects. Throughout history, there were many figures like athletes and generals who were celebrated and became legendary. As writers like Pausanias, Apollodorus, and Strabo have shown, these figures were seen as larger than life. In 1920, a scholar named Louis Farnell wrote about this phenomenon, focusing on the Greek tradition of honoring heroes. He looked at figures who were believed to have transformed in some way, like Hercules, the Dioscuri, Asclepius, and other classical heroes. Twenty years later, another scholar named Arthur Pease explored these stories from a different angle. He was interested in tales where figures mysteriously disappeared or became invisible. Pease believed that these stories were a way to honor these figures. He made an important point, quote, 
For the accurate interpretation of any one instance of invisibility, it should also be constantly borne in mind that those whose vanishing has become a matter of tradition may, in many instances, have been themselves quite innocent of any such intention. The traditions having arisen from subsequent narration, first at the instance of admiring and well-meaning friends, and later through dissemination by a public delight in the dramatic and unexpected and the marvelous and not overcritical in its application of logical or scientific criteria of truth. Hence, as with other forms of the miraculous, the superficial ascription of more than human powers is no sufficient evidence against an underlying historicity. For example, no one doubts the historic character of Alexander the Great or of the Roman emperors, though we may fairly doubt particular incidents about them which ancient writers relying upon popular tradition may have reported. Finally, may we not modify a well-known aphorism and safely venture the assertion that the ascription of miraculous powers has generally been the unconscious tribute which inferiority has paid to excellence." End quote. In simpler terms, these translation tales became a popular way to highlight and honor the lives of extraordinary individuals from the past. The culture saw adding decorations and honors as a very important part of recognizing and celebrating famous figures from ancient times. When we talk about how Romans would honor someone after their death, it was like turning them into a god. This was a special tradition in Rome. Simon Price studied this and found that the tradition was a way for Rome's Senate, a group of leaders, to show respect to their emperors. Price said, quote, Given the close association of the living emperor with the heavenly powers, it would have been very difficult to remove the emperor from this context on his death and locate him firmly in the underworld. Banishment in the underworld was the punishment given to Claudius in the Apocalypse Sentosa. And when Carcalla killed his brother Geta, he made people forget him and had sacrifices in his memory in the underworld. Being placed in the underworld rather than with the gods was like being pushed out of the group. Nothing else could make up for this loss of favor. Turning someone into a god was the best thing you could do for a good emperor. This act allowed the Senate to show how important they were. The Senate had some power over the people of Rome, but they also had lost some power to the emperor. The act of turning someone into a god gave the Senate a chance to show that they were still very important." End quote. Cassius Dio shared a speech from Gaius Macinus to Augustus about what people thought about this custom. Quote, for it is virtue that makes many equal to the gods. Nobody, however, has ever yet become a god just because people voted for it. If you are a good leader, the whole world will think of you like a god. Every city will be your temple, and all people will honor you, always remembering you with respect. But for those who are not good leaders, building temples for them does not make them better. Instead, these temples remind people of their mistakes and wrongdoings. The longer these temples Temples stand, the longer people will remember their bad actions." End quote. It's worth noting that if a leader wasn't turned into a god, they were often forgotten or shamed. This was the other choice for how the culture would remember someone. Macanus mentioned this. In politics, this meant that leaders had to be careful. If they did good, they might be honored after death. If they did bad, they might be shamed. This was a big deal in the world where not everyone had equal rights or a say in decisions. These customs were a way for people to have some power in deciding how a leader was remembered after they died. As Price has shown, the Roman Senate had a way of balancing their power with the emperor. When an emperor died, they could choose to honor him by saying, he had ascended to heaven, a tradition inspired by the story of Julius Proculus. However, the Senate also had a darker side, reminding emperors of the danger of assassination, like what happened to Caesar because of Brutus. So emperors had to be careful, as the Senate could either turn them into gods or threaten their lives. Penelope J. E. Davies explains, quote, The decision of apotheosis for dead emperor rested with the Senate, who would judge the deceased on the basis of his virtues, or popularity. As L. Sir Fox and J. Tandral aptly put it, the Roman emperor is simply a candidate for apotheosis, and his reign constitutes an examination of his abilities. However, the illustrated res Gestae 
seen on imperial tombs were an attempt to justify his deification. And when apotheosis became the norm in the second century, they served to emphasize it. Apotheosis was in part a means of a securing a personal afterlife, either with the gods or in men's memory and worship. But just as important, it was also a political move to further the dynasty, to ensure that kingship did not die with the passing of the king. Having identified this motive for the funerary monument's design, one perceives that the tomb was not simply a monument to a dead ruler, but perhaps more significantly, an accession monument as well, erected either by an emperor for himself out of concern for his descendants or by an heir to validate his claim to the throne." End quote. When Julius Caesar was turned into a god by Octavian, it was a smart political move. Octavian even said he saw Caesar go up to heaven as a comet during a festival in 44 BCE. He was an eyewitness. This helped Octavian's claim to be the next ruler as the son of a god. Some people like the general Publius Cornelius Dalabella didn't like the idea of turning Caesar into a god before Octavian promoted it. In stories, this idea of someone ascending to heaven or being turned into a god didn't always solve all problems, but it did add a special touch, making the story more legendary or dreamlike. This kind of ending made a character seem more important, like they were a big part of history, folklore, or myth. This ending redeemed the character's story, especially if they had faced disgrace. In these stories, the hero's body must not decay, showing they were more than just immortal. This ending became a typical part of stories about famous figures, making them symbols of classic values. The Gallery Here's a curated collection of fables translated from Greek and Latin. It's not a complete list, but it gives you a good idea of the stories that were often used to conclude biographies in ancient times. The fables are listed in alphabetical order. Along with the source, you'll find a short summary of each story and its main themes. These themes also acted as cues for ancient readers, letting them know that these were traditional tales. This section may be a bit detailed, but it will be absolutely necessary to see and hear how common these mythical characteristics apply to this list of 77 characters. If you want all the detailed sources for these characters, be sure to get a copy of Dr. Richard C. Miller's book, Resurrection and Reception, because he goes into all of these sources in chapter two. All of these figures are ordered in alphabetical order thanks to Dr. Miller's careful attention to detail. After we cover them, we should emphasize important details for clarity. You can see in Dr. Miller's book on page 39 at the bottom, you start with a character Aka Laurentia, forgive me if I butcher some of these names. Turning to page 40, you've got Ega, daughter of Alenus, Aeneas, son of Aphrodite, Alcamini, princess of Mycenae and Tyrens, Alcone, queen of Trachis, forgive me, Alexander the Great on page 41. Uh, Althamenes, Prince of Crete, Afarius, King of Argos, I am probably butchering some of these, forgive me, Anaxibia, Queen of Thessaly, Anna Perina, Sister of Dido, and T Antinous. Okay, so notice these are all still in the A. There's quite a bit of A's here. Going down to page 43, Apollonius of Tyana, Ariadne, Aristius, Son of Apollo, Aristius, Proconesus, forgive me. <laughs> Um, there's a lot here, and he goes into each of these, Asclepius, you keep scrolling down, we're just going to go faster here, because I'll probably butcher more, embarrassing myself on reading some of these ancient Roman and Greek names, but if you keep going, you'll notice it's on page 66, so you get to the last one, and it's, I think, Kisithros, I think this is how you pronounce that, uh, before we get into the Roman imperial apotheosis, you got to get the book, there's so much detail here, I want you to look at those translation fables in chapter two, if you do have the book. These are not an exhaustive list again. And Dr. Miller, he says, look, I hope people will go and find more. There's so many more. But the reason I'm showing you this so you can understand how common the themes found in the fables of deified figures were among Greeks and Romans. Again, I encourage you to go find more. There are plenty more out there. And again, take a moment to look at the graphs of each of these characters with check marks. But I do want you to look before we look at those graphs at this translation sub theme chart one through 15. 
So I created these graphs that are going to have the green check mark. And you'll notice that one through 15 appears at the very top. The figures are the far left vertical going top to bottom in alphabetical order. One through 15 matches the translation sub theme graph. So if you need to go fact check under each one, you can, and you can pause the video and you can screenshot and look at both and do that. Let me just show you some of this material because this is really important. As you look, you'll see there's a lot of number threes, fours, those come up a lot. Number 11 comes up a lot in the first one. Keep going down to the next graph. You'll notice that one starts with um, Aspalus of Pythia. A lot of threes. Well, is it a shock to you that three is missing body? Let's go to the third graph. Castor, son of Tyndarus. Again, ones, twos, threes, fours. And you can go back to the sub themes. Go to the next graph. You'll see that one has Heracles as the last figure in it. Look at all the checks, green checks. Pause this video. Look at it carefully. Go to the next one. Heraclides, Ponticus. Again, three gets a lot of marks. You'll see the numbers at the end. Go to the next one. Oedipus, King of Thebes. Again, look at all those threes. But all these other sub themes that show up also help you understand the game or seeing the translation fable, the fiction, the myth. This is what you look for. Go to the next one. Pythagoras is the first character and it ends with Kisithros. So all of these graphs, you can go back and pause just to see the check marks, get a visualization of just 77 characters. Now that you can visualize these traits and the translations they encountered, here's a chart which shows you another breakdown. I'm taking all of the sub themes of the 77 characters and I'm tallying them up. You remember our sub theme 1 through 15. If you look on the right, there's a count. Among those 77 characters, you'll see the number of times the heinous or ignoble injustice rectified by translation. For example, someone is dying or look at what happens to um, Heracles, right? We'll get into a story, but he's dying a very bad death, right? That right there, he gets translated. 15 out of the 77 have that transformation or metamorphosis too. There's nine out of 77 that have that. Vanished missing body, 58. Eponymous etiology, 12. Catastrophism, turning into a celestial body, a figure, a star, something in the heavens, nine. Post-translation speech, nine. Ascension, eight. Post-mortem translation, 11. Translation associated with Zeus's thunderbolt, nine. Post-translation appearance, 11. Translation associated with a river, 15. And this is all out of 77, right? Translation associated with a mountain, 7. Odious or dubious alternate account, 12. Taken up by the winds or clouds, 3. And feigned translation, 5. It's clear that vanishing and missing body themes are extremely popular among the world in which Christianity was born, with 58 out of 77 of these figures having the vanished missing body motif. This is very important when we look at Jesus in the New Testament. Let's zoom in at just eight of the characters who had the most sub-themes among the 77. We wouldn't have time to cover all 77. That's why you need to get the book. First, we turn to Amphiaris, king of Argos. He has five sub-themes. Fable. While in battle against Thebes, the great commander and king slew the great Melanippus, son of Astacus, or Astacus, and fled along the river Esminus, on the road to Patne, from Poseidon's mighty son Periclymenus. Seeing his distress, Zeus saved Amphiaris, sending his thunderbolt to the ground, thus creating a great fissure into which Amphiaris and his charioteer Baton vanished. In this act, the king of Olympus had translated the king of Argos to immortality. At the place where Amphiaris disappeared, the city of Harma was founded. Notice the five sub-themes, heinous or ignoble injustice rectified by translation, vanished, missing body, translation associated with Zeus's thunderbolt, translation associated with a river, eponymous etiology. Glaucus the Cretan, six sub-themes, fable. Leonard Mueller wrote, if the dramas of Sophocles, Euripides, and Aeschylus 
on the myth of Cretan Glaucus had survived intact, it is facile to suppose that as three dramas on the same myth, they would have significantly affected the conventional view of Greek tragedy. These works made famous the fable of this legendary fisherman and his metamorphosis into a sea god. Athenaeus variously related in his Daphnophististe that Glaucus had found quite accidentally a patch of immortalizing grass as he chased a hare up the seaside slopes of Mount Aurea. The fisherman noticed the rabbit had died of exhaustion. He took his prey to a nearby spring and rubbed it with a handful of grass. The hare at once sprung back to life. Astonished by the resurrection, Glaucus then ate a bit of the grass himself and became overwhelmed by a divine madness compelling him to leap to his death from the sea badgered cliffs into the ocean below. Both Ovid and Diodorus Siculus offer post-translation appearances of the deified Glaucus. As a sea god, Glaucus had, instead of feet, a fish tail. Stories varied wildly regarding the translation of Glaucus, including several that depicted his having been raised from the dead as a young boy. Here are the six sub-themes of his particular tell. Vanish, missing body. Translation associated with a mountain. Post-translation appearance. Post-translation speech. Post-mortem translation. Metamorphosis. Romulus, son of Mars. Fable. The legendary founding king of Rome, while mustering troops on campus Martius, was caught up to heaven when clouds suddenly descended and enveloped him. When the cloud had departed, he was seen no more. In the fearsome spectacle, most of his troops fled, but the remaining nobles instructed the people that Romulus had been translated to the gods. An alternate account arose that perhaps the nobles had slain the king and invented the tale to cover up their treachery. Later, however, Julius Proculus stepped forward to testify before all the people that he had been eyewitness to the translated Romulus, having met him traveling on the Via Appia. Romulus, according to this tell offered his nation a final great commission and again vanished. Here are the sub-themes. Vanished missing body. Odious or dubious alternate account. Post-translation appearance. Post-translation speech. Eponymous etiology. Taken up by the winds or clouds. Metamorphosis. Catastrophism. Hesperus, son of Eos. Five sub-themes. Fable. Diodorus described Hesperus as the most distinguished of the sons of Atlas, for his piety, justice toward those whom he governed, and his love of humanity. Once the king had climbed to the top of Mount Atlas to study the stars, great winds came and snatched him away, at which moment Hesperus vanished. The people granted him immortal honors and named the brightest of the stars after him. Sub-themes, odious or dubious alternate account suggested. Translation associated with a mountain, taken up by the winds or clouds, vanished, missing body, catastrophism. Hylas, son of King Theodamus, five sub-themes. Fable, Hylas, one of antiquity's famed Argonauts, gave himself as a youthful male beloved of Heracles while voyaging together on the Argo. Having come ashore at the narrows of the Black Sea at Mysia, Hylas went to fetch water at the river Ascanius at the spring of Pegae. Here he became seduced by nymphs, fell in love, and vanished. Heracles sought the young Hylas, in vain waiting by the water's edge. Valerius Flaccus included Book 4, a post-translation appearance and speech of Hylas before the summoning Zeus. Apollonius Rhodius, however, provided the dreadful alternative account that Hylas had perhaps been mauled to death by wild beasts, while leaving the possibility of his abduction by river nymphs comparatively nebulous. Subthemes, odious or dubious alternate account. Translation associated with a river. Vanished, missing body. Post-translation appearance. Post-translation speech. I know, Queen of Thebes. Six sub-themes. Fable. The Megarians alone claimed that Ino, daughter of Cadmus, was buried along their coast with a shrine, according to Pausanias. Elsewhere, however, it is said that she was translated into the fabled Leucothea, white goddess. As this goddess of the sea, she gave divine aid to Odysseus on his homeward journey. Passed down by Ovid, legend stated that she had cast herself and her son, Melisertes, to be called Palaemon, from a cliff into the churning sea below 
blow to their deaths, and they vanished there. Witnessing the tragedy, the gods, Venus prayed to Neptune, due to the severity of the tragedy, apotheosized them, translating them both into marine deities. The Theban woman, being unaware of the translation of their queen and thus mourning her death and that of Melicertes, were about to follow her into the sea. Seeing this, Juno in an instant turned them all high upon the cliff to stone. Subthemes, odious or dubious alternate account, vanished missing body, metamorphosis, post-mortem translation, post-translation appearance, post-translation speech, Dionysus, son of Zeus, five subthemes. Fable. Having persuaded Theseus to abandon his elopement with Ariadne, princess of Crete, the demigod retrieved Ariadne on the island of Naxos. Dionysus led this love to Mount Dreus, and the two disappeared. Justin Martyr, however, conveyed the variant tradition that Dionysus had been torn to pieces, died, rose again, and had ascended to heaven. Subtheme, vanished, missing body. Translation, associated with a mountain. Heinous or ignoble injustice rectified by translation. Post-mortem translation, ascension. Heracles, five subthemes. Fable, Heracles slew the centaur Nessus with an arrow for attempting to rape Heracles' beautiful wife, Dianera. As Nessus was dying and wishing vengeance upon the hero, Nessus instructed Dianera to collect his blood and semen. He indicated that in order to prevent the virulent Heracles from further sexual infidelities, she should apply them to his raiments. As occasion would happen, Heracles became enamored with the allure of Iole, princess of Ocalia, at which point Deianira became jealous again. She applied the centaur's fluids to the hero's shirt. Once he put the shirt on, however, the garments began fiercely to burn Heracles' skin. Unable to stop the acidic consumption of his flesh, Heracles ascended Mount Oita and at once built a great wooden pyre with himself secured at its center and commanded Philoctetes with that the pile be set ablaze. Zeus then sent a great lightning bolt down upon the pyre, utterly consuming the hero along with the wood. Some accounts state that a great cloud descended upon the pyre and snatched him away to Olympus. With his bones nowhere to be found amid the ash, the people declared that Heracles had been translated to divine immortality. Subthemes, vanished, missing body, translation associated with a mountain, heinous or ignoble injustice rectified by translation, taken up by the winds or clouds, catastrophism. Again, Dr. Miller only chose a handful to show the obvious theme of translation fable among the Greek and Roman world, and we only highlighted eight. Roman Imperial Apotheosis In ancient Rome, when emperors passed away, there was a tradition of turning them into gods. This practice was known as apotheosis. Most emperors from the period of 27 BCE to 284 CE were given this divine honor. Those who weren't turned into gods were usually condemned, criticized, or damned for their rule. The idea of turning someone into a god after their death was inspired by old stories like the tales of Romulus and Heracles rising to the heavens. Early Roman leaders like Julius Caesar and Augustus used these legends to promote themselves, suggesting that they too would become gods after their deaths. Julius Proculus and the Eyewitness Tradition In ancient Rome, there were wild tales about what happened to Romulus, the city's legendary founder. Some big-name storytellers like Scipio Africanus, Livy, Ovid, Dionysus of Halicarnassus, and Plutarch had their own versions. They often mentioned a fellow named Julius Proculus, who apparently saw things firsthand as an eyewitness. Two main stories exist about Romulus's fate. One version says that while he was at a meeting by the Tiber River, his own senators ceased a chance and killed him. Many compare this shocking event with the later assassination of Julius Caesar. The second, more magical tale, 
Dell, says a massive cloud appeared and carried Romulus straight to heaven. After that, he got a new heavenly name, Curinus. A man named Julius, who was known for his honesty, claimed to be an eyewitness. Dionysus of Halicarnassus tells it like this, For while the Romans were still unaware about his disappearance, Julius, a farmer and trustworthy guy, said he saw Romulus leaving the city, all armed up. Julius claimed Romulus told him, Announce to the Romans, Julius, these things from me, namely, that the genius assigned to me when I was born is carrying me off to the gods with my mortal life having transpired. I am Corinius. Now, Scipio Africanus, in a story shared by Cicero, defended such tales. He argued, when Romulus supposedly became a god, people were smarter. They had writing and education, so why would they make things up? He says, and this is even more to be wondered at in the case of Romulus. We, however, understand that the time of Romulus is now less than 600 years ago, when writing and education were long in existence, and all those primitive misconceptions from uncultured society had come to an end. The mystery deepens when you realize people disagreed about who Julius Proculus was. Scipio saw him as a simple peasant, but Plutarch called him a high-ranking patrician. Furthering the story, Cicero says that Julius Proculus, possibly nudged by the senators, told everyone he saw Romulus on a hill now called Corinal. Romulus supposedly said he was now a god and wanted a shrine on that hill named Corinus. Interesting fact, these ancient tales bear some resemblance to stories about Jesus, like when he appeared on a hill in the Bible, Transfiguration ring a bell, but that's another epic tale to dive into later on. In a record from around 27 BCE, Livy wrote about an episode that's now known as Romulus's Great Commission, and the counsel of one man is said to have added credence to the matter. For Proculus Julius, being a man weighty in counsel, no matter how great the matter, when the citizenry was shaken by grief over the king and enraged at the senators, proclaimed as follows. Cure rights, he said, Romulus, father of this city, at first light suddenly descended from the sky and confronted me. Filled with reverential fear, I stood there seeking by my entreaties if it might be acceptable for me to look upon him face to face. He said, Go, announce that the deities above thus purpose that my Rome should be the capital of the world. Therefore, may they tend to the matter of war and let them know and pass on to coming generations that no human power can resist Rome's arms. After saying this, he departed on high. It is a Amazing what trust there was in this man's tell, and how the grief at the loss of Romulus by the populace and the army was assaged by the produced confidence of his immortality. In another version by the poet Ovid, the story goes, There was lament, and the senators were falsely incriminated with his murder. That belief might have perchance stuck in their minds, but Julius Proculus was coming from Alba Longa. The moon was shining, and he thus did not make use of a torch, when suddenly the hedges on his left shook with motion. He stepped back and his hair stood on end. Romulus, handsome and greater than a man, appeared standing in the middle of the road and at once said, let not the curites weep, nor let them violate my divinity by their tears. Let the devout crowd offer incense and appease the new curinus. Let them end to war. Thus he commanded and vanished into thin air. Proculus called the people together and reported the words that he was commanded. Temples were built to the god, and a hill was even named after him, and sacred ancestral rites are repeated on specific days. Ovid's version, though more poetic, matches Livy's account pretty well. By the time we reached what's commonly known as the Common Era, this story about Julius Proculus's vision of Romulus had become popular. Most historians felt the need to include it in their works, dedicating a significant portion to it. The next section of the study will look at how this story played a role in the politics of early imperial Rome, especially during what historian Barbara Levick refers to as the era of the top emperors from 14 to 117 CE. Seneca, a Roman philosopher, wrote a satirical piece called The Pumpkinfication 
of the divine Claudius. It started with a well-known saying of the time, an emperor must be born either a king or a fool. Basically, this meant that emperors were either remembered as great rulers or complete failures. There was no in-between. This concept was also evident in the works of Suetonius, a Roman historian. In his writings, emperors either achieved great honor after death or they were completely shamed. Seneca's satire focused on the emperor Claudius. He humorously described how after Claudius died, the gods in heaven treated him poorly. Caesar Augustus, a revered former emperor, criticized Claudius's rule and Claudius was sent to Hades, the underworld, where he was treated badly by those he had wronged in his life. The Romans used the title Rex, which means king for the emperors they respected a lot. These were rulers who reminded them of the earliest and most revered kings of Rome. But with the decline of the Roman Republic and its democratic processes, the public couldn't vote emperors in or out. So they showed their approval or disapproval of emperors through honoring them after death or shaming them. An emperor who wanted to be remembered well had to act in a way that earned the people's respect. Seneca compared the great respect for Augustus after his death with the lack of respect for Claudius. While Augustus was considered a god after he died, Claudius was largely mocked. Many Romans criticized him for his cruelty and disrespect and they also made fun of him for his physical disabilities. By the standards of the time, he wasn't seen as a good example. As for the tradition of witnessing the godly appearances of Roman emperors after they died, it started when the Republic fell. After the downfall of Antony and Cleopatra, in 31 BCE, Octavian came to power. He brought peace and stability in a period known as the Pax Romana. During this time, there was a rise in the worship of Roman emperors. The challenge was how to make the people accept and respect the emperor Julius Caesar especially after his assassination in 44 BCE. Octavian found a way. During a festival in Caesar's honor, Octavian pointed to a passing comet in the sky and said it was really the godly form of Julius Caesar. Pliny, a historian, wrote about Octavian saying, this comet showed that Caesar's soul had become a god. That's why I put this symbol on Caesar's statue in the forum. The poet Ovid also mentioned this event in his work, Metamorphosis. Julius Caesar is a god in his own city, him illustrious in war and peace, not so much his wars triumphantly achieved, his civic deeds accomplished, and his glory quickly won, changed to a new heavenly body, a flaming star, but still more his offspring deified him, for there is no work among all Caesar's achievements greater than this, that he became the father of of this, our emperor. Ovid later added, scarce had he spoken when fostering Venus took her place within the Senate house, unseen of all, caught up the passing soul of her Caesar from his body, and not suffering it to vanish into air, she bore it towards the stars of heaven, and as she bore it, she felt it glow and burn and released it from her bosom. Higher than the moon, it mounted up and leaving behind it a fiery train gleamed as a star and now beholding the good deeds of his son. He confesses that they are greater than his own and rejoices to be surpassed by him. Even though there are similarities between the death stories of Caesar and the legendary King Romulus, it's worth noting that the stories might have been made more alike on purpose. The oldest story about Romulus we know of by Aeneas doesn't exist anymore. It seems like the story about Romulus was made to look more like Caesar's story to link Caesar with Romulus, the founder of Rome. This was especially true when talking about how both were reportedly killed by senators. Check out Appian's account in Civil Wars for more on this. But the two stories aren't exactly the same. For instance, 
No one ever claimed to have seen Caesar walking around after he died. The actual facts about Caesar's death and the original story about Romulus's probably made it hard to make the two tales match perfectly. If we look at the first century AD, we see the rise of Caesar's adopted son Octavian, who became the ruler of Rome for 44 years, from 31 BC to 14 AD. Regarding this important person in history, M. Carey and H. H. Scullard once said, The reign of Augustus was as much the turning point of Roman history as Roman history was the pivot of ancient history in general. The greatest testimonial to Augustus's work lay in its durability. His constitution remained the framework of Roman government for three centuries, and the general lines of his foreign policies were followed by all but a few of his successors. No other Roman determined the future course of Roman history to a like degree. Talking about the death of the Roman Roman leader Caesar Augustus, a historian named Suetonius mentioned that the Roman senator showed off a statue of his body in a big parade. They took it to Campus Martius, the same place where the legendary founder of Rome, Romulus, was believed to have turned into a god. They then buried the statue. Suetonius said, There was even an ex praetor, a high ranking official, who took oath that he had seen the form of the emperor on its way to heaven after he had been reduced to ashes. Starting with Augustus, there began a tradition of people claiming they saw someone special ascend to heaven. This idea seems to have been inspired by an earlier story about a man named Julius Proculus who said he saw Romulus after his death. Another historian, Dio Cassius, clearly pointed out this genetic connection in his writings on Roman history. Then, after they declared August immortal, they assigned priests and ceremonies and made Livia, who was already called Julia and Augusta, a priestess. They moreover entrusted to her a lictor to be used in the religious services. She then granted 250,000 denarii to one Numerius Atticus, a senator and ex praetor, that he swear to have seen Augustus ascending to heaven, just like what is said concerning Proculus and Romulus. A hero shrine to Augustus, voted for by the Senate and built by Livia, was erected both in Rome and in various other places, with some civilians willingly building these shrines and others unwillingly. Livia Drusilla, often referred to as the First Lady of Rome, played a big role in turning her husband of 51 years, Caesar Augustus, into a legendary figure after his death. She helped spread the practice of worshipping Roman emperors throughout the vast territories of the empire. Historian Dio mentioned that this was the first time someone really tried to use the old story of Julius Proculus, who claimed he saw the founder of Rome, Romulus, after he died to honor a Roman emperor. Even though her own son Emperor Tiberius wasn't a big fan of her later on, Livia was super influential. She might have been the most powerful woman in ancient Roman and Greek history, especially when she had control over the Roman Senate at the Empire's peak. Grether once talked about just how influential she was, saying, Preller, in introducing his discussion of the growth of the Roman imperial cult after the death of Augustus wrote, Under Tiberius, a great part of the ceremonial dignity with which Augustus had surrounded himself passed to Livia, who as Julia Augusta stood at the head of both the genes Julia and the cult of the deified Augustus. It is true that after the death of Augustus, Livia occupied a position of unique importance in the state, but this was not a sudden change. Even before his death, during his long principate, she had shared increasingly in the honors of her husband. She had the right of having her statues erected, was allowed to administer her own property, and was endowed with the sacred inviolability formerly characteristic of the tribune's office. She, together with Augustus, had the privilege privilege of dining in the Temple of Concordia, and her influence in the court was such that ambassadors to Augustus often approached her to endeavor to make her an advocate of their causes. Her share in the ceremonial dignity of the emperor is, moreover, even more clearly seen in the cult honors and tributes of a divine nature which were offered her and which she was permitted to accept. These honors, beginning early in the Principate of Augustus and continuing throughout her long life and after her death, illustrate the part played in the imperial cult by the wife of the reigning emperor, the mother 
of the reigning emperor and priestess of Augustus, and finally, the deified ancestress of the Julian house. Chronologically, the history of her cult extends from the early years of Augustus's Principate down into the period of the Antonin dynasty. Livia was a force to be reckoned with, and Grether's description might even sell her short. Later, she was given the title Diva Augusta by her grandson, Claudius. Speaking of Claudius, he ruled from 41 to 54 AD. An interesting story comes from a guy named Livius Geminus. This senator claimed he saw Drusilla, who was the sister of another ruler, Gaius, going to heaven. This Drusilla shouldn't be confused with the powerful Livia we mentioned earlier. The same senator also said he saw Claudius after his death walking on a road called the Via Appia. Seneca, a well-known writer of the time, humorously pointed out how this senator seems to have a knack for spotting famous Romans on their way to becoming gods. Who has ever demanded eyewitnesses from a historian? If there were, nevertheless, a necessity to produce a witness, Witness, then ask the man who saw Drusilla going into heaven. The same fellow will say that he had seen Claudius traveling on the road with crippled steps. Whether he wants to or not, it is necessary for him to see everything that is translated into heaven. He is the watchman of the Appian Way, along which you know that divine Augustus and Tiberius Caesar went unto the gods. This story of meeting a great leader on the road after their death reminds us of an old legend involving Julius Proculus. For some geography, the Via Appia was a major road that began in Rome and traveled down the western side of Italy. A bit about Drusilla, she was the sister of Emperor Caligula and was, well, more than just his sister, if you catch the drift. She died in 38 AD. The historian Dio Cassius wrote about how big of a deal she was and how her passing was marked by grand jesters. For example, a senator named Livius Geminus claimed, she was then therefore named Panthea and was deemed worthy of divine honors in every city. A certain senator, Livius Geminus, swore that he had seen her ascending to heaven and conversing with the gods, invoking utter destruction upon both himself and his children if he should lie. By the witness of both the gods and of Drusilla herself, for this, he received 250,000 denarii. So by the time of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, if you wanted to really honor someone high up in the Roman government, you'd have someone swear they saw eyewitness them ascend to heaven. It became quite the trend. Eyewitness testimony, baby. That's right eyewitness testimony. The imperial cult was thriving with this tradition before the New Testament, and several scholars see imperial competition with Jesus in the New Testament. If you can't spot this as an obvious trend and a well-understood concept in this period, the people invented, fabricated, swore on their children and themselves that they saw people. And we find this in the New Testament. Are you catching my drift? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? It's pretty obvious. In ancient Roman traditions, Heracles often considered the original hero who helped humans was one of the two main inspirations for how Roman emperors were remembered and honored after their death. Speaking of this, Pliny the Elder, writing during the time of the Emperor Vespasian said, a person who helps others is like a god. This is the way to be remembered forever. This is the path that many great Romans have taken. This path also in helping when things are tough is walked by the best ruler of all times, Vespasian Augustus and his sons. The best way to thank such great individuals is to think of them as gods. In fact, the names of many gods and stars come from the good things they've done for humans. When a Roman emperor died, there was a grand ceremony. This was a way to show that the emperor was now a god, joining the ranks of divine beings. One of the key parts of this ceremony was making sure there was no body left. This is because if there was a body, it would always remind people that the emperor was just a human. This idea comes from the story of Heracles, where after his death, 
there were no remains left after his body was burned. During the ceremony, people would see that the emperor's body was missing and would believe that he had become a god. This ceremony was a big event and would end at Campus Martius, a sacred place where Romulus, the founder of Rome, was believed to have become a god. A highlight of this event was a huge fire, similar to how Heracles' story is told. But here's an interesting detail. Historians like Cassius Dio and Herodian tell us that the emperor's real body wasn't actually used in this ceremony. Instead, a wax model of the emperor was used. This made the ceremony easier to plan and also also gave the royal family some privacy during the real cremation. Plus, using wax meant that there was no remains left behind. Dio wrote that the main point of the ceremony was to make the emperor a god. As part of the ceremony, an eagle was released when the fire was lit symbolizing the emperor's rise to the heavens. This way of remembering the emperor continued for a long time. Even when other burial customs changed, it was all about showing the emperor's connection to great figures like Heracles and the powerful legacy they left behind. Understanding Myths and Beliefs in 1983, Paul Vane posed a thought-provoking question. Did the Greeks believe in their myths? The answer isn't straightforward. To understand, we have to dive deep into what myth and belief really meant. The ancient Greeks, like many other ancient civilizations, viewed their gods in two main ways. Sacred figures worshipped in religious practices, legendary characters found in tales, folklore, and myths. Ancient writings show both views. However, stories of gods and heroes were more popular. Vane pointed out that the ancient Greeks were fully aware of the artistic creation of myths, especially in art and literature. This artistic and literary focus on gods and heroes was also prominent in later cultures, like the Roman and Hellenistic ones. These cultures seem to enjoy these myths similarly to how we enjoy movies today. Vane gave an example by referring to an ancient author, Pausanias, highlighting that almost every village had its own local legend. These local legends, crafted by unknown storytellers, sounds like the Gospels, would be picked up and shared by scholars and writers of the time. They were popular, loved by the people, and widely depicted in art and literature. They were like the stories of saints and martyrs from later historical periods, full of drama, love, adventure, and wonder. However, Vane also noted that these legends weren't seen as a direct part of everyday life. While they were accepted as real, in some sense, they weren't considered part of the immediate present. These myths took place earlier, during a time when gods interacted directly with humans. Even though the stories were deeply rooted in culture, they were seen as happening in a different world or dimension. The ancient writer Hesiod spoke of a distinct divide between the world of myths and our regular world. Later writings in Greek and Latin blurred this line a bit. These writings, or stories, were presented in two main categories, or modes, historical reality and mythical space. The writer would signal which mode they were using, guiding readers through the story. The Roman philosopher Cicero, for example, talked about three ways to understand stories. Fables, stories that are neither true nor believable. History, accounts of real events that happened long ago. Plausible stories, tells that sound believable even if they aren't true. Centuries later, another thinker, Sextus Empiricus divided stories in a similar way. Most historians of the time mixed real history with myths, though some, like Thucydides, were stricter about keeping myths out of the records. However, others, like Herodotus, managed to balance both while still distinguishing between them. Aristotle, the renowned Greek philosopher, wrote about different types of literature based on the nature of the characters. For instance, Epic poems and tragedies dealt with grand figures, while comedies and satires focused on more everyday characters. Northrop Fry, a 20th century expert on literature, drew from Aristotle's ideas. He proposed various modes or categories based on the type of hero in the story. Here's the list 2.2 Fry's hero modalities. 
One, the hero is superior in kind both to humans and to the natural world. Two, the hero is superior in degree both to humans and to the natural world. Three, the hero is superior in degree to other humans but not to the natural world. Four, the hero is ordinary like the reader. And five, the hero is inferior and thus provides a negative, ironic, or comedic example. A translation fable is a type of story often used to end a personal tale, highlighting the great deeds of the hero, even suggesting they had divine qualities. Think of it as the exiting twist at the end of a movie. Some historians, like Polybius and Tacitus, stuck to strict and factual methods of writing about the past. However, Others like Livy and Dionysus of Halicarnassus blended facts with such exciting tales. In this section, we've gathered various examples of these fables from well-known ancient authors. Table 2.1 shows where these fables pop up. You're looking at the table now, sorted by author and how often. Classic writers such as Homer, Hesiod, and Ovid used these fables frequently. Their stories often involved transformations where people would change form. Most of these authors wrote these tales as if they were sacred legends. Looking at this graph, this image of the translation fables and their multiple occurrences in these authors, look at this. Pausanias had 19 translation fables, Ovid 14, Egonus 13, Pseudo Polydorus 12, Diodorus Siculus 11, Plutarch 10, Antoninus Liberalis 6, Pindar 6, Lucian 5, Euripides 4, Homer 4, Apollonius of Rhodes 3, Aretas, I hope I'm saying that right, 3, Parthenius 3, Philostratus 3, Athenius 2, Cicero 2, Conan 2, Diogenes of Latius, I'm probably butchering this, you get the point. You see the image. This is a common theme. It's it's a well-known trope. This is what you do. When such a fable was part of a historical account, it was sometimes flagged for readers as being a legend. This was to make sure readers could differentiate between fact and folklore. For example, Livy in his book about Rome said some of his sources were more like poetic stories than hard facts. He believed there was a difference between stories about gods and ordinary history. Other authors, like Plutarch, were critical of blending the divine with the mortal in these fables. Some writers, like Herodotus, were careful to mention that these tales were local legends. Cicero, talking about the story of Romulus, questioned its authenticity, suggesting it may have been made up. In ancient times, legends about a person's transformation or elevation could pop up right after their death, challenging the idea that legends take time to form. Christian writers later had to figure out how these fables fit with their beliefs. Augustine, for instance, tried to differentiate between made-up stories and the religious stories that were central to Christianity. Over time, Christian writers moved away from these ancient fables to more theological discussions. But just like any popular story or movie today, even if people knew these ancient tales weren't strictly true, they still loved and believed in them to some extent. I hope you can see the Gospels being created as you close your eyes and think about it after seeing so far how we've come. critical method and the Gospels. Every statement, even if it's poetic or cryptic, has a set of rules behind it that can guide us on how to make similar statements. Jacques Derrida, 1987. In 1977, two remarkable spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, were sent out to explore our solar system and the vastness beyond. As of September 2013, they had moved into interstellar space, making them the farthest objects humans have ever sent beyond our atmosphere. NASA asks the famous cosmologist Carl Sagan, who was a main thinker behind these missions, to create a message that would represent humanity. This was in case some intelligent life form from the stars finds one of the probes in the distant future. With the help of experts, Sagan made what's known as the Golden Record, this record made of gold-plated copper has greetings in over 60 languages, an audio essay, ma many pictures, and over 90 minutes of music. But here's
here's a question. If Sagan had spoken to a language expert, would they have told him that this was a nearly impossible task? This is because language, culture, and the way societies work are all tied together. How can someone or something not from Earth begin to understand the message on that record? Similarly, the New Testament has stories that have lasted for thousands of years. They come from a very different time in human history, from the major cultural centers of the ancient Mediterranean world. We need to ask ourselves, what does reading these stories involve, both for the people back then and for the scholars today, to truly understand them? This section tries to answer that. To really get the original meaning of these stories, we need to dive deep into the cultures of the ancient Greek and Roman world. We have to use a mix of history, literature, and cultural methods to do that. In this study, we'll use methods that really help explain things. The main goal is to understand the hidden meanings and the cultural and social context of these ancient stories. While some methods are really important, others might not be as useful. However, this study won't cover everything or all the ways to look at the topic. In the busy cities of ancient Greece and Rome, the New Testament Gospels were seen as bold, and different. They were powerful messages that the early Christian communities would read, consider sacred, and celebrate. These texts borrowed ideas ideologically, mythically, and literarily from Judaism, but they really stood out because of how they connected with the popular Hellenistic culture of the time, signaling the same linguistic signs well known in those stories. They were like a fresh new take that challenged the traditional ways of thinking by also using the traditional vehicle to do so. These texts cleverly used and changed many of the big ideas from the culture back then. Written in Greek, the Gospels talked to the people in a way that was familiar, yet also different, tapping into the heart of their culture by using their culture and subverting it. This was a way for early Christians to show who they were and where they stood in a world full of different beliefs and values. To understand the Gospels better, we need to look at them with both cultural and language lenses. Doing this can help us see how they might have used popular stories of the time in a new way. This deep dive gives us clearer insights than just a simple look would. Understanding the symbol, not just the object. Pay attention to this image of a pipe created in 1928 to 1929 by René Magritte. In simple terms, when we look at Magritte's painting of a pipe, we're seeing more than just the pipe itself. We're seeing what the image of the pipe represents or suggests to us. It's like when we use a symbol to mean something deeper. The painting doesn't just show a pipe. It's hinting at the luxury and status associated with smoking a pipe in the 20th century France. Roland Barthes a French expert on symbols and meanings tells us that it's these deeper suggestions or hidden meanings that truly give meaning to an image or expression. Michel Foucault, in his smart essay about Magritte's painting titled The Treachery of Images, made an interesting point. He said the painting isn't actually a pipe, but just a picture of one. Both Magritte and Foucault were making us think about the way we use language and symbols. They agree with linguist Ferdinand de Saussure, who said that there's no fixed relationship between a symbol, like a word, and what it represents. This makes us realize that there's a big difference between an artistic representation and the actual object it depicts. This idea becomes even more important when thinking about ancient Christian texts about Jesus. Historians have been trying for years to figure out the real historical Jesus based on these writings. But these texts were written with a purpose to communicate certain beliefs and values of the early Christian communities. Instead of being focused on the actual person of Jesus, these writings use Jesus as a symbol to convey deeper messages and challenge the prevailing ideas and institutions of their time. James C. Scott, a political scientist, calls this a hidden or 
infrapolitical reading. He uses Plato's symposium as an example to explain his point. Here is a gist of what he is saying. In the world of social science, there's already a lot of new terms being created. Even so, I'd like to introduce one more, infrapolitics. Think of it as the quiet, behind-the-scenes political battles that people face daily. While we often focus on the big, obvious political events in open societies, like protests and demonstrations, there are many more subtle fights that often go unnoticed. It's a bit like how we can't see infrared rays with our naked eye. They're there, but hidden. Why do these quiet struggles happen? Often, it's a smart choice by those involved. They might be in a weaker position and feel that speaking out directly could be dangerous. It's a bit like writing a coded message where you say one thing but mean another. This way, those in the know understand the deeper meaning, while those in power might overlook it. Leo Strauss, a philosopher, said that even if there's pressure to conform, people can still express their real opinions subtly. As long as they're careful, our challenge is to read between the lines and understand these hidden messages. Sometimes, if we have secret notes or more outspoken versions of these messages, it's easier to understand the true meaning. Otherwise, we need to use our understanding of culture to decode these subtle hints just like a skilled detective would. Using insights from Foucault to analyze how texts convey political messages, Scott's approach helps readers uncover subtle underlying messages within the writings of oppressed or marginalized groups. A quick glance might not reveal the main purpose of such texts, Scott believes that one has to first discover the hidden transcript of these oppressed groups to truly understand the deeper, often rebellious meanings of their literature. Even though Scott's insights come from a field not specifically focused on early Christian literature, they can be beautifully applied to the study of the Gospels. Every layer of Gospel writing comes from a time when early Jewish groups faced political turmoil, both from internal factions and the Roman occupation in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Early Christian communities saw themselves as the true representatives of God's kingdom, opposing and critiqued by the dominant powers. Their stories, or good news, centered around the figure of Jesus, who was seen as a political challenger, subtly questioning both Jewish and Roman authority. During the Roman Principate era, 27 to 248 CE, any writings that seemed to belittle the grandeur of the Roman Empire or its rulers could lead to severe legal consequences, being considered as reducing the majesty of the Roman people. This backdrop led to the rise of different traditions, like the critical views of the Cynic philosophers and the secretive writings of the Apocalypticists. These traditions influenced early gospel writings, especially those found in Matthew's teachings or the Q material. Did Justin, in a rare moment of early Christian honesty, reveal this hidden transcript in his statement at First Apology 21 by offering a clue to decipher the coded stories of the Gospels. Considering Scott's method and these historical contexts, readers have further reason to believe that the actual figure of Jesus might not be directly portrayed in the Gospel texts. I'm reminded of Paul's letters how politically subversive they seem by making Jesus the king or the leader or the one. Also, the book of Revelation. Composers not authors. Think of the New Testament Gospels like a painting of a pipe that isn't actually a pipe. The people we usually think of as the authors of these texts might be better called composers. Roland Barthes, a famous scholar, once said that authors don't hold the ultimate meaning of a text. To some, this idea might sound strange, especially when comparing it to what most Bible guides say. But when you consider that we're not even sure who wrote some parts of the Bible, it starts to make sense. For example, the Gospel of John hints that multiple people had a hand in the writing. This is the disciple who testifies these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Bart's ideas comes from the study of literature. He said that a text isn't just a string of words with one single meaning, like a message from God. Instead, it's a mix of many ideas and influences from culture. Just like writers Bouvard and Pocuchet, who could only copy from others, an author's main job is to combine different writings. They don't come up with anything completely new, 
In the world of signs and symbols, as we talked about the linguist named Ferdinand de Saussure studied, readers pull from common language codes to understand a text. One way to picture it, imagine an author as a chef, the text as food, and the reader as someone tasting and getting energy from that food. Barthes pointed out that the chef didn't make the ingredients from scratch. And what's the use of a chef if no one eats their food? So the reader, the one tasting the food is just as important. Therefore, it might be better to think of Bart's author as an editor or composer. This person hasn't disappeared. We're just understanding their role better. The true meaning of a work comes from the larger culture and literature that it draws from, not just the person who put it together. To truly understand the gospel's original language, we need to grasp this bigger picture, not just focus on who wrote them. Understanding the connection between symbols and similarities is vital. This idea comes from Sassou understanding of language split into two parts. One is the broad system of the language without speech, and the other is the speech itself, the actual words we hear or see. Sussar said that language is a social construct, and this concept forms the foundation of modern language studies. For our study, we are using these principles of language to understand ancient Greek and Latin stories. To truly grasp these tales, we need to know the conventions, symbols, and cultural norms of the ancient Mediterranean world. Michel Foucault explains how older Western traditions worked. Until the late 1500s, similarities were a big part of how Western cultures understood the world. Similarities helped explain and understand text that connected symbols and let people know both seen and unseen things. The world seemed to mirror itself. The ground mirrored the sky, faces seemed to reflect in stars, and plants seemed to hide secrets beneficial to humans. Paintings copied space, and any form of showing or representing something was seen as a kind of repetition. Every form of communication seemed to be saying it's mirroring life or nature. From a symbol-focused point of view, all human chats and stories, not just the old ones, depend on these similarities. Ancient Greek cultures especially used this idea of copying in many ways. They communicated using signals that were clear and easy to read. This is still true today, but back then, this idea of similarity was very important in their expressions. So it's not surprising to see early Christian stories portray Jesus in a way that fits the powerful symbols of that Greek and Roman era. They represented Jesus as the ultimate symbol of power, aligning him with the idea of a king of all kings in early Christian beliefs. Understanding the Barriers in Bible Studies there are four main challenges when looking at the Christian Bible, especially in the Western world, through an academic lens. These challenges, it seems, come from the influence of politics and the way the Bible has been historically treated. One is the divine origin assumption. Many in the Western world believe that the stories in the Bible are directly from God. Because of this, researchers have often avoided looking at the Bible as a product of its time. Instead, they view any unusual or hard to understand parts of the text as evidence of its special, God-given nature. By focusing on what makes the Bible unique, they've separated it from other historical texts, which can sometimes align more. Two, separation from classical texts. The Bible has often been treated as a separate, sacred text, different from other writings of its time. Historically, students have been taught biblical Greek as though it is its own unique language distinct from the classical Greek. This separation has given more power to religious institutions to interpret the text, which can influence broader societal beliefs. But the truth is, early Christian writings are part of the larger world of classical studies. There's no good reason to separate New Testament studies from this context. Three, artificial categories. There's been a tendency to separate early Christian literature from the New Testament, even though the latter is a subset of the former. Just like the previous point, this separation determines who gets to interpret the text for the broader society. Michael Foucault, a famous thinker, criticized such restrictions in Western institutions, and this seems like a prime example. Four, blending with early Jewish studies. Some scholars put early Christian writings under the umbrella of early Jewish studies. While there are connections between the two, like references to the Old Testament, many Christian texts were actually written for a broad audience in the Mediterranean world, not Jewish readers. 
these texts were influenced as much by Greek culture as they were by Jewish traditions. Lastly, there's a modern tendency to downplay the mix of cultures in the Bible stories. Historically, the term pagan was used to describe non-Christian cultures in a negative light. It's an outdated term and doesn't accurately reflect the rich history of classical figures like Cicero, Plato, or Herodotus who wouldn't have seen themselves that way. The New Testament writings interacted with both the broader Roman world and Jewish traditions. To dismiss the Bible's connections to classical literature shows a lack of understanding about the ancient world. The way we've traditionally talked about and studied the New Testament doesn't do justice to its rich history and context. Understanding the Foundations of Classical Texts in simpler terms, Dr. Richard C. Miller's book aims to study the New Testament Gospels by understanding the broader culture they came from. Just like how we need to know a language to understand a story told in that language, we need to know the culture to try and understand its text. As Umberto Eco puts it, there's a shared understanding that sets the boundaries for what a text might mean. Roland Barthes explains it this way. Language without speech is like a social agreement. We can't change it on our own. It's something we all have to accept if we want to communicate. This shared language has rules and meanings that we all understand. Even though these rules might seem random, they're what tie us together in society. In other words, Every cultural expression has a shared meaning because it comes from a society's shared understanding, not an individual's. The early Christian writings make sense when we understand the shared culture of their intended readers. These texts might have been countercultural at the time, but they still had to use the cultural codes everyone understood. They used familiar storytelling techniques but gave them new twists to challenge the dominant views of the time. While this study begins by looking at how language works in a specific moment, it also considers how language and symbols evolve over time. A sign or symbol never stays the same. It changes as cultures change. Although scholars like Sassur and Bartz knew this, it's often overlooked. That's why this book by Dr. Miller takes a broader approach, similar to the methods used by Yuri Lotman a notable cultural historian. The goal is to provide a well-rounded understanding, considering various perspectives and avoiding any narrow views. Stories and symbols aren't just about individual words or actions. They're part of a bigger cultural and language pattern. Think of these patterns like a secret handshake. If you know the handshake, you recognize the sign. We understand these signs because we can spot similarities and differences. Old Christian writings were clear to people because they had symbols and patterns that readers recognized. Think of it like a common language. If someone doesn't know the language, the message won't make sense. This is why if we sent a record to aliens with our symbols, like what Carl Sagan did with the golden record, they may never actually come to understand it. All symbols rely on a shared understanding. When we look back at history, we often highlight specific people or moments, thinking they suddenly brought something new. But if you look closer, you realize they were part of a bigger conversation. Take Albert Einstein, for instance. He's famous for his brilliant ideas, but when you compare his work with that of his peers, his contributions seem less revolutionary. This is because we've taken him out of his historical context, making his work seem more groundbreaking than it actually was. Early Christian writings, for example, weren't presenting totally new ideas. They reshaped existing thoughts in a new way that ended up changing the course of history over time. Many scholars have misunderstood, overlooked this fact, because they wanted to see a divine intervention in history, like the coming of Jesus Christ, or what some call the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. But with modern research, we realize that the Bible can be understood without needing to believe in divine actions. Early works by researchers like H.E.G. Paulus and David Friedrich Strauss made this clear. This book builds on their work focusing on how the stories of Jesus' death and return were told in the New Testament. Legibility here means that these stories made sense to people living during the Roman Empire. Some ask if these stories show real miracles, but a more basic question is, what were these stories trying to say? Even if early Christians believed in divine actions, this book isn't about proving or disproving miracles. Instead, it tries to understand the deeper meaning these stories would have had for their original readers. The Universal Hero Story, a deep dive. In 1909, in Vienna, Otto Rank, a close colleague of the famed Sigmund Freud, shared a groundbreaking idea in his book titled, The Myth 
of the hero's birth. Rank proposed that tales about the births of heroes weren't just random stories. He believed these stories had deep psychological meanings rooted in our human psyche. Building on the ideas of Freud about dreams and the Oedipus complex, Rank uncovered a repeated pattern in hero stories that echoed across cultures and times. This wasn't just about genes or how societies interact, but about deep-seated feelings and thought processes in humans. While many of Freud's ideas about the subconscious mind have been updated or replaced, his idea that stories and dreams reflect deep psychological needs has stood the test of time. Since the 1950s, with the discovery of the dream phase of sleep called REM sleep. Scientists have sought to understand the real purpose of sleep. Why would evolution make creatures vulnerable by making them sleep for so long? Recent findings by sleep researchers like Robert Stickold, Pierre Maquette, Carlisle Smith, and Patrick McNamara have shown that sleep helps our brains change and adapt, a process known as brain plasticity. This adaptability is crucial for our survival. McNamara, working at Boston University, has delved into the subconscious parts of our dreams. He's found that dreams aren't just random, they're shaped by our survival instincts and deepest needs. These myths or stories in our dreams help mold our minds and address our deepest emotional needs. Building on the idea of stories and myths, Claude Levi-Strauss in the mid-20th century founded a field of study called structural anthropology. He proposed that our cultural tales weren't just born out of imagination, but stemmed from the core of who we are as humans. These myths address deep, often hidden needs of our minds. This isn't just about our entertainment or tradition, but about how our minds work at a basic level. Lord Raglan in 1936 followed Rank's approach and tried to find common themes in hero stories. He wasn't just looking at birth stories, but at the entire life of the hero. Raglan identified 22 common features in these tales. Look at the list here. You could see, I don't have them numbered, but the phase of life, and going from birth all the way to legacy. And you can see the myth pattern elements. The hero's mother is a royal virgin. His father is a king and often near a relative of his mother. The circumstances of his conception are unusual. He is also disputed to be the son of a god. At birth, an attempt is made, usually by his father or his maternal grandfather, to kill him. He is spirited away, reared by foster parents in a far country. Now we're in childhood, we are told nothing about his childhood, manhood, unreaching manhood, he returns or goes to his future kingdom. After a victory over the king and or giant dragon or wild beast, he marries a princess, often the daughter of his predecessor, becomes king, for a time he reigns uneventfully, prescribes laws, Later, he loses favor with the gods and or his subjects, is driven from the throne and city. He meets with a mysterious death, often at the top of a hill. His children, if any, do not succeed him. His body is not buried. He has one or more holy scepters. Raglan created a list of traits that are commonly found in hero stories. He used this list to study many famous heroes from various cultures like Hercules, Robin Hood, King Arthur, and even Jesus. Alan Dundies, a folklore ep expert, later noted that Jesus had many of these traits too. Carl Jung, a famous psychologist from Switzerland, believed that all humans share a set of ancient ideas deep in our minds. He called these archetypes. He thought dreams helped us understand these ancient ideas. In some dreams, people see things or ideas that they haven't experienced in their life. These are what Freud called ancient leftovers, and Jung believed they were old, shared ideas that every human carries. Just as our bodies have evolved over time, so has our mind. Jung felt that our minds carry memories from a time when humans were closer to animals. The ideas of Freud and Jung remind some people of ancient Greek philosopher Plato's ideas. Plato believed in timeless, perfect forms of everything, which was illustrated by his famous cave story. Some experts believe that common dream patterns come from our genes. Some might wonder why so many cultures have hero stories with similar traits. Why are there always special circumstances around a hero's birth and death? It seems logical that 
When we create stories about larger than life figures, we give them extraordinary beginnings and ends. This doesn't necessarily mean these stories come from Jung's archetypes. While it is interesting to consider the role of ancient shared ideas and why we tell certain stories, it's undeniable that the study of heroes from different cultures and times is valuable. Joseph Campbell wrote a famous book in 1949 called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. He looked at Jung's ideas, but maybe could have looked more at the broader study of heroes. Dream experts tell us that dreams help us adapt to life. In the same way stories, movies, and books help us understand and navigate our world, these aren't just for fun. They're essential for humans. Our love for stories and myths isn't just a hobby, it's a deep need. When we take a closer look at the heroes of the ancient Mediterranean world, we see something interesting. The cultures of the Hellenistic and Roman periods intentionally copied the earlier Greek heroic figures. This imitation can be seen everywhere in art, coins, and writings of these times. In fact, being influenced by Greek culture and its heroes was a main trait of these societies from the day of Plato and Aristotle onward. Looking specifically at hero and political images from the Greek East during the Hellenistic and Roman times, Greek half-gods were the model. These half-gods had one human parent and one god as a parent. Check out this table from Dr. Miller's book. You can see prominent Hellenic demigods sired by Zeus Jupiter. Look on the left, the demigods that were birthed, the description in the middle, and mortal mother. Let's look at a few. Like at the very top, Achilles. Achilles is the demigod, Lydian boy who contested Aphrodite, mortal mother, Lam Lamia. I hope I'm pronouncing these properly, but... You get the point. You could see the name. You can look these up yourself. Let's look at Alexander, the third one from the top. King of Macedon, conqueror of the East. Mother, Olympias. These are all mortal mothers on the right. Go down to Hercules, foremost hero of strength and skill, Alchemini. And if you, if, that's like a ton of examples. It seems to be the Greeks and Romans wanted a demigod divine father figure that plays a role in the narrative of these heroes these what i would call hall of fame uh celebrities of antiquity this is how you would deify them make them larger than life which is fiction but it's part of what you did it's a deep need to make your ancestors greater than what they were or even your invented genealogies of your ancestors greater than what they really were Look at the second table. It continues. You could see in alphabetical order on the left side, and it goes all the way down to Trophonius. I hope I'm saying that right as well. Some of the mortal mothers aren't listed, but it's implied that the god um, Apollo in the second list here sired these demigods on the left with the mother. We have Suetonius that talks about Apollo being the father of Augustus, actually, Octavian, which we talked about earlier with the Caesars. This is a well-known, established fact that they would invent these narratives. And Christian apologists, I've seen it over and over with this dishonest approach, want a special plead and not recognize. In modern day, if you went to a library and you went and you were looking for fiction and everything in the fiction section, let's just say, fit this category of this deep need for inventing these demigod birth characters that have these heroic lives. And then you go into the nonfiction section and you find one example where all of the traits that you find in the fictional section are there. You go into the nonfiction section, we're supposed to say that's Jesus and that's the real one. I find that dishonest. And I think that this study is revealing that. It's exposing that, thanks to Dr. Miller's book. Then, of course, several scholars have highlighted this stuff, but he's doing it in a way I've never heard described, and I hope you're enjoying this so far. In the organized structure of the ancient Greek and Roman societies, there was a range from ordinary to godly. Unlike today, where there's a clear separation between gods and humans in many religions, back then the line was blurred. One big reason for this was how they understood the mythical nature of the gods. So instead of a clear-cut list, people often gave the title of half-god as an honor to important kings, founders, 
wise men, and sacred figures. This raised these people to a level above ordinary humans, marking them as special. There was even a tradition that saw the gods as once being great humans from a very old time. This idea became more popular starting from Alexander's time in the late 4th century, showing just how common the practice of turning humans into gods had become. However, the philosopher Plutarch criticized this loose way of thinking. He believed that rather than sending good people straight to heaven, they should first move from being human to heroes, then from heroes to half-gods, and finally, if they've been purified and made holy from half-gods to full gods. This shouldn't just be a social tradition, but should reflect reality and logical thinking. In this way, the lives of these individuals would have the best and happiest endings. Plutarch noted that this common practice was often a result of social and political customs. While certain heroic figures were used as models to elevate people and stories, this tradition mainly had political and elite purposes. Most of the people who were raised in this way were rulers, some were priests, and a few were outstanding athletes, poets, or thinkers. From a symbolic point of view, the practice of turning humans into gods depended on showing connections to specific heroic figures from the past. A few of these figures were seen as the main half-gods that set the pattern for this tradition. Important figures like Heracles, Dionysus, Castor and Pollux, Asclepius, and Romulus were the main symbols of this ancient practice. Cicero in his work On the Nature of the Gods clearly listed these figures. People through their customs and shared beliefs have chosen to honor and immortalize individuals who have done great things. So figures like Hercules, Castor and Pollux, Asclepius, Liber, also known as Dionysus, and Romulus, whom they also call Quirinius, are rightly seen as gods because of their greatness and immortality. Cicero, a prominent Roman senator, gives us a clear insight into the significant shift in Roman politics during the first century BCE. This was a period where Rome transitioned from a republic to an empire. Amidst this change, the concept of apotheosis, or the elevation of someone, to divine status became prevalent under the leadership of Octavian. However, Cicero believed this was more symbolic rather than literal, describing it as a fable. Throughout history, the most powerful examples of this deification drew inspiration from iconic archetypal figures. Yet as the Romans looked to these Greek models, their connection evolved from mere imitation to rivalry, especially during the end of the Republic and the beginning of the Principate. During these times, Rome experienced the emergence of strong leaders who polarized the nation. Notably among them were Pompey the Great and Julius Caesar, followed by Mark Antony and Octavian. Particularly, Pompey and Antony adopted godlike behaviors, echoing the practices of early rulers from the Hellenistic Levant region. However, their actions were criticized as excessive by the likes of Caesar and Octavian. The art and culture of classical times often depicted such associations. A leader might be portrayed with the traits of a god or legendary figure, or vice versa. Art historian John Polani describes this trend. Religious belief and political dialogue during the late Republic and the early Empire emphasized the special bond leaders claimed with gods. This relationship, manifesting in art, often blended the features of rulers and deities, creating ambiguity. Is it a man portrayed as a god? or a god resembling a man. To broaden Paulini's perspective, this blending wasn't just restricted to gods. Historical figures like Alexander the Great or Caesar Augustus also became templates. They represented more than their historical selves, turning into symbols or myths. For instance, Livy's account suggests that Romulus, Rome's founder, faced betrayals similar to Julius Caesar. Similarly, Virgil's hero, Aeneas, mirrors traits of Mark Antony, Paolo, and Augustus throughout his epic tale. What characteristics did these symbolic depictions highlight? Several classical studies have delved deep into this. Arthur Darby Knox's 1928 article discusses how rulers from Hellenistic and Roman times associated themselves with divinity. Notably, titles like New Dionysus were given to rulers like Mark Antony, 
Hadrian, and others. Emulating Bacchus, or Dionysus, hinted at a ruler's ambition to mirror Alexander the Great's legacy as a world conqueror. Many terms evolved to describe such associations. However, Nock emphasized that such imitations didn't mean rulers believed they were actual reincarnations of gods. As he concluded, there is not, therefore, in general, a definite popular belief that a particular ruler is, in a strict sense, the reincarnation of a particular deity. Andrew Runny Anderson's 1928 article, Heracles and His Successors, A Study of a Heroic Ideal and the Recurrence of a Heroic Type, is seminal in its examination of archetypal imitation in classical studies. It provides a meticulous introduction to Heracles, ancient history's dominant symbol of power. Anderson reveals that Heracles represented two powerful images, a world ruler and a deliverer and liberator. Reflecting on this dual role, the first century history historian Bithynia, Dio Chrysostom, encapsulates Heracles' legacy. Owing the remarkable qualities of Heracles, Zeus tasked him to govern all of humanity. Thus, due to his aptitude, wherever Heracles encountered oppression, he rectified it, regardless of whether it was among Greeks or barbarians. Yet where he found just rulers, he honored and protected them. His liberation of the earth and people didn't stem from shielding them from beasts. After all, how much harm can a lion or bear cause? Instead, it was his act of disciplining unruly individuals and dismantling the reign of arrogant tyrants. Today, Heracles continues this mission, safeguarding and assisting your kingdom throughout your rule. Further deepening the exploration of Heracles' political imitation, Ulrich Huttner's The Political Role of the Image of Heracles in Greek Sovereignty highlights how the Hellenistic period, especially during the rule of the Seleucid and Ptolemaic dynasties, often sought to emulate Heracles. As Simon Price underscores, and his study echoes, the funerary rite of ascending via a pyre draws inspiration from the legendary narrative of this archetypal hero. Shifting to Rome, the iconic figure Romulus emerges from the foundation myths of ancient writers like Nevius, Fabius Pictor, and Ennius. Rooted likely in Rome's early oral traditions, Peter Green insightfully notes that these myths, crucial for societal stability, offered explanations and justifications for contemporary beliefs, actions, and society structures. This flexibility in storytelling is not exclusive to Roman tales, but extends to other traditions, including the Christian Gospels. As Matthew Fox illustrates, interpretations of Romulus during the early Roman Empire mirrored characteristics attributed to leaders like Julius Caesar or Augustus. Conversely, these leaders often emulated Romulus, the legendary founder of Rome. Jane DeRose Evans in The Art of Persuasion, Political Propaganda from Aeneas to Brutus offers an in-depth look at how stories of Romulus serve political agendas from the time of the Punic Wars to Augustus's reign. Iconic figures from the Casus to Scipio, Africanus, and Caesar sought to validate their power by emulating Romulus. This study, along with Simon Price's observations, underscores how the funerary practice apotheosis emulated the legendary narrative associated with Rome's foundational monarch, the esteemed Romulus. Continuing Imitation the concept of imitatio Alexandri, or imitation of Alexander, became a prominent royal model among the kings of the Hellenistic period, specifically within the Antigonid, Ptolemaic, Seleucid, and Attalid dynasties. This trend arose following the division of the territories conquered by Alexander the Great. The idea gained even more traction during the Second Punic War, where figures like Hannibal and Scipio Africanus from the empires of Carthage in Rome, respectively, sought to claim the illustrious legacy of Alexander for themselves. This allure of Alexander also influenced Roman aspirations as they sought to expand their influence in the Eastern Mediterranean. They began adopting symbols and imagery from the Greek East as part of their imperial propaganda. Deborah Steiner explains, 
with Alexander and to some extent his father Philip. There was a deliberate control over information dissemination. This suggests that the portrayal of their actions by historians became an essential aspect of their reigns. The control Alexander exercised over his image was formalized in the Hellenistic kingdoms, becoming a crucial component in the propaganda efforts of these emerging states. In essence, much of the propaganda centered around influential figures post-Alexander can be seen as an expression of imitatio Alexander. Non-literary instances of this imitation often manifested in the form of distinct physical features, clothing, or symbolic imagery. The specific traits emulated typically aligned with the qualities that rulers wish to highlight. An illustrious example of this can be found in Hugh Pompeius's imitation of Alexander. Deanna Spencer notes, Pompey, born around 105 BCE, aligned himself with Sulla and after achieving military success was held Magnus or the Great by his soldiers. This along with his adoption of an Alexandrian look underscores a growing association between Alexander and potential Roman prominence. Pompey's Magnus's title, given spontaneously by his soldiers, links him to images of Alexander the Great, the celebrated general and leader. Pompey even called cultivated an Alexander-like image with long curly hair and a distinctive head tilt. This emulation of Alexander, seen as the ultimate Eastern conqueror and favored by gods, became a model for Roman leaders. It wasn't until the time of Caesar, Antony, and Octavian that negative comparisons with Alexander surfaced, such as accusations of excessive drinking and aspirations to divinity. Regarding Pompey's visual representation, Carl Galinsky observes, Pompey's hairstyle particularly the hair parted over the right forehead, is reminiscent of Alexander's. This was a deliberate imitation by Pompey, combined with his calm and friendly demeanor. Pompey's military success in the Greek East, such as the establishment of Roman rule over Anatolia, Syria, and his assistance in Jerusalem, positioned him in the shadow of Alexander, the divine emblem of the Hellenistic world. His fame was such that he was even held in Athens with the proclamation, the more you realize you are a man, the more you you become a god. After his death, his monumental achievements were contrasted with his modest tomb, with an inscription noting, such a humble tomb for one honored with so many temples. The way Pompey's life and deeds were chronicled after his death, especially by writers like Plutarch, positioned him in line with the grand legacy of Alexander in the Greek East, underlining his significance in the region's history. After Julius Caesar's loss to Pompey and his subsequent death in Egypt in 48 BCE, Caesar seemed to have fallen short short in establishing a divine monarchic image in the eastern provinces. This can be inferred from the division between the east and the west, which is evident in the rivalry between Antony and Octavian during the formation of the Second Triumvirate. These power struggles were more about cultivating a cultural image and propaganda than just military might. While Julius Caesar couldn't firmly establish this image, Octavian, who would later be known as Caesar Augustus, succeeded masterfully. Unfortunately, history has hasn't been kind to Antony, especially in the Augustan era and afterward. Antony's attempts to portray himself as a godlike ruler in the Hellenistic regions of the Levant have been largely overlooked. What remains of Antony's efforts to construct a divine image are coins, inscriptions, and statues. He tried to present himself as the next Osiris, Dionysus, Heracles, and even Alexander. Yet Octavian cleverly used these efforts against Antony. Deanna Spencer comments on Antony's efforts in the East saying, venturing into the East is like stepping into a world shaped as much by myths and stories as by reality. The East is portrayed with tales of indulgence, luxury, decadence, and altered gender roles. It is where rulers turn into despots and superstition runs deep. Roman narratives about Alexander highlight these features. Suetonius describes Antony becoming more like Alexander in his oriental context. He couldn't uphold Roman values and instead embraced roles that aligned with Alexander ultimately leading to his own downfall. Curtius talks about how Alexander became more oriental over time, much like how Antony was perceived to be influenced by Cleopatra. There's an evident connection between Alexander's and Antony's portrayals, especially regarding their relationship with foreign women. If Antony was seen as
as the successor to Hercules and took on the persona of Dionysus, then his rule aimed for a universal empire with Alexandria as its heart. But by adopting this image, he left himself open to criticism from Octavian. Building on this, Richard Stoneman adds, Dietmar Kinnist expanded on Alfred Hughes' discussion to illustrate how Augustus manipulated Alexander's image in his propaganda. Mark Antony had already linked himself with Alexander using similar imagery. Augustus exploited this association to undermine Antony. At the same time, the idea of Alexander as a global ruler was appealing. Augustus found it useful to present himself as a new Alexander in the East, even visiting Alexander's tomb and honoring Alexandria. Yet in Rome, he was more reserved. As Kinnist notes, Rome wasn't ready to fully embrace the Alexander narrative. In such context, the imperial propaganda in the Greek East tried to overshadow and even diminish the prominent figures of Hellenistic culture. Horace, a renowned court poet, once said to his emperor Augustus, I would be doing a disservice, O Caesar, if I took too much of your time. You who single-handedly manage vast affairs, protect Italy, set its morals, and reform its laws. Romulus and the other gods earned their temples for their incredible feats, such as ending wars, establishing territories, and founding cities. Yet they felt their reward did not equal their efforts. Even Hercules, known for his mythical labors, was only truly appreciated after his death. But you, Augustus, are revered in your lifetime. We recognize your greatness, acknowledging that no one like you has ever existed or will exist. Your subjects value you more than any other leader, past or present, holding only those who have passed in similar esteem and showing indifference to the rest. For a Roman perspective, adopting Greek iconic figures felt like seizing or claiming the influence Greece held in the East. Since these symbols were deeply rooted in the Eastern Mediterranean, this adoption also subtly recognized the significant influence of Greek culture and politics in the history of Mediterranean dominance. As Horace's family said, captured Greece took her savage conqueror captive and brought the arts to rustic Latium. Yet this integration was not straightforward. As Simon Price insightfully noted, merging these cultures led to the development of a uniquely Roman mythology. This complexity also became a hallmark of the gospel traditions, which combined elements from Hellenistic, Roman, Eastern, and early Jewish cultures. To challenge or claim Greek legacy, it was essential to adopt its primary symbols. To surpass that legacy, it was necessary to create superior figures. For instance, making Aeneas greater than Odysseus or Romulus superior to Theseus. However, this process often involved more than mere imitation. It entailed blending various Greek themes and assimilating associated divine figures like the Egyptian goddess Isis and the Roman god Sol Invictus. Roman propaganda aimed to elevate their leaders by presenting figures like Caesar Augustus as embodiments of multiple revered figures, including Heracles, Castor, Romulus, and others. Augustus' success came not only from embracing these Eastern symbols, but also from asserting a Western legacy of authority. Although Augustus' reign can be seen as the pinnacle of power in Western history, a closer look reveals a nuanced approach influenced by Roman traditions, modesty, and senatorial governance. Duncan Fishwick points out that the practice of emulating heroes and gods originated in Greece, not Italy. Hence, Roman political figures, use of these symbols wasn't mere cultural borrowing. It served imperialistic goals by staking a claim on the authority of these symbols. Augustus masterfully navigated this, ensuring his association with Romulus, Rome's founder, was evident. Dio gives an insight into Augustus's intent. Caesar received many honors, including the right to place laurels in front of his residence, indicating his victories and his role as the savior of the people. His residence was on the Palatine Hill, in a house believed to have belonged to Romulus. Therefore, any imperial residence is called Palatium. After fulfilling his duties, he was named Augustus by the Senate and the people. Although he initially wanted to be named Romulus, he withdrew this wish fearing accusations of seeking kingship. He was named Augustus, signifying his stature above other men, as the term is used for most revered and sacred things. Indeed, Octavian, later Augustus, lived like Romulus, dressed 
just like him and even considered adopting his name. Karl Galinsky mentions that Octavian built his divine image in Rome by referencing both Greek and Roman traditions. For instance, when he took his first consulate, an omen likened him to Romulus. After Augustus' death, his memory was celebrated and magnified, setting a precedent for the rulers that followed. But this trend of emulation wasn't limited to the highest figures. Other notable figures like Pythagoras, Socrates, and even Augustus himself were also frequently emulated. This emulation became a cultural norm, leading to clear similarities between stories of powerful figures in ancient Mediterranean civilizations. This topic of emulation in classical antiquity warrants an in-depth study beyond this brief overview. Archetypal Imitation and the Divine Birth Narrative in Matthew's Gospel in the realm of literary imitation, a concept called archetypal imitation often spotlights fictional embellishments. This is especially apparent in stories that talk about divine birth or divine transformations, serving as dramatic openers or conclusions to life stories. This phenomenon can be more deeply understood through specific examples. A case in point is the portrayal of the divine birth narrative in the Gospel of Matthew. Interestingly, the narrative of Alexander the Great's life, as recorded by Romans provides an illuminating parallel from Scipio Africanus's era to the times of the later Roman emperors. Tales of Alexander were used to shape and reflect Roman imperial aspirations. Great leaders of Rome sought to emulate Alexander's triumphs while steering clear of his flaws. Indeed, Alexander's impact was so significant in the Hellenistic regions of Levant and Egypt that any emerging leader there was inevitably compared to him. The portrayal of the divine king in Matthew's gospel is no different. Classical scholars often focus on dissecting these tales, hoping to uncover the real Alexander, just as with efforts to discover the historical Jesus. The fascination is understandable. However, in both instances, scholars might miss a significant insight. These stories, while rooted in history, were crafted with a deliberate leaning towards the mythical. This isn't mere oversight. The mythical versions of figures like Jesus or Alexander were often more potent in addressing the social and political needs of the time than their real-life counterparts. While this is evident in the accounts of Alexander, it is even more pronounced in the tales of Jesus that were foundational to early Christian writings. To understand the myth-making surrounding Alexander, Plutarch, and Arian's writings are paramount. Plutarch, in his biography of Alexander, written around the same time as the final version of Matthew's Gospel, presents a birth story of the legendary leader. Regarding his ancestry, Alexander on his father's side is believed to be a descendant of Heracles through Carinus, and on his mother's side, a descendant of Aeacus through Neoptolemus. It's recounted that Philip, having undergone a ritual on Samothrace with Olympias, fell in love with her. Before their marriage was consummated, Olympias dreamt of a thunderbolt hitting her womb, igniting a fire that spread in all directions. Later, Philip dreamt of imprinting a seal on her womb, the emblem of which resembled a lion. While most were skeptical of this vision, Aristander of Telemissos interpreted that she would bear a brave child with a lion's heart. Olympias then had another dream of a serpent beside her, which made Philip wary. Either fearing her possible mystical power powers or believing she was destined for someone greater than him. This story with its divine undertones and archetypal patterns serves as a mirror to understanding the divine birth narrative in Matthew's gospel and underscores the universality and enduring allure of myth-making in literature. One notes the similarities between this account and Matthew 1, 1 through 25. Now enumerated for clarity, look at the list of Dr. Miller's. I just reformatted it. You can see his list particularly in his book, which goes in a little bit more detail. But looking at the list, he calls list 3.2, dealing with Plutarch's Alexander 2, 1 through 4, and Matthew's 1, 1 through 25 compared. You see the features on the left, Alexander the Great in the middle, and Jesus from Matthew's Gospel on the right. Parental genealogical description at the beginning establishes Alexander's pedigree and traces Jesus's genealogy from Abraham to Joseph. Betrothed juvenile couple, young couple in love, Mary and Joseph are betrothed. Divine intervention in conception, Zeus 
Zeus interrupts the betrothal and impregnates the bride via his thunderbolt of fire. God's spirit, sacred wind, causes Mary's virginal conception. Virginal conception and birth. The surrogate father abstains until birth. Joseph doesn't consummate the marriage until after Jesus is born. Questions about sexual fidelity. Drama over the legitimacy of Alexander's conception. Joseph contemplates divorcing Mary quietly because of the conception. Distrust of conception story. Disbelief in the woman's account of divine conception with Alexander the Great. Joseph is unsure until he has a divine dream confirming the event. Prophetic dream about the child. Alexander's destiny is foretold in the groom's dream. Joseph's dream reveals Jesus will save his people from their sins. Association with magic. Alexander has later associations with magic. Magi from the east come to worship Jesus, thinking of him as a king. Beyond Jesus, no other historical figure's birth shares as many similarities with that of Alexander the Great. These shared features weren't just coincidental, they were crucial to shaping both narratives. This comparison is so prominent that it's hard to miss. It is a simple literary device. In fact, it's more likely that the story of Jesus' birth in the book of Matthew was influenced by well-known accounts of Alexander's life. By the time Matthew's gospel was written, around 80 or 90 AD, Alexander's renown far surpassed that of Jesus, making it improbable to suggest that stories about Alexander imitated those about Jesus. Plutarch, in introducing his biography of Alexander, mentioned his approach. He would focus on stories that highlighted Alexander's heroic qualities. Qualities. Later Roman writers referenced now lost sources about Alexander's divine birth from the time before Jesus, such as works by Satyrus and Pompeius Trogus, drawing inspiration from the life of the most famous figure in the Eastern Mediterranean. Matthew portrayed Jesus as a new Alexander, implying that Jesus carried on the legacy of Greek influence across the Hellenistic East. Even if there are Jewish elements in Matthew's story, they seem to be surface-level additions, with the core narrative echoing the tale of Alexander. The story in Matthew doesn't just adapt Alexander's story, but also competes with it in the cultural landscape of the time. While the idea that Matthew drew from Alexander's story might seem obvious, there are two more pieces of evidence that makes the case even stronger. First, there are notable parallels between their lives. Both have stories of divine birth. Alexander's journey to the Oracle of Am Amun-Ra at Siwa led to his being declared a god's son, much like like Jesus, and the event where Alexander was revered like a deity by the Persians resembles how Jesus was worshipped. Immediately after detailing Jesus' birth, Matthew adds two connections, the homage given by the Magi, wise men, and Jesus' trip to Egypt, which would have resonated with readers familiar with Alexander's story. Adding to this, there's an old tale mentioned by Cicero and also in Plutarch. On the same night that the Temple of Diana at Ephesus burned down, Alexander was born. As dawn broke, wise men declared that the previous night saw the birth of someone who would be both a blessing and a curse to Asia. This legend is remarkably similar to Matthew's story, offering another hint for readers. The Magi in Matthew's account further broaden the story's cultural appeal, indicating the widening ambitions of Matthew's religious community in the Eastern Mediterranean. Both Olympias, Alexander's mother, and his official historian, Callisthenes, played significant roles in promoting the legend of Alexander. Alexander's divine birth, according to surviving records. It seems that Alexander wanted to pattern his image after the Greek half-gods Heracles and Dionysus, also known as Liber Pater. Heracles particularly was a model figure for tales of divine birth in the ancient Mediterranean. In one classic account by Hesiod, Zeus fathers Heracles with Alcamini before her union with her fiancé Amphitryon. Despite some differences, the similarities between Heracles' and Alexander's birth stories were were commonly acknowledged both in the past and today. Notably, the signs pointing to divine birth in the Gospel of Matthew in relation to Jesus are even clearer and more numerous than those for Alexander, leaving ancient readers with strong hints about the prophesied importance of the child. Interestingly, both Macedonians and later Romans were often critical of Alexander's embrace of Eastern royal traditions, especially his claims to divinity. However, as Roman rulers sought to control the diverse East, they began to adopt these divine symbols to better rule over their subjects, even if this caused tension with traditional Roman values. Similarly, the Roman writer-historian, 
Suetonius used the legend of Alexander's divine birth as a template for his account of the first Roman emperor, Augustus. Suetonius wrote that a rumor circulated that Augustus's mother, Attia, was impregnated by the god Apollo in the shape of a serpent while resting in his temple. After this event, prophetic dreams told of the boy's divine future. This entire narrative echoed Alexander's story. I have read the following story in the book of Asclepius of Mendes. When Attia visited Apollo's temple late at night, she fell asleep. Suddenly, a snake approached her, left a mark on her, and disappeared. Ten months later, she gave birth to Augustus, who was hence considered Apollo's son. Before his birth, Attia dreamt that her insides stretched to the stars, covering land and sea, while another dream showed the sun rising from her womb. These parallels are evident, though Matthew's Gospel has more direct connections to the Alexander legend. Notably, ancient writers rarely explicitly stated their sources or inspirations. Deanna Spencer, a classicist, remarks that the strong cultural association between Alexander and divine legends would have been so well known that writers didn't need to explain it in their works. With the rise of the Roman Empire, the emperors became legendary figures in Roman literature, just as Matthew depicts Jesus. Roman historian Dio Cassius frames Augustus's life with divine stories. Charles Talbert notes, Legends of gods are also linked to Augustus in writings from the empire's time. In Dio Cassius's Roman history, tales about his divine birth and death interrupt the usual flow of events. At his birth, it was believed Apollo fathered him. At his death, he was declared immortal, accompanied by ceremonies and priests. According to writers like Menander Reiter and Libanius, it was customary to begin and end biographical accounts of important figures with such divine stories. While numerous scholars have drawn parallels between early Christian portrayals of Jesus' divine birth and birth stories of legendary figures from the ancient world, such as those discussed in Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces and Robert J. Miller's work, the current approach offers a deeper understanding of Matthew narrative. Rather than simplifying these stories as mere archetypes or a typical divine birth narrative as seen in the tales of Alexander, Augustus, and Matthew's portrayal of Jesus, it suggests there's more at play. These are not just reflections of the prevailing cultural trends of ancient times. They are purposeful political maneuvers using myth as a tool for propaganda and creating politicized versions of these ancient Mediterranean icons. These myths serve as signals indicating the elevation of someone destined to rule. A persistent bias towards Judaic perspectives in the study of the Gospels means that many key commentators have overlooked the influence of Greco-Roman culture on these writings. This is surprising, especially since David Friedrich Strauss, a pioneering New Testament critic, highlighted the mythical foundations of Jesus. Jesus' divine birth narratives nearly 200 years ago. Earlier, Justin made a similar observation over a millennium before Strauss in First Apology 21. In 1835, Strauss observed, Some have, therefore, pointed out the tendency in the ancient world to present great men and benefactors of their race as sons of gods, in order to clarify the emergence of such a myth. The theologians have given us plenty of examples. From Greco-Roman mythology and history in particular, one is reminded of Heracles, the Dioscuri, Romulus, and Alexander, as well as, above all, Pythagoras and Plato. However, many have sidelined in the ancient Greek and Latin literary works as pagan, deeming them only of fringe importance. This is despite the fact that the Gospels written predominantly in Greek, openly challenged many of the isolationist views of early Judaism, considering no early Christian writings in any Semitic language from the initial centuries of the Common Era have survived. It's high time to broaden the scope of our research. In the cultures of the ancient Mediterranean, imitation wasn't just the sincerest form of admiration, it was also the sign of competition. Mimicry in the Gospels, a transcendent rivalry. Even if we've once recognized Christ according to the flesh, we no longer know him in that way. 2 Corinthians 5.16 A glimpse into early Christian traditions. Before delving into the interplay of post-colonial theory and the Gospels, we need to address some foundational concepts. This book by Dr. Miller views the New Testament not as a straightforward historical account of early first century Palestine, but as a reflection of the communities that wrote 
read, and interpreted these texts during the late 1st and early 2nd centuries. As Boltmann suggested, these texts catered to the communities they emerged from rather than solely to the historical figure, Jesus. How many times have scholars tried to piece together a clear image of the historical Saul of Tarsus from the genuine letters of Paul? The enduring value of these early Christian documents lies in their function as sacred narratives that shaped and reflected social identities. Thus, they offer rich insights into the varied landscapes of early Christian movements. The narratives arguably mirror the communities that deem these texts sacred more than any individual author's perspective. A careful examination of these texts reveals the vast diversity of early Christian groups. By piecing together textual evidence, we can identify distinct Christian movements, sects, or even rival Christian schools. These were often associated with foundational figures or delineated by geographical areas. Recognizing the historical tension between these traditions, the term New Testament seems misleading, suggesting a unity that might not have been there. The theological focus that has long dominated academic studies has perpetrated a notion of a unified early Christian movement. Yet beneath the surface, Keen Observer identifies varied tales and underlying themes of competition and difference rooted in diverse socio-religious backgrounds. Essential questions are, what social implications does a particular text or passage have concerning societal positioning, identity, or formation? How did it function in the societal dynamics of competing Christian traditions? What can such narratives reveal about the societal and ideological constructs of early Christian communities? Together, the answers sketch a picture of early Christianity marked by societal challenges and disputes. Analyzing the Gospels through this lens inevitably brings us to the ongoing debate about their origins, notably the synoptic problem, topic that divides contemporary scholars. Regardless of which theory one subscribes to, the two most influential theories, the far and the two document theories, offer valuable insights. Most scholars align with one of these perspectives, both of which attempt to account for the evident textual similarities among the synoptic gospels. The enduring nature of these debates might, in itself, indicate the intricate relationship among these texts. Two significant conclusions emerge. The Gospel of Mark is the oldest. A wealth of early material first appears in Matthew, which this study refers to as Matthew's Logia. Whether this content, as per the two-document theory, circulated as a written document known as Q, or was orally transmitted as the far hy hypothesis suggests, it's clearly showcasing unique markers of early Christian social and ideological perspectives. When examining the early Christian writings through a social critical perspective, various distinct groups emerge in relation to each other. The John the Baptist movement, the Syro-Palestinian saying movement, the Pauline movement, the Petrine school, the Johannine school, the Zealot movement, Pharisaic Judaism, and others. In studying the New Testament, this approach provides a straightforward way to categorize most chapters, passages, or verses by the interactions of these groups. A significant division in early Christian writing seems to have existed between the Pauline movement, which was associated with urban Christian societies in Anatolia, Macedonia, and Greece, and the Sayings Movement from Syrian Palestine. Burton L. Mack and the Society of Biblical Literature Seminar on the Origins of Christianity noted a major difference between these two early representations of Christian beginnings. These differences are found geographically, ideologically, and their basic views of Jesus. For example, instead of Paul's term for Christ, the Sayings Movement used two different Son of Man images from classical Hebrew and early Jewish tradition. One portrayed a humble servant and the other a cosmic leader from apocalyptic visions. Many scholars believe that the apocalyptic Son of Man later became associated with Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, combining apocalyptic themes with a simpler image of Jesus, remembered as a miracle worker, charismatic teacher, and so on. Paul's letters, in contrast, hardly mention traditional stories or sayings about Jesus. If these sayings and stories were important to Paul and his followers in Anatolia and Greece, one would expect them to be frequently quoted in his letters. This lack of reference is significant given the reverence for Paul's writings and the idea that any group that emphasized Jesus' teachings would have frequently cited them. Unlike the sayings movement from Syria, which viewed Jesus as an earthly teacher from Galilee, 
The Pauline movement in Greece and Anatolia perceived Jesus as a mystical celestial being. Evidence suggests that these two traditions were aware of and disagreed with each other. The Sayings movement presented Jesus as criticizing those who praised him but ignored his teachings, while the Pauline movement emphasized Paul's independence from the original transmitters of Jesus' sayings, showing a preference for viewing Jesus not as a historical figure, but as a divine philosophical symbol for the communities that revered Paul's writings, the historical figure of Jesus seemed to hold little importance. The divergence between the Jesus-focused teachings of the Logia movement and the more abstract Christology of the Pauline movement sheds light on how these distinct traditions merged in gospel narratives especially in areas previously evangelized by Paul and others promoting the political, non-historical Christ myth. The Gospel of Mark, for instance, interweaves elements from the renowned Homeric stories. Mark's portrayal of Jesus' messianic secret presents Jesus akin to Odysseus, a powerful king and God's son, with his true identity known only to a few. This narrative further intertwines with another Homeric theme culminating in Mark's temple incident, reminiscent of the climatic scenes in Odysseus's tale. Mark also introduces a group of disciples mirroring the character flaws of Odysseus's crew, and this strategically downplays the significance of Jesus's family and the teachings of the Logia movement, paving the way for Mark's embellishments aligned with Pauline teachings. This adaptation of fiction using both Homeric tales and stories from 1st and 2nd Kings positions Jesus as a literary tool reflecting the socio-political and religious shifts in urban areas of Syria and Anatolia after 70 CE. Observing the range of early Christian gospel texts, there's a notable absence of adherence to a single Christian origin narrative. Instead, there's a vast imaginative freedom in the representation and sequencing of events. Among the many Christian documents from the first three centuries, only fragments from Papias seem to have come close to genuine historical accounts. The rest, whether they be Gospels, Apostolic Acts, Apocalypses, or hagiographies lean more toward legends and tales rather than pure historical accounts. Yet their profound nature means they shouldn't be dismissed merely as fiction. These texts lack the markers of ancient historiography and seem more inspired by classical literature. The church's later decision to canonize certain works and label them as genuine history appears largely political. The academic community should refrain from using terms like apocryphal or heretical when referring to non canonical or non-canonized early Christian Gospels. Hans Joseph Klock points out the various Gospels from the first few centuries emerged before any established canon could judge their authenticity. Therefore, no major distinction exists between the four Gospels and the other Christian narratives of the time. These texts mirror the vast diversity and creativity of early Christian community. Yet a later narrative of unity enforced by centralized Roman church authority tried to streamline and control this rich text tapestry. For example, Tatian's Diatessaron, a merging of the four Gospels, shows a growing discomfort with the multitude of Christian origin stories. Over time, this diverse narrative landscape was increasingly seen as heretical, with only certain texts and doctrines sanctioned by the Orthodox Church. By 350 CE, what was once celebrated as diversity became labeled as deviation. Regarding the formation of these narratives, while the function of a story or saying might have influenced the initial structure found in Matthew Matthew's Logia, subsequent composition, like Mark evolved these forms into more cohesive narratives as seen in Acts and the Gospel of Peter. It's essential, therefore, to analyze each passage through literary, cultural, and sociological lenses, rather than primarily through its form, contrasting the approach of scholars like Boltmann. The Gospels, Challenging Imperial Narratives Recent scholarship has recognized the political undertones of the New Testament, particularly as highlighted by Richard Horsley, John Dominic Crossan, and several post-colonial scholars. However, these interpretations sometimes miss the spiritual, otherworldly essence of the early Christian movement. This can lead to overly simplistic or even misleading conclusions. The Gospels portray Jesus as a spiritual king beyond worldly realms, rather than a direct challenge 
challenger of the day's political establishment. The adversaries who orchestrate Jesus' crucifixion in the gospel narratives make the error of portraying him as a rebellious revolutionary against the empire, hinting he aimed to set up a worldly alternative to Roman rule. Yet, the gospel tell a different story. They lead readers through a harrowing journey of injustice, compelling them to wonder, Jesus wasn't a worldly revolutionary, then who was he? When the ancient readers understood the gospel's intended message, they witnessed the true tragedy of the text. But if they misunderstood seeing Jesus as a political rebel, wouldn't his punishment seem justified? Each of the four gospels describes a horrific scene of gross injustice during Jesus' execution, with all decision makers seemingly losing their sanity, resulting in a horrifically unjust end. Mark, for instance, introduces the traitor as Judas, a name reminiscent of Judas the Galilean, who led a significant rebellion around 6 CE. Judas's actions in the gospel echo the public's strong reaction to Brutus betraying Caesar. When he comes to arrest Jesus with a group carrying weapons, Matthew recounts Jesus asking if they have come as if to capture a criminal. The term used here often wrongly translates as thief in the gospels, was used during and after the first century Jewish war to describe Jewish rebels, as mentioned by historians like Josephus and later applied to Bar Kokhba by Eusebius. The gospels intentionally contrast Jesus with Barabbas, emphasizing the injustice of Jesus' trial. The gospels further underscore this contrast by emphasizing or mentioning the money changers in the temple and the criminals crucified alongside Jesus. Cultural opinion suggesting the Jews' responsibility in inciting the Jewish war informed these themes of rebellion in Mark's gospel, as can be seen in writings by Josephus. By symbolically representing Jesus as representing the later Christian movement around 70 CE, the gospel of Mark aimed to differentiate Jesus from such accusations. Pilate frequently asked Jesus if he was a king, but Jesus often reframed the question saying, that's what you say. In all the gospel accounts, neither Herod nor Pilate find Jesus at fault. Pilate's wife and Matthew even cautioned him about Jesus' innocence based on a dream she had. Only in the Gospel of John does Jesus openly claim kingship, but clarifies, my kingdom is not of this world, otherwise my people would fight. In each Gospel, the title King of the Jews is used mockingly by Jesus' accusers. This portrayal echoes the tragic stories of figures like Heracles, and another text, Four Maccabees, relates royalty and steadfastness in the face of brutal martyrdom. The main enemy in the Gospels isn't a political figure like the Seleucid king Antiochus IV, but rather the religious authorities of Palestine. The Gospels also emphasize that the blame for Jesus' death lies with the Jewish religious leaders, not with the Roman government. Their subtle criticism of Roman power in the Gospels, primarily their prioritization of peace over justice during Jesus' trial. Some argue that the Gospels critique Roman military power, but these arguments are unconvincing. For instance, while the term legions could refer to Roman soldiers, it is mostly used in the context of demons or angels. Furthermore, Roman centurions and the Gospels are constantly shown in a positive light. Historical research has found no evidence suggesting that early Christians were seen by Rome as promoting rebellion. Contrary to some modern interpretations, early Christian messages had a universal appeal and weren't strictly tied to anti-colonial sentiments. Early Christianity was more focused on a countercultural religious transformation rather than political revolution. The Gospels highlight Jesus' transcendence over all forms of authority and emphasize the prioritization of divine matters over worldly ones. Hence, it's misleading to frame early Christianity strictly in a colonized versus oppressor narrative, as has been popular in some academic circles. The main message was an ascetic critique of everyday civilization, aiming to transform and elevate it. The earliest Christian texts portray Jesus in a manner reminiscent of various figures from Hebrew, Greek, and Roman traditions. For example, while Jesus might be shown as rivaling figures like Moses, Elijah, or David, this isn't meant to overshadow them. Instead, these portrayals aim to highlight the unique and superior nature of Jesus, just as Virgil's Aeneas emulated Homer's Odysseus without replacing him. Jesus' portrayal was meant to compare and contrast with the significant figures of the time without necessarily displacing them. Therefore, modern theories like Hami Baba's concept of mimicry, which explores resistance to domination, may not perfectly fit the early Christian context. Early Christian narratives focused on a philosophical asceticism, emphasizing a transcendence that is distinct from later historical contexts.
translation fables and the gospels. Mythological worlds had been built up only to be shattered again, and that new worlds were built from the fragments. Franz Boss, 1898. When examining the rich blend of Western and Eastern cultures in the urban landscapes of Anatolia and Syria during Roman rule, it's evident that these areas, once governed by empires like the Achaemenid, Seleucid, and Parthian, became melting pots of diverse languages and cultures. This backdrop, as widely agreed upon by scholars, birthed the linguistic setting for the four foundational Christian stories known as the New Testament Gospels. Thus, any reader must recognize that the main language and influence of these tales predominantly come from the Hellenistic regions of the Levant. This is despite the story's Jewish-Palestinian setting and their inclusion of Jewish themes. Writing in Greek during this era was not just about language, it was about conscious choice to embrace and adapt the artistic and cultural nuances of the Hellenistic world. These works, in essence, became bridges between the Greek cultural norms and their literary standards. Such an interplay showcased the deep-rooted connection between these texts and both high- and mid-tier Hellenistic cultures, even into the Roman era. The authors of these texts, influenced by both Greek traditions from the East and the growing Latin literature from the West, brilliantly utilized Greek literary conventions in innovative ways, drawing parallels, engaging with, and imitating them. This literature played a crucial role in shaping the cultural identity of people in Anatolia and Syria. It often juxtaposed the dominant Greek cultural traditions and, to a smaller extent, the emerging Roman influences. Amidst this backdrop of shifting social and cultural dynamics, literature wasn't just a byproduct by an active participant. As cultural anthropologist Victor W. Turner noted, the social world is always evolving rather than just existing statically. That's why studies only focused on structure fall short. They miss the mark because nothing is ever truly static. Terms like community or society can be misleading given how they're perceived as unchanging. Such perceptions fail to account for the constant change in human interaction. In this light, the text isn't merely a relic or keepsake from this whirlwind of social cultural changes. Instead, it stands at the forefront. Its lasting impact stems from its active role in reshaping and creating new cultural identities in the face of as perceived norm, which in reality was an illusion. As Tim Whitmarsh pointed out, cultural identity isn't something we're born with. It's shaped and contested over time. To put it in Stuart Hall's words, identity is not an essence, but a positioning. It's never straightforward. Although some cultures might seem more unified than others, it's essential to understand that no society is ever truly stable. Every society has its tensions, making the future uncertain. The idea of continuity is something we see only when we look back, making it more of a historical construct than a true reflection of a society's experience. For those who produce and signify a text, what is at stake in the composed depiction is not the past, but the future. The emerging Christian groups of the Northern Levant during the latter part of the first century and early second were actively seeking to define their identity amidst societal shifts and upheavals. The Gospels, with their rich tapestry of vivid imagery and persuasive rhetoric, were deeply influenced by this dynamic context. In ancient Levantine urban society, a blending of different cultures was evident. This culture amalgamation hints at the expected linguistic and structural intricacies present in the Gospels. Indeed, the writings of that period commonly showcased a mix of different genres, thus determining the exact literary genre of the New Testament Gospels? Well, it's challenging. They don't neatly fit into any established category. This challenge extends to identifying the literary qualities of individual stories, themes, or conventions within each Gospel. One of the complexities in the Gospels stems from their blend of traditional and innovative expressions. As one Gospel writer put it, every writer who has been taught the Kingdom of Heaven is like a householder who, from his treasury, exhibits items both new and antique. Building on the ideas of literary theorist Roland Barthes, even the new elements in, his, in a composition can be seen as familiar forms presented in new ways. Such a mix of old and new elements gives rise to unique, inventive products. This innovative approach to storytelling is evident in the New Testament Gospels. Their narratives, both captivating and transformative, reshape the cultural landscape of Roman antiquity, challenging traditional Jewish beliefs. In metaphorical terms, the Gospels represented new wine that found its vessel in the broader Mediterranean world. A deeper understanding of the gospel's diversity comes from the intricate interplay of socio-religious themes and the sources from which these narratives are derived. While some traditions within the gospels might have originated from an apocalyptic Jewish group in the Syria 
Phoenician region. Other sources clearly ventured beyond the confines of traditional Jewish teachings, notwithstanding their foundational Jewish setting and occasional Jewish idioms. The Gospels frequently borrowed from the broader cultural and literary conventions of the Hellenistic Roman-controlled Levant. Such a bold combination challenges the notion of viewing the Gospels solely within the confines of traditional Hellenistic Judaism. The text reflect a powerful mix drawing from early Jewish, Persian, Hellenistic, and Roman traditions. The myths surrounding the origins of ancient Rome provided a foundation for the empire's emerging competition, Christianity. Dr. Miller's book seeks to show that early Christian communities in many ways mirrored the Roman Empire, but offered a reimagined countercultural version of it. Emma Dench points out that as the Roman Empire grew, there was a reshaping of its foundational stories. They invented myths that portrayed a diverse origin for Rome. For example, the famous story of the abduction formerly raptio or stilling of the Sabine women or the Sabine women and the sanctuary policies set by Rome's divine founder Romulus were often seen as supporting the widening Roman identity under rulers like Caesar and the Julio-Claudian family. Caesar was both praised and criticized for accepting senators and citizens who were once looked down upon or were from outside Italy. Augustus followed a similar path by granting citizenship to various groups throughout his ever-expanding empire. He even went so far as to offer senatorial seats to those outside the Roman elite, including some foreigners. Claudius, as Seneca notes, took this policy a step further, saying he decided indeed to see the whole world in a toga. Greeks, Gauls, Spaniards, and Britons. In essence, granting asylum and showing mercy became a hallmark of Roman rulers. Interestingly, the Gospels echoed these strategies. This is evident in a passage from Matthew. Many will come from the east and from the west and will recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in heaven's kingdom. But you will be exiled to the furthest, darkest, where there will be crying and the grinding of teeth. Some underlying messages continue throughout the New Testament, especially in the foundational stories of Luke Acts. Central to this book that Dr. Miller wrote is the idea that the Gospels appealed to a wide audience by drawing on various cultural symbols and norms, some of which were neither native to Judaism nor the classic Hebrew tradition. Understanding the diverse and universal themes in the Gospel stories is crucial for this area of the documentary. This understanding leads us to several pressing questions. Given the variety of themes and traditions present in these texts, do any of them present Jesus, the central figure of Christianity, in a particular way that draws on familiar storytelling techniques of the time? Can such cues guide readers in interpreting the narrative's ending? Were there elements that might have confused the earliest readers? Apart from Justin's writings, did other early Christian documents hint at how the earliest Christians interpreted the New Testament accounts of Jesus' resurrection? This documentary seeks to answer these main questions. Although we won't delve deeply into every resurrection narrative, in each of the four Gospels, we will thoroughly address the questions mentioned above. Specifically, we aim to understand how these stories resonate with cultural norms of the Mediterranean world at the time. The Multiple Meanings of Resurrection in the Gospels the New Testament Gospels often reference the idea of resurrection. How were these accounts understood by their original readers? Were they seen merely as tales of physical revival? Or was there a deeper, more nuanced interpretation at play? Modern English readings of the New Testament, however, often fail to capture the diverse meanings of the term resurrection, which can describe several distinct events or ideas. Let's dive into each of these in detail. The resurrection of the world and the end of the underworld. Early interpretations of the Gospels, influenced by Jewish traditions of the time present a society divided by their beliefs regarding the general resurrection at the end of times. Studies have shown that these variations in belief were instrumental in shaping Jewish identity, especially during the turbulent Maccabean revolt in the 1st and 2nd centuries BCE. During this period, Judaism was evolving amidst fierce competition for dominance in the Palestinian region between East Persian empires and West Hellenistic empires like Seleucid, Ptolemaic, 
and Roman. In earlier Hebrew text, Sheol or Sheol, often translated as the grave, began to be equated with the Greek idea of Hades or the underworld. However, these texts did not speak of a universal resurrection of the dead. It is in later Jewish apocalyptic writings, such as Daniel and other texts, where we start to see the concept of a day of resurrection and a grand rejuvenation of the world. These ideas seem to have been influenced by early Persian religious beliefs, especially the Zoroastrian views prevalent during the Achaemenid period. John J. Collins suggests that while concepts of resurrection and cosmic renewal might have some Persian influence, the Jewish interpretations were unique. He argues that they didn't just borrow these ideas, they reshaped them. Early Jewish apocalyptic writings presented the idea of immortality as a life lived with the heavenly hosts, an idea rooted in Near Eastern mythology. These texts use traditional themes from various cultures, blending them into something fresh and new. This blending, in essence, became a way for early Jewish writers to assert their cultural identity and resistance against the expanding influence of the Seleucid and Roman empires. For instance, the heroes in the Book of Daniel are depicted not just as stalwarts of Jewish beliefs, but as the embodiments of superior Persian virtues. Early mentions of the physical resurrection in Jewish literature can be found in Daniel 12 and 2 Maccabees 7. Both these texts subtly champion Jewish resistance against the Seleucids by suggesting a mastery over the dominant culture's practices. Notably, the idea of a resurrection was also evident in the 4th century BCE, works by Theopompus and Eudemus of Rhodes, who saw it as a fundamental belief of Persian Zoroastrian theology. Diogenes Laertes referencing Theopompus stated that according to the Magi, Persian priests, humans would eventually resurrect and attain immortality. Due to these overlaps and beliefs, some thought that Judaism might have been influenced by ancient magician or Magian religion. Plutarch also highlighted the dualistic nature of Persian eschatology, elements of which can be seen in texts like 2nd Baruch, 4th Ezra, and Revelation. In this ultimate vision, the supreme god of light defeats the main evil spirit and after raising everyone to immortality, puts an end to Hades or the underworld. The New Testament Gospels portray two primary sects of Palestinian Judaism, the Pharisees and Sadducees. Unique to the Pharisees was their adoption of Persian religious beliefs, such as the concept of angels, demons, resurrection, and more. This made them stand out from the Sadducees and emphasized their resistance to Hellenistic influences, a stance tracing back to the revolt led by Judas Maccabeus. The Pharisees' belief formed the popular image of Palestinian Judaism, providing an alternative to the Hellenistic approach and the aristocratic views of the Sadducees, as referenced in Acts 23.8. When we explore the New Testament, understanding these roots gives insight into the text. This background helps us recognize how early Jewish and Christian writings adopted and transformed various beliefs and concepts. For instance, historian Josephus highlighted that Pharisaic beliefs, although initially resistant, gradually incorporated Hellenistic elements. This evolution in thought was particularly evident when they began to confront the Roman Empire. The inclusion of Oriental elements in early Christian texts initially symbolized resistance against Western cultural dominance, but simultaneously echoed a growing fascination with Eastern beliefs in the Roman world. One of the key takeaways here is understanding that the resurrection of the dead wasn't just a spiritual concept. It also served as an identifier, a marker of social, cultural, religious identity. It's plausible to interpret such beliefs as codes symbolizing social and political affiliations. Early Christian writings, especially those of Paul, emphasized the concept of the resurrection of the dead as central to the emerging faith. For example, Paul's letters mention this theme prominently, referenced to 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 58, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. Matthew, in his account, spoke of a day of judgment and resurrection, indicating the significance of this belief during Jesus' era, Matthew 12, 41 through 42. A notable episode in Mark 12 depicts an interaction with the Sadducees, highlighting the core beliefs of the synoptic communities. This account suggests that in the end times, bodies won't be resurrected in the way we might imagine, but will be transformed into new forms, resembling angels. This concept aligns with the Pharisaic belief described by Josephus and the Persian belief detailed by Plutarch. However, both views potentially show signs of Hellenistic influence, which typically downplayed the importance of the physical body in favor of the spirit or soul. Luke 
Acts narrates a tale of Paul's debate with leading Epicureans and Stoics in Athens, considered the heart of Hellenistic philosophy. The crux of this confrontation revolved around the resurrection of the body. This belief conflicted with classical Greek philosophies, especially those introduced by Plato, which saw the body as a hindrance to the soul's spiritual journey. In essence, the complexities and nuances surrounding the resurrection concept in the New Testament are deeply rooted in the social, cultural, and philosophical milieu of the time. Understanding these origins and influences offers a richer appreciation of the text and the beliefs of early Christians. The profound integration of Christian beliefs with Platonic philosophy reached its pinnacle with Marcion school and early Christian Gnosticism. In these schools of thought, the term referring to spiritual ascent was used as a Christian label for what Middle and Neoplatonism saw as a key concern, spiritual freedom. This idea is most famously explored in Plato's Phaedo and Timaeus. One major shared belief among these groups was that personal resurrection was fundamentally non-physical. This idea contrasted with the beliefs of the Thomasine school, the Johannine school, which emerged in the late first century, sought a middle ground. For them, both faith became the means of salvation and it embraced the whole person both body and spirit being reborn signified obtaining eternal life covering both the physical and spiritual realms. Followers of this tradition believe they had undergone a spiritual transformation from death to life, as mentioned in the book of John. This spiritual transformation assured them of a future physical resurrection, an idea exemplified by Jesus, their unique divine figure. The topic of what happens after death, often discussed in philosophical debates, was a major undercurrent in early Christian writings. Recognizing this is crucial to understanding the early Christian view of resurrection, not as his historically proven event, but as an ideological belief. This theme was expressed both in narratives and theological writings. The stories of resurrection in these writings weren't intended as concrete historical events, but as symbolic representations of this belief. Jesus, described as the firstborn of the dead in Revelation, was a central figure illustrating the evolving thoughts in both Jewish and broader Mediterranean philosophical discussions. Both orthodox accounts that portrayed Jesus' resurrection as physical and unorthodox ones that depicted it as spiritual or ethereal were products of their time and cultural context. Each early Christian group narrated their understanding of the world using Jesus as a symbolic figure. This explains the variations in resurrection stories and the debates over Christian identity. Early Christian apologists and champions like Athenagoras and Tertullian, even when deeply discussing resurrection, didn't try to historically prove the resurrection of Jesus. Instead, their writings extensively debated the nature of resurrected beings. Solitary Resuscitation Narratives From the start of the gospel tradition, stories where Jesus miraculously revives recently deceased individuals are present in all four gospels of the New Testament. Early accounts depicted Jesus as someone performing miraculous healings and bringing the dead back to life, fulfilling prophecy related to the one who would come. Such stories are highlighted in three main episodes in the gospels. The revival of the widow's son in Nain, Luke 7. The revival of Jairus' daughter, as seen in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And the revival of Lazarus in John 11. These episodes echo older stories found in the Old Testament, like Elijah bringing back the widow's son and Elisha reviving the Shunammite's son. Interestingly, the term often translated as resurrection is not frequently used in these accounts, but instead a term meaning rising is chosen. Looking beyond biblical texts, stories of miraculous resurrections were quite popular during the classical antiquity, especially in regions influenced by Hellenistic culture. Pliny the Elder, a famous ancient author, relates several such accounts in his work, Natural History. Treating many of these stories as credible, the distinguishing feature in the gospel accounts is that Jesus did not need to pray to perform these miracles, unlike some of the other biblical figures. This portrayal follows a larger cultural theme where divine figures, termed divine men, exhibit miraculous powers, notably renowned figures like Heracles, Empedocles, Asclepius, and Apollonius were all portrayed as divine individuals with the ability 
ability to bring back the dead. A crucial distinction to make regarding these resurrection stories in the Gospels is that they shouldn't be confused with the idea of immortality. The individuals Jesus revived didn't attain eternal life, but simply had their mortal lives extended and would eventually face death again. The post-mortem accounts of Jesus, as described in the four Gospel narratives, present a unique perspective that doesn't fit neatly into the first two well-known classifications concerning resurrection. Neither the anticipated end times resurrection nor the temporary bringing back to life apply. Importantly, none of the Gospels indicate that these accounts are meant to point towards the culmination of time, often referred to as the eschaton, or a utopian era on earth. However, the Gospel of Matthew, while elaborating on Mark's account of the empty tomb, presents a somewhat unconventional narration. Quote, the tombs were opened and many bodies of the holy who had fallen asleep were raised, and after coming out of their tombs following his Jesus resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. End quote. Ulrich Luz provides a balanced perspective, suggesting that this unusual narrative, though illustrating a form of collective resurrection, seems to be more influenced by the stories of individuals being taken up into the heavens, commonly termed as translation fables, than by Jewish expectations of a grand apocalyptic event. The many that were raised don't represent a universal event, as often imagined in end time scenarios. Instead, these accounts bear resemblance to translation fables where significant figures from a tradition are honored. In this case, revered figures from the Hebrew tradition might be seen in light of the respected figures of Greco-Roman stories, harmonizing Hebrew traditions with Hellenistic values. Furthermore, concerning the notion of a lone resurrection where an individual returns to life only to die once more, the Gospels offer no evidence of such scenario for Jesus. Only the passage in Matthew 27, 52-53 connects Jesus' post-mortem narratives with any event that might be seen as eschatological in nature, but when we approach these accounts not through the narrow lens of single term like resurrection in Greek anastasis, but rather by examining the broader features of the narratives, we see they echo key elements of the Mediterranean tales of individuals being taken up into the heavens. This examination concludes by exploring these features, understanding how early Christian thought engaged with them, and offering insights into their contemporary religious and philosophical implications. Translation Signals and the Gospels Morris R. Cohen and Ernest Nagel, in their renowned text, An Introduction to Logic and the Scientific Method, discuss the intricacies of analogical reasoning in their chapter titled Probability and Induction. They highlight that drawing conclusions based on similarities can only be probable and not absolute. However, their perspective is rooted mainly in the tangible world of science and empiricism, without giving much consideration to the cultural and linguistic domain where signs and symbols reign supreme. In this linguistic domain, similarities within language structures determine the validity of conclusions. Historical and literary studies rely on induction, working with probabilities rather than certainties. Yet, as researchers delve deep into the symbols and signs within a text, this probability can often resemble conventional certainty. The presence of the translation fable in ancient Greek and Latin literature is a prime example. This recurring pattern or motif, evident across multiple texts, showcases a set of repetitive traits with certain established meanings. However, when it comes to comparing Jesus, one of the most revered figures in Western culture, with other historical patterns, biases often creep in. Some researchers, driven by personal beliefs, tend to view Jesus' resurrection narratives either with extreme skepticism or unquestionable reverence. Skeptical views have a occasionally fall on prey to what Samuel Sandmel called parallelomania, which means drawing forced comparisons just to undermine the resurrection stories as mere cultural creations. On the contrary, some faith-orientated studies isolate the resurrection narratives, trying to present them as unique events, thereby making them appear historically valid. However, the key to understanding these narratives isn't about finding a midpoint between skepticism and faith. Instead, it involves setting aside 
provide personal biases to understand how these stories fit into the broader linguistic and cultural context of their time. Three notable characteristics are evident in post-mortem narratives, particularly in the Gospels. These characteristics pertain to the completion of a story arc, the divine nature of the resurrected body, and the implicit establishment of the religious practice, and the implicit establishment of a religious practice. A remarkable feature of these tales is their foundational role in concluding a story. Peter Brooks suggests that the interplay between difference and similarity propels both readers and stories toward resolution. He says transformation represents a union of difference and resemblance. This kind of transformation can be compared to a metaphor, where resemblance is confirmed by bringing together different actions through perceived similarities. This relationship incorporates them into a shared storyline, which implies excluding unrelated incidents or actions. In essence, meaning in a story requires metaphor, as the storyline's meaning is rooted in the structure of actions in cohesive understandable units. The translation narratives resolve the tension between the valiant and tragic modes of classical literature, with valor ultimately prevailing. These tales essentially redress tragic losses, reclaiming the protagonist in a celebration of their heroic ascent. Every ending in a story, as Brooks emphasized, acts like a tribute that provides context to the preceding events. In the Gospels, much like the iconic tragedy surrounding the demise of Heracles, this climatic twist creates a profound theatrical impact. The passion stories in the Gospels consistently guide readers through a larger narrative that prioritizes reason over basic instincts, presenting this as the ultimate expression of noble virtue. For instance, John's Gospel captures this theme of noble tragedy by mirroring Socrates' demeanor. As in Plato's writings about Socrates, John's central character bravely faces martyrdom with the determination of a wise philosopher. The Gospels depict the heroic demigod as a benefit factor who faces an intense tragedy. The brave hero is eventually consumed by the tragic events, alluding to Freud's idea that the pursuit of pleasure isn't the pinnacle of human thought. The main character in the Gospels, by attaining superior rationale and self-control, triumphs over his deepest instincts and desires. The motif of noble sacrifice followed by elevation in the New Testament Gospels was prefigured in early Christian practices, as reflected in words from Philippians 2, 5 through 11. This proclamation would have resonated powerfully in the first century Roman Macedonia. It controversially attributes royal elevation to a crucified man from Palestine. Quote, have this mindset among you that was also in, inaugurated, Jesus, who, despite starting out in a God's semblance, did not regard being equal to a God as his prize, but emptied himself, taking a servant's form, being born in the manner of humans, and being found as a man in appearance. He did lower himself by becoming a subject to the point of death, a death on a cross. Consequently, God exalted him and granted him the name that is above every name, so that at Jesus' name every knee would bow. Of those in the heavens, of those upon the earth and of those of the netherworld, and every tongue would confess that inaugurated Jesus is ruler." End quote. The early structure found in hymns served as the guiding framework for the narratives of the New Testament Gospels. Intriguingly, Paul does not emphasize the concept of resurrection. Instead of being central to the story, resurrection is presented as a side note to a larger theme of exaltation. The early Christian narratives merge two contrasting images, a miraculous divine king and a marginalized Jewish figure in a tense political setting on the brink of upheaval, specifically the first Jewish war. This blending creates a new metaphor for countercultural social action. The good news introduced a specific early Christian story form that praised the founder, granting him the traditional Greek tribute of everlasting fame, thereby promoting the Christian movement in the late first and early second centuries. The transformative journey of the central figure in these stories offered a blueprint for a key early Christian belief in societal upliftment. Emma Dench highlights that the increasing popularity of transformation myths during the Roman era mirrored unusual societal mobility trends. Such transformation stories were metaphors, cultural myths, or beliefs highlighting extraordinary individual rise, with the ultimate example being tales of changing form. The mocking treatment of the disguise 
baptized king in the gospel narratives echoes the ancient tale of Odysseus, the king who returns home in the guise of an old beggar after a divine transformation. Understanding the Gospel of Mark, the oldest and foundational of the four gospels, becomes clearer when compared to the revered works of Homer. Many of Mark's distinct themes and scenes gain clarity when paralleled with Homer's writings. In the Transfiguration episode, where Jesus shows his divine nature to his three closest followers, the story introduces Moses and Elijah, two Jewish figures known for their heavenly assumptions to highlight the contrast with Jesus' exalted status. Peter, representing himself and his companions, suggests building three shrines for these luminous figures. However, a divine voice intercedes, highlighting Jesus' unique status as a demigod. Elements like clouds and mountaintops, also found in ascension stories, are present in this narrative. In terms of narrative structure, it's crucial to understand that early Jewish resurrection stories did not traditionally serve as plot conclusions. Instead, tales of transformation or translation typically held this role. Recalling Vladimir Propp's 1928 study on the structure of traditional Russian fairy tales where he categorized recurring narrative elements, one can view the transformation story as a common feature in tales of iconic figures from ancient times, providing a standard ending to their stories. In a similar fashion, the New Testament Gospels conclude their accounts of Jesus' life using the same narrative style. The Body of a God In many, if not all instances, the episodes that describe Jesus' life after his death in the Gospels appear to symbolically showcase his unique divine physical attributes. As we've previously discussed, certain signs or indications in these accounts point to the transformation of a mortal body into one that's divine, superhuman, and eternal. Some biblical scholars have inaccurately described this transformation as primarily about movement in space rather than change in the nature of the body itself. Thus, they've mistakenly seen ascension as the main expression of this transformation. However, as we highlighted in our earlier chapter, both Hellenistic and Roman traditions employed a range of story elements such as disappearing and reappearing, changing form and ascending as evidence of a hero's deification, transcending the limitations of human existence. These characteristics were often associated with immortal gods as scholars like Arthur Pease and Jean-Pierre Vrant, among others, have noted. Mark's Gospel, one of the earliest, notably presents the absence of Jesus' body from the tomb as a powerful symbolic indication. Jesus could disappear. He had undergone a divine transformation. This theme was echoed in later Gospels, Matthew 28, 1-10, John 20, 3-9, Luke 24, 1-11. Instead of focusing on the re-emergence of the resurrected, as in the account of Lazarus in John's Gospel. The emphasis is on the absence of Jesus' body. This motif can also be seen in the Greek novel Chereus and Kalihari, where the character Chereus finds Kalihari's tomb empty and interprets this as her having transformed into a goddess. An empty tomb or missing body in tales often signaled a divine transformation. Another example comes from the legend of King Numa, which without much explanation insinuates that his missing body after death meant he had become divine. This idea traces its roots back to tales about the missing remains of the hero Heracles and was traditionally represented in Roman royal funerary rituals, including the ceremonial burning of a wax likeness of the deceased emperor. The divine beings in Hellenistic and Roman traditions were believed to have the power to appear and disappear at will. Luke's account of Jesus demonstrates this ability when he vanishes before his disciples in a Ascension to heaven is another representation of this power. Moreover, the resurrected Jesus in the Gospels could appear anywhere, even behind locked doors. This idea of divine appearances predates the Gospels as evidenced by Paul's account in Corinthians and was later incorporated into Gospel narratives. Intriguingly, in Acts, Paul sees Jesus on the road to Damascus, but his companions do not, a theme reminiscent of Homer's Odyssey, where Telemachus couldn't see the goddess Athena, who his father, Odysseus, could see because, quote, the gods do not visibly appear to all, end quote. The Gospels also incorporate themes of metamorphosis, 
another sign of divine transformation. Examples range from the blinding light that Paul encounters to instances where Jesus appears unrecognizable, like to Mary Magdalene, and on the road, uh, the Emmaus Road story in Luke. Such transformative appearances continue to be a reoccurring theme in early Christian stories. To the readers of the ancient Hellenistic and Roman worlds, narratives about the post-death appearances of Jesus could be understood in two primary ways, as evidence of his divine transformation or as encounters with a spirit returned from the underworld. Ancient literature has a rich collection of ghostly apparition tales. However, the three gospels following Mark emphasize Jesus's tangible physical presence to clarify he wasn't just a spirit. See these sources. Luke is particularly clear on this, recounting how Jesus reassured his disciples by showing his physical wounds and eating food in front of them. Contrary to some interpretations suggesting that these accounts aim to prove the plausibility of Jesus's resurrection, a closer reading suggests they were more about emphasizing his divine nature. Instances where he's worshipped, like in Matthew 28, 9 and John 20, 28, suggest a focus on elevating his status, not merely portraying realism. If Jesus wasn't merely a spirit, then by ancient understanding, he must have been divine. In early Jewish beliefs, no resurrected figure demanded worship, only those who had undergone a divine transformation, moving from mortality to immortality were worshipped. Implied worship and veneration. The concept of the translation fable inherently suggests the act of worship, veneration, and the appeal to the elevated divine being. Within the framework of empires, this draws a parallel between the early Christian view of Christ and the traditional reverence shown to emperors, a focus that has gained traction in the study of early Christian traditions. It's crucial to understand that the translation fable, unlike early Jewish concepts of resurrection, inherently implies deification in worship. This idea is subtly echoed in gospel accounts, as seen in verses like Matthew 28, 9 and John 20, 28. After interacting with Jesus' divine immortal form, Thomas addresses him with a title reserved for the emperor Domitian, quote, my Lord and my God, end quote. As this study highlights, the translation fable symbolizes cultural deification, which naturally leads to divine reverence toward the elevated individual. Drawing inspiration from the pioneering work of Russian formalists like Viktor Shklovsky and Vladimir Prop uh, Tsvetin Todorov managed to clarify a fundamental truth in storytelling, capturing something readers have always felt. Narratives thrive on the balance between similarity and difference. The collection of translation fables analyzed in this study showcases this balance, displaying a mix of familiar elements and unique characteristics. However, even in these differences, secondary similarities can be discerned by the discerning reader. As Aristotle pointed out long ago in his Poetics, the true art of storytelling, both in its creation and appreciation, lies in recognizing these similarities. It's about drawing parallels and understanding analogies. This act of discerning similarities amidst difference is at the heart of comprehending the translation fable's role in New Testament Gospels. Each narrative uniquely adapts the fable, aiming to create a specific, triumphant impression. Gospel of Mark. To a modern reader, the Gospel of Mark ends quite abruptly, an empty tomb with Jesus' followers, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, who were all present at the crucifixion as mentioned in Mark 15.40, fleeing in fear and astonishment. Scholar William Rade identified this episode in Mark 16.1-8 as part of what he termed the Messianic Secret. This refers to sections in Mark that hint at or explain the delay in making Jesus' divine identity public until after his death. They did not say anything to anyone, for they were afraid. Stands out as an intriguing part of the narrative, emphasizing Jesus' divine and kingly nature. With the image of the empty tomb, Mark's gospel reinforces the Roman centurion's statement upon Jesus' death. Certainly, this man was a God's son. Interestingly, this title, God's Son, is found in an early version of the text, opening line 1-1, creating a full circle to Mark's sudden ending. It seems Mark's intention was to elevate Jesus to a divine status. This recognition of Jesus' divinity, especially with the emphasis on the empty tomb, reveals the significant purpose of the gospel and gives a profound conclusion to the narrative. Mark's portrayal of Jesus' hidden divine nature showcases a blend of different cultural influences, a pivotal moment comes in Mark 9 with the transfiguration episode where Jesus is revealed in his divine glory next to key figures from Jewish history, Moses and Elijah. This 
revelation is shown privately to Peter, James, and John, keeping in line with the messianic secret. Jesus instructs them to keep his true identity a secret until he has risen from the dead. This theme has echoes in Homer's Odyssey, where King Odysseus returns home in disguise. However, Mark delves deeper into the fusion of Greek and Jewish cultures by juxtaposing Jesus with revered Jewish figures and emphasizing his divine status. The term resurrection and the disappearance of Jesus' body in the final scenes accentuates this blend. Recent scholarship, particularly that of Dr. Dennis R. MacDonald, has noted similarities between Matthew's account and the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Some scholars even suggest that there was already a tradition that hinted at Jesus' body disappearing, much like the narrative about Moses in Deuteronomy 34, 1-8. However, Mark's story seems to resonate more with tales of divine figures from Roman legends, especially that of Romulus. The stories of Romulus' disappearing body and the subsequent fear-filled reactions are commemorated in Roman festivals. This connection between Mark's narrative and the Romulus legend is further developed and expanded upon in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke Acts. Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew exhibits distinct structural elements that scholars generally recognize as unique, notwithstanding its shared content with Mark and the hypothesized Q source. Notably, Matthew adds a significant framework that elevates the divine nature of its central figure, possibly influenced by the foundational themes introduced in the Gospel of Mark. The story of Jesus' birth and the narrative of his resurrection in Matthew both underscore the reverence and adoration for a divine ruler, as seen in Matthew 2.2. 2, in the latter, an impressive earthquake serves as a narrative sign indicating the momentous nature of the events in Matthew 28 too. Interestingly, while Mark mentions Salome as a witness to the resurrection, Matthew focuses solely on the two Marys. They witness not only the earth-shaking event, but also the appearance of a powerful angel who moves the massive stone sealing Jesus' tomb. However, tomb is empty. Contrasting with the other texts like the Gospel of Peter, where Christ is shown emerging from the grave, in Matthew, the missing body underlines the idea that only a divine being could have departed in such a manner. This climatic revelation through the angel intensifies the narrative's emphasis, suggesting that the absence of Jesus' body would have profoundly impacted the early Greco-Roman audience. In another section, Matthew draws a parallel between Jesus' resurrection and the journeys of of legendary figures like Odysseus, Heracles, and Aeneas, hinting at a descent into the underworld and return. While this might seem at odds with the theme of divine elevation, both motifs serve to magnify the honor and significance of Jesus in a Hellenistic context. These accounts in the gospel don't necessarily aim to provide a seamless narrative of Jesus' resurrection, but rather to underscore the divine implications of his story using familiar Greco-Roman narrative traditions. The Gospel of Matthew can concludes with a focus on worship in response to the divine revelations, Matthew 28, 9 and 28, 17. This theme reaches its pinnacle in the Great Commission, the final segment of the gospel in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. The idea of a Great Commission isn't unique to Matthew. For instance, in Livy's History of Rome, written roughly a century before the gospel of Matthew, Romulus entrusts a significant message to Julius Proculus, quote, go, announce to the Romans that the heavens decree that Rome be capital of the world. Therefore, let them cultivate the art of war and know and thus teach their children that no human power can resist Roman military might." End quote. The presence of such parallels between the Gospels and earlier Roman narratives, especially starting from Mark and culminating in Luke Acts, suggests that Matthew might be drawing upon and transforming these earlier stories. This interpretation is further buttressed by the final promise of Jesus and Matthew, where only a divine figure could ensure an everlasting unseen presence and support for his followers. Gospel of John In the order of the New Testament Gospels, John's account of the empty tomb and appearances after Jesus' death presents a distinct narrative progression from Mark and Matthew's account. In John, Mary Magdalene arrives alone at the tomb at dawn and finds the stone already rolled away, jumping to the conclusion that someone has taken Jesus' body. It's not until Peter and the beloved disciple arrive that they notice the absent body and and its wrappings. Intriguingly, the narrative suggests that the mere sight of the empty tomb is enough for the beloved disciple
disciple to believe even without prior predictions of such an event. What did he come to believe in that moment? John then introduces a significant variation on Mary Magdalene's encounter with the risen Jesus. The story moves beyond just an empty tomb. It provides clear signs that Jesus has transformed and not just been resuscitated. When Jesus meets Mary outside the tomb, she doesn't recognize him immediately. Only when she does, she instinctively reaches out to touch him, emphasizing the tangible reality of the risen Jesus. The story then makes it undeniably clear that Jesus is not merely back from the dead. He announces his impending ascent to heaven. This is significant because in the cultural understanding of that time, neither ghosts nor resuscitated bodies ascend to a divine realm. The narrative intentionally counters these two possibilities. The gospel then offers another sign of Jesus' transformed state. He appears to his disciples in a locked room. This is soon followed by the well-known scene where the doubting Thomas is invited to touch Jesus' wounds, confirming Jesus' physical reality and identity. This moment has a broader implication. Jesus is addressed with a title that was reserved for the Emperor Domitian, highlighting Jesus' elevated status. What is the Gospel of John trying to achieve? Building on the foundational Gospels of Mark and Matthew, John aims to merge the remembered historical Jesus with the exalted Christ figure as presented in the writings of Paul. John's goal is to convey that Jesus, the man from Palestine, is also the Christ, a divine figure worthy of worship. This portrayal serves to empower early Christians to venerate Jesus, a simple man from Galilee, as a divine figure. John's narrative upholds this dual identity for Jesus, positioning him as both an earthly teacher and a divine savior. However, another early Christian group associated with the Apostle Thomas had a different understanding of Jesus. For them, Jesus was primarily a revealer of spiritual knowledge and was seen as an intangible twin of Thomas. The Gospel of John seems to use Thomas as a representative of this competing viewpoint, subtly reinterpreting his role to fit within John's perspective. Scholars like Riley DeConnick and Pagels have argued that John's narrative addresses various apostolic legacies in relation to the community it represents. John seeks to bring together different traditions under a unified perspective, that of the beloved disciple. In essence, John's gospel attempts to bridge the divide between two primary branches of early Christian thought. On one hand, there's the Gnostic tradition, which emphasizes spiritual knowledge, and on the other, the synoptic tradition which focuses on faith. The distinction between these two, upon closer examination, blurs as they both essentially offer insights into the nature of reality. The story continues with an appearance of Jesus to his disciples while they fish, emphasizing themes of reconciliation, especially regarding Peter. This moment perhaps indicates a broader effort to bring together different Christian groups under a unified understanding. Notably, there are moments in this scene, such as the disciples' inability to immediately recognize Jesus on the shore that further emphasize the transformed nature of the risen Christ. Luke Acts in the narrative of Luke Acts, the account of events following Jesus' death begins by building upon Mark's description found in Mark 16, 1-8, Luke's version 24, 1-11, highlights the presence of multiple women, including Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, Joanna, and others, who visited Jesus' tomb at dawn. Just like in Mark and John's accounts, they found the stone already rolled away. As they look inside, Jesus' body was nowhere to be found. But unlike in Mark, these women, after conversing with angels, conveyed the astounding news to the male disciples, only to be met with skepticism. Going beyond the stories provided by the early three Gospels, Luke Acts introduces distinct elements reminiscent of familiar classical stories about figures translated or transformed between the realms of the mortal and divine. Such tales often involve encounters on roads and ascensions to the heavens. For instance, the story of Paul's transformative experience on the Damascus Road, Acts 9, 1-9, Acts 22, 6-11, Acts 26, 9-20 mirrors earlier tales like that of Romulus. The Emmaus Road account, Luke 24, 13 through 35, too recalls older narratives, specifically the legend documented by Herodotus about the transformed Aristius meeting someone on the road to Sisychus. In the Emmaus story, Jesus' transformed appearance makes him unrecognizable to his followers. Only after breaking bread with them, 
does he reveal himself and then suddenly disappears, underscoring his divine transformative power. If you're interested in also seeing the clear mythic romance tell of a god disguised or hiding their identity and people entertaining them, Bruce Loudon discusses this in his writings as well with this Luke story on the road to Emmaus. When the two witnesses of the Emmaus encounter, Cleopas and his fellow traveler, hurriedly report back to the disciples in Jerusalem, the narrative draws parallels to the story of Doubting Thomas from the Gospel of John. But here, Thomas doesn't take center stage. Instead, Luke emphasizes Jesus' divine capacities post-death. He's not just a ghostly apparition. He possesses a body capable of changing forms and even eating food, as evidenced by him consuming broiled fish, Luke 24, 36-43. This portrayal aims to address potential interpretations of Jesus' post-death form, negating the notions that he might have been just revived or a mere ghost. Instead, the accountant Luke Acts elevates Jesus to the status of a divine figure, likened to those revered in ancient classical traditions. The Luke Acts narrative, while consistent with the previous Gospels, also enriches them by casting them in the light of divine translation narratives, a prevalent theme in ancient literature. Coming to a close, while it's debatable whether the historical figure, Jesus of Nazareth, ever desired personal distinction similar to imperial exaltation, his legacy marked the symbol of a powerful, countercultural movement in the first two centuries CE. His symbolic representations in the New Testament Gospels challenged the prevailing institutions of the time, both Jewish and Roman. This challenge was articulated through reinterpreted imitation, metaphor, and a blend of different cultural identities. This offered a fresh yet understandable model for the structure of ancient society. Lucian's work on the death of Peregrinus, circa 170 CE, provides an insightful view into the political motivations of early Christians. Lucian humorously describes the public suicide of Peregrinus Proteus, a renowned Christian philosopher who later became a cynic during the Olympic Games in 165 CE. To demonstrate his commitment to his philosophical ideals, and in a manner reminiscent of the death of Heracles and ancient Indian Brahmanic traditions, Proteus set himself ablaze, captivating a large audience, famous for his critiques against the empire and his influential role in the emerging Christian movement. Early Christians highly esteemed Proteus, even referring to him as the new Socrates. However, he later embraced cynicism, settled in Athens, and despite Lucian's evident scorn, was revered as a wise philosopher and critic of Rome. Aelus Segelus, having met Proteus in Athens, lauded him as a wise and resilient man. After Proteus' death, a disciple claimed to have seen him, dressed in white, walking in the portico of the Seven Voices during the Olympic Festival. The political implications of such a narrative had likely faded, leaving only the note that Proteus was not aligned with the political mainstream. Similar to the stories about Jesus in the Gospels, the tale of Proteus highlights the tradition's emphasis on honor and opposition to Roman power. Even if the stories about Jesus' appearance after death were influenced by legends like that of Romulus, the account of Proteus provides a glimpse of a comparable event, albeit influenced by the cultural shifts and philosophical debates of the second century Athens. Lucian's skeptical perspective on both Proteus and Christianity's crucified founder reveals several underlying themes and norms of the gospel stories when viewed within the wider Hellenistic cultural and ideological landscape aligning with the insights of this study. Apostle Paul's teachings, which significantly influenced the Gospels' composition, placed Jesus' appearances after his death within a politically charged and honor-focused context in his first letter to the Corinthians. For Paul, the testimonies of those who claim to have seen Jesus alive again served as a declaration of Jesus' predestined role as the ultimate king. In essence, Paul anticipated the overthrow of all existing governments, 1 Corinthians 15, 24-25. Just as Romulus was credited with founding the mightiest empire in history, Jesus would establish God's reign on earth by framing this revolutionary anti-imperial message within religious and supernatural narratives. Early Christians crafted a clever strategy to challenge the prevailing societal structures. How could someone be prosecuted for claiming a divine revelation, like Paul's own encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road? Roman law typically excluded religious and supernatural from charges of undermining 
the Roman state. Many early Jewish writers leveraged this loophole to produce anti-imperial works in the form of cryptic apocalyptic writings. Such blending of supernatural storytelling and political critique is evident in Christian scriptures like the Book of Revelation and the Gospels Transfiguration account. I can hear several Christian apologists, maybe even some scholars, who are so used to the same old argumentation of taking 1 Corinthians 15 as literal eyewitness reportage of a resurrected Jesus. While we cannot read Paul's mind or pin down whether these Christ followers in a cultic setting were actually in some superstitious way experiencing something that they attributed to the risen Christ, we will never know. However, we can know that the practice of inventing eyewitness claims around a mortal man becoming a god through translation was absolutely a given fact. We saw this with the Caesars and the endless examples in the Greek and Roman world with translation fables. Another way to phrase this, the Christian cult from the outset in Paul's letters had a deified man named Jesus using political language like the Caesars. They check off the boxes of translation in the earliest letters of the Apostle Paul. Eyewitness claims by those trying to convince you of their figure is a well-known trope of translation tales. In fact, it would have been shocking if eyewitness traditions were not part of this movement. We see this eyewitness theme take on extreme exaggeration in the Gospels and Acts with the Twelve as well as Paul. The same group of guys mentioned in the in letters of Paul. This is not a coincidence. As Paula Fredrickson in her work, Paul the Pagan apostle shows Paul's audience in all of his letters were Gentiles. These non-Jews from various locations in the Roman Empire knew full well these translation tells from old. They would have had less knowledge of the Jewish mythos as Christopher D. Stanley has also written extensively about. If Paul's gospel was going to work with the Gentiles, he needed it to speak to them in a way that they understood. This would have been in translation fable language. Understanding the post-death veneration of saints in ancient times as Christian adaptations of age-old traditions surrounding revered figures or demigods reinforces the thesis that early Christians adopted familiar translation tells to narrate Jesus' post-death appearances. Prominent early Christian writers like Justin Martyr, Origen, and Tertullian openly categorized the resurrection accounts of Jesus as part of the broader translation tale genre. Interestingly, no attempt seems to have been made to argue against this classification. The narrative elements and symbols used in these accounts would have been clearly recognizable to readers familiar with the cultural and linguistic norms of the Hellenistic Levant in the first and second centuries. Thus, both the writers and readers shared a common cultural and linguistic framework. The recurring motif of translation tells in various classical Mediterranean cultures underscores the ad adaptability of this narrative structure. Even specific elements in the gospel accounts, such as death, burial, and eulogy, have parallels in the translation tell tradition. When we juxtapose the abundant signals of the translation tell in classical literature with the absence of such signals in early Jewish resurrection tales, it becomes clear that the gospels use the term resurrection largely in name only. The underlying structure and narrative of these accounts were firmly rooted in the translation tradition. The understanding of the raised Christ held significant differences for the earliest Christians, particularly those who regarded the four Gospels as sacred compared to the interpretations of modern scholars. Their commitment to the foundational figure of their faith demanded enhancing his portrayal, drawing from familiar Hellenistic and Roman cultural methods known in English as social and literary exaltation. The groundbreaking nature of the Gospels accounts after Christ's death wasn't solely in the use of well-known translation fable narrative, but rather in the audacity of applying such a glorified narrative to a marginalized Jewish figure, one seen as a poor cynic philosopher and relatively unnoticed in the broader classical world. The unwavering devotion and enthusiasm of early Christians were not directed to the man as he lived, but rather to the symbolic figure he came to represent in literature, a beacon of a fresh perspective and a new metaphor of classical harmony. This devotion elevated this representation of an alternative belief, observing the traditions of the ancient Hellenistic Roman society. New Testament studies have often overlooked the expansive context of ancient Greek and Latin traditions. They have mostly confined their scope to the immediate surroundings of early Christian and Jewish writings, instead of exploring the broader ocean of Hellenistic and Roman literature 
literature from which many of the New Testament's linguistic and cultural references originate. To describe this situation using a metaphor, it's akin to focusing only on a small tide pool, neglecting the vast sea nearby. Early Christianity didn't emerge in isolation. It was intertwined with the prevailing cultural centers of the ancient Mediterranean world, challenging and often overturning their established norms. The survival of the four gospels stands testament to this intricate interplay, largely due to their impact. Even the Jewish roots of these traditions, once integrated into the gospels, took on a distinctively early Christian flavor and resonated within these bustling urban centers. When the gospels adopted the conventional early Jewish concept of resurrection, they transformed it in a way that encapsulated the merging of Greek and Roman cultural elements. Implications In the process of understanding the intricate balance of opposites, we find the essence of a speculative thinking. As Hegel stated in 1812, in the grasping of opposites into a unity or of the positive into a negative, does the speculative exist? This work presents a fresh perspective on what has long been seen as a cornerstone narrative of Western culture, that the stories of Jesus' resurrection in the New Testament were perceived by early readers as credible historical events. Instead, our research underscores the extensive use of a cultural convention prevalent in ancient tales known as divine translation. This motif adorned the end-of-life stories of many renowned figures from classical times. Our study has meticulously examined this storytelling device in Hellenistic and Roman literature, revealing its remarkable influence on the New Testament's accounts of Jesus' post-death events. Rather than asserting these narratives' historical accuracy, early Christian writings simply embraced the prevailing tradition. For instance, Justin Martyr in his One Apology from around 150 CE openly admitted that these gospel stories were just another iteration of an ancient mythological theme, emphasizing that the gospels presented nothing new in their resurrection narratives. To fully grasp the implications, we've employed a comprehensive analytical approach rooted in linguistic and semiotic theory. The typical signs of this divine translation in ancient Greek and Latin stories included transformation, disappearance, name-based explanations for phenomena, becoming a celestial body, speeches after death, ascension, appearances post-death, and various other symbolic elements. What did it mean for ancient societies to elevate someone to a divine status through such tales? Analyzing from a cultural and literary perspective, this pattern adds significant weight to numerous ancient Mediterranean stories. The real surprise in the Gospels is not the use of this prevalent motif, but its application to Jesus, a humble Jewish figure relatively unknown in classical history. Our investigation highlights the Gospels' clear and repeated emphasis on this conventional theme, ensuring readers grasp its significance. This book represents a groundbreaking argument that early Christians understood the resurrection stories not as unique historical events, but as part of a broader fictional framework. Contemporary interpretations often either staunchly defend these stories as factual miraculous events or dismiss them as mere tales catering to gullible followers. Most works discussing Jesus' resurrection accounts stem from two diametrically opposed perspectives perspectives, those based on religious faith and those rooted in atheism. Nicholas Wright's The Resurrection of the Son of God, 2003, and Robert Price's Jesus is Dead, 2007, serve as examples of these polar viewpoints. This work, however, steers clear of such biases, relying solely on the rigorous methodologies of the humanities, keeping any contemporary implications as secondary considerations. Using the lens of dialectical reasoning, these two contrasting perspectives can be termed as the thesis and the antithesis. By debunking both extremes that Jesus' resurrection was neither a factual occurrence nor a deceptive narrative, this study introduces a balanced synthesis. Early Christians honored their leaders by employing the literary conventions of their era, specifically the fictional narrative of divine translation. Embracing this viewpoint can bridge the long-standing divide between these two adversarial groups, offering profound insights for contemporary discourse. Religious Implications
The pursuit of truth demands both courage and discipline. It's not for those who jump to conclusions without a firm basis. Since the Enlightenment, there's been a trend where religious belief sometimes shelters irrational thought. For certain Christian readers who value truth above all, this book's conclusions might be quite startling. Indeed, it's hard to overemphasize the profound religious implications of these findings. For anyone deeply committed to the Christian tradition, an honest assessment of this book necessitates a steadfast commitment to uncovering the truth, no matter where it leads. For some Christians, where faith implies accepting specific beliefs even in the absence of or against available evidence, this book might seem threatening, like a challenge to their deepest held convictions. But this book, by Dr. Miller, isn't primarily for them. For other Christians, particularly those with more liberal views, the insights here might not be as unsettling. These individuals, similar to followers of various global religions, often appreciate and recognize the mythological aspects within their holy scriptures. Up to this point, this work has an aim to promote or dismiss any particular belief. In fact, a thorough examination of sacred texts requires setting aside personal beliefs or considerations, addressing them only after thorough analysis. So as we approach the end, a question emerges. If early Christians didn't view the resurrection stories as historical truth, but as sacred allegory, why should modern Christians believe otherwise? Does this mean Christians should abandon their faith based on this book's conclusions? If these findings show that core Christian beliefs, especially the historical historical accuracy of Jesus' resurrection don't hold up under rigorous scrutiny, should believers simply dismiss them? Or can there be another way to appreciate these teachings free from superstition and more in line with humanity's shared experiences? Myth, philosophy, and ritual. In the context of early Christianity, what role did this sacred allegory play? Contrary to many current theological interpretations, the gospel narratives were not just about historical events, but aimed to elevate the teachings, the philosophy represented by Jesus. Given this perspective, can the core philosophies of Christianity still hold their ground in today's diverse ideological landscape? And how might such a human-centered Christianity contribute to a world grappling with unique challenges and striving toward greater harmony? Humanistic Implications in the Western world, many foundational ideas of the Christian faith trace back far beyond the Enlightenment's rationalism and the Renaissance's humanism, reaching into the Dark Ages. Some argue that these ancient myths and their profound influence on Western culture might have played a role in a nearly thousand years of intellectual stagnation. At a glance, this book might seem like an effort to uproot such age-old beliefs from the bedrock of human civilization. However, it's essential to recognize that the stories of the New Testament Gospels are tales of humanity at large, not just the sacred scriptures of one religious tradition. As highlighted in Augustine's 5th century work, The City of God Against the Pagans, Jesus' concept of the kingdom of God has deeply influenced the West, framing its core values and ideals. The monotheistic God representing a higher societal consciousness helped harness our baser instincts, drawing a distinction in Western thought between higher and lower human nature. Despite the challenges and missteps in the West's journey toward civilization, one can't deny Christianity's role in transmitting some of the noblest human virtues. An essential observation from this book that merits focus in the perspective on the early Christian proclamation of Jesus Christ's resurrection. This book posits that it wasn't a deliberate deception nor mass hysteria. Recognizing this, doesn't it mitigate some of the reservations humanistic rationalists might have toward Christianity? From this new vantage point, perhaps the religion itself can be approached with a fresh humanistic curiosity, studying it scientifically to better understand humanity's journey through history. Truly understanding humanity means studying studying what we've deemed sacred, echoing the words of Descartes, a cornerstone of Western philosophy, the essence of our intellectual heritage is the question, not to disdain, but to deepen our grasp of the human experience. Quote, I did nothing but travel about the world, endeavoring to be a spectacle rather than an actor in all of the dramas that are played out, and particularly contemplating each matter concerning what might render it suspect or give cause for misunderstanding. I proceeded to eradicate from my mind all of the errors that had previously infiltrated into my thought. In doing this, I did not imitate the skeptics who doubt only for doubting's sake and pretend always to be undecided. On the contrary, my whole intention was to arrive at a certainty and to dig away the earth and sand until I reached the rock or clay beneath." End quote. The Verdict on Jesus I want to show you a few graphs 
that I have put together based on the work of Dr. Richard C. Miller. And I asked Dr. Miller at the end of the day, have you ever thought about it just to help our audience understand putting a graph or an image of the things Jesus checks off on the sub themes? But what if we could take you through it and show you exactly how that fits and why this is important? So you can see the graph here, sub theme, description, source references. These are all related to Jesus. And if you look on the left of the sub themes, there's a counted number. 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15. Let's go through them. Heinous or an ignoble injustice rectified. The description, we all know the story of the kangaroo trial, whippings, beatings, and execution were depicted as a gross miscarriage of justice with Jesus. You can see the reference there in Luke 22, but you can also just see how often this guy was innocent. He didn't do anything wrong, and yet he gets punished. Injustice. Number two, metamorphosis. The description, post-resurrection, Jesus appears in different forms. That means he had to transform. Not initially recognizable to his followers and prefigured in the transfiguration. So many scholars talk about a metamorphosis taking place with Jesus, how the transfiguration is a prefiguring of the transformation that is going to happen of Jesus, but also they're walking and talking with him after he's resurrected and they don't even recognize the guy. The sources are Luke 24, John 21, and various accounts of the empty tomb. Number three, vanished missing body. The description, tomb where Jesus was laid is found empty. Very important in all the Gospels. And how each of them portrays this scenario is interesting. Mark 16 and subsequent Gospels as source references. Number five, but technically number four, um, I'm just going based on the sub-theme count, catasterism. That idea is that someone who becomes divine ends up becoming a celestial body. And in Jesus' case, we find strange but interesting passages in the New Testament. Jesus is a associated with the morning star, a celestial motif. 2 Peter 1.19 and Revelation 22.16, we know about the morning star, or we've even heard this used in the Hebrew scriptures, but specifically its context on becoming a celestial body is also seen in things like Ovid's Fasti, when he talks about the birth of Orion by Hyrius, that whole story. Six, post-translation speech. Description, Jesus speaks to his followers after his resurrection. Sources, John 20, Luke 24, Matthew 28, Acts 9. Number seven, ascension. Jesus is taken up into heaven in the presence of his disciples. Post-mortem translation, the core narrative of the Gospels, where Jesus is transformed and resurrected after death, John 20, 17, and all the Gospels. Post-translation appearance, Jesus appears to his followers after his resurrection and ascension. Gospel epilogues, Acts 1, Acts 9, Damascus Road, Revelation. Translation associated with a mountain. Key events associated with Jesus' translation occur on or around mountains. Number 13, odious or dubious alternate accounts. Alternate explanations for Jesus' resurrection, such as his body being stolen, are presented in Matthew 28, 12 through 15. Taken up by the winds or clouds, number 14, Acts 1, 9, and by association, the transfigure episode in the synoptics. You know, he says, I'll come back in the same manner that you see me go, the angels say. What are you looking at? Well, Jesus is going off into heaven, the clouds taking him off. That also happens with Romulus, which we're going to see in a minute. And then number 15 is feigned translation. And the alternate or an alternative account that broadly circulated Justin's letter to Trypho. Among Jews and Romans, their reception of the resurrection claim arguably demonstrates that Jesus' disciples deliberately sought to align the Jesus narrative with translation so as to install their master within the translation fable rubric. Now let's look at the next graph. This is a, a graph about Jesus, translation sub-themes, and you'll notice all the green check marks except three on the right. The only three out of the 15 sub-themes that he didn't get that we didn't put was eponymous etiology, translation associated with Zeus's thunderbolt, 
The next graph I want to look at, you'll notice there's less green check marks on the right. That's Romulus. He has eight green check marks. Jesus had 12 out of the translation fable stuff. In fact, let's just skip ahead. You'll see Jesus and Romulus on the graph and compared side by side in terms of the green check marks. And one thing that in Dr. Miller's book he does that I didn't do on purpose, and I wanted you to take the moment to look at the sources with me comparing Romulus and Jesus, is this next graph. This one you'll notice has mimetic signal, Jesus sources, Romulus sources, and then notes about that particular example that Dr. Miller has in his book. Right here you have the missing body, right? Sources, sources, in both of them you could see where the sources are so you can go check and see if there's missing bodies in case you wonder, I can't take their word for it, good for you. Check it out. Both figures have accounts of their bodies being missing post-death. Prodigies. Well, we have that with Jesus. Darkness over the land. Jesus sources. Romulus sources. Mountaintop speech, great commission. Jesus, Romulus, both have significant speeches on a mountain. Ascension. Jesus, obviously we know about his ascension. Romulus has an ascension. What I find ironic as we're getting this far into this is how many people in the world probably aren't even practicing Christians, but call themselves Christians or go to church occasionally, but never really read their New Testament. They all know this about Jesus. They had no clue that these things were said about Romulus. And guess what? These things were said about Romulus before the gospels were written, before Jesus shows up on the scene. And this is important to understand for those who want to act like, well, the story of Romulus copied Jesus. That's absurd and factually wrong. It is an error. So you see the notes here, ascend to heavens in the presence of others. Son of a God. Both are sons of a God. Meeting on the road. Well, you got Jesus sources. And this is after, of course, they are supposedly no longer here on earth, right? They're meeting on a road. Same with the sources for Romulus. Post-death appearances on a road or journey. Eyewitness testimony. Both of them have eyewitness testimony, witnesses to the events surrounding their deaths and post-death appearances. Taken away in a cloud. Acts 1-9. Of course, we know with Jesus. Everyone knows that one. Did you know that this is also what it says of Romulus? Check that out. Both are described as being taken away in a cloud. Dubious alternative accounts. Both here, we kind of covered some of this in the previous charts, but I want you to see what Richard Miller put together. Alternative stories or explanations about their disappearances. Immortal heavenly body. Jesus has an immortal heavenly body. Romulus has an immortal heavenly body. Both acquire a different form of existence post-death. Outside the city. Both Jesus has an outside the city. Romulus, significant events occur outside the city boundary. The people flee. In both cases, the people flee or scatter in those narratives. Deification, Jesus and Romulus, both are deified or recognized as divine post-death. Belief, homage, and, and rejoicing. Followers believe, pay homage, and rejoice after post-death appearances. Bright and shining appearance. Descriptions of a bright or shining appearance associated with their presence in both accounts. You'll see there's various sources for the Romulus thing. This is a well-known thing in Rome that Romulus' story was traveling in various sources. Frightened. We know very well that Jesus and those scenarios are frightened. Witnesses to the post-death appearances are initially frightened. All in sorrow over loss. Followers mourn the loss of the figure. And lastly, inspired message of apotheosis. An inspired message or revelation confirms the divine status or apotheosis of the figure. I think it's important. And think about this for one moment. You have guys like Josephus, a religious devout Jew. Yes, he's Hellenistic. He's Hellenized. He's, he is obviously writing for both Jewish people as well as the Romans. And he's right there with Vespasian. However, the central figure to Ju Judaism at that time in his version of Judaism, because there's another Enochian version we could argue about that was written and found in Dead Sea Scroll material is Moses. And if if this central figure Moses, we can go in our Bibles today, clearly see that he dies, God takes care of his body and buries him. There's even an account in the New Testament implied, I think it's in Jude, but like Satan's wrestling over the body of, of Moses and all that really weird stuff. But if this central figure and Hellenism is so impactful that 
Judaism or someone like Josephus is willing to say, actually, Moses had an apotheosis, an ascension, a translation where he is metamorphosized. He has become a, a deified or at least a lower deity kind of figure in the heavens. That's very important to think about. I really hope people will consider this whole idea. That whole idea that he's able to change the central figure to your religion and give him an ascension because, like, literally, Josephus is competing with the Greek, Roman world and other figures on trying to say Judaism's ancient, Judaism is, is the one, you know, religion that really you, you need to respect our religion and our figures are good guys there's competition going on between both camps greek ideas roman ideas the philosophies are competing there was a huge debate over did moses learn from plato or did plato learn from moses because there's a lot in common between these figures and their teachings and what's in their laws and here's josephus willing to bend the narrative we find in our bible of the most central religious figure of his judaism and make him match that translation trope and so does people like Philo of Alexandria. And these guys are sandwiched surrounding, they're the bread buns surrounding Paul and a lot of the New Testament material. Why are we not looking at what Dr. Richard C. Miller is saying here? Jesus checks off more fictional translation fable tropes than any of these, what we and anyone, even the Christians who are diehard fundamentalists would say, yeah, I think that Romulus, I think that Heracles, I think that Asclepius, all these guys are mythical, or I probably don't believe they existed or something like that. And they're really quick to go, yeah, we don't believe those accounts. I know. And this, the New Testament is loaded with all of these linguistic, as uh, Dr. Miller would say, symbiotic linguistic signals that show you you're dealing with fiction you you get to the new testament and go but, 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 but no buts no buts we're dealing with symbolism we're dealing with allegory we're dealing with messages in the metaphor as john dominic crossan once said we're finally dumb enough to think this stuff was literal but they didn't write this stuff to mean it was literal this stuff had symbolic cultic practice Meaning, it did not have this literal historical historiography. This is what actually happened. No. That's what I think is so amazing about Dr. Miller's work. And I hope you enjoyed this documentary. I hope you'll take the time to get a copy of his book if you can afford it. If you can't afford it, here is the best I've seen done about his book in documentary form. You can go and leave a review. Let him know in the review section. Um on Amazon about his book and how amazing it was. I hope you drop a comment because he will be looking at the comments here on this channel for this documentary. Let us know your favorite part of the documentary. What shocked you or what, what was impressive? What helped you maybe see what Dr. Miller's saying that you had never thought about before or never knew? I mean, I love so much of the stuff he brings up in this book. You know, here is Julius Caesar assassinated, completely embarrassed, if you want to put it, in his death. I mean, treated like crap at the end, gets killed, and still in the most shameful end, he's deified to become a god. So saying that, why would they deify this guy who died on a cross? You're missing the point. Many martyrs in the Greek, Roman, and Jewish world were already preceding Jesus, and they were... They were seen in a glorious way. They had an honorable death. They died no nobly. So there's that idea. There's Kalihari or Kalerho, however you want to pronounce it, the novel that talks about the missing body from his lover who's missing from the tomb. And, oh, my gosh, the gods must have took her. She must have had some god who was jealous and wanted her. Uh, you know, he freaks out. There's so many details that really nail down this whole thing. Ten dying and rising gods, including Jesus. We're going to make Jesus number one, because my whole purpose in this video is to show you 
Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, ascension is not an uncommon thing in the ancient world when gods or divine figures who are being worshipped are in the scene. The zeitgeist of the era was full of superstitions and mythologies that were developing. People believed in these things all the time. I'm going to be reading from Dr. Richard Carrier's article, and I hope you will go and read it yourself and follow up with his hyperlinks to see the source material for yourself. All of this literature is amazing, so I will be skimming through his article as I read it because it's so long, but it's full of great stuff. The name of his article is Dying and Rising Gods. It's pagan guys, get over it. Number one is Jesus, born of a virgin, does miracles, lives his life, dies, crucified, buried in a tomb after three days and three nights, just as Jonah, and he's spit up. And of course, in this particular one, he resurrects and ascends on high. Number two, Osiris. A lot can be said about Osiris, so let me read some and then leave the rest for you to read yourself. Not only does Plutarch say Osiris returned to life and was resurrected, exact terms for resurrection on Isis and Osiris, 35, see his discussion on the empty tomb, and also describe as physically returning to Earth after his death. But the physical resurrection of Osiris's corpse is explicitly described in pre-Christian pyramid inscriptions. Osiris was also resurrected, according to Plutarch, on the third day and died during a full moon, just like Christ. Passover occurs during the full moon. And in Plutarch, on Isis and Osiris, 39 and 42, Osiris dies on the 17th of Athar, the concluding day of the full moon, and is raised on the 19th, two days later, thus three days inclusively, just like Jesus. Jesus dies on a full moon, Ice, Osiris dies on a full moon, and when you look carefully at this on Isis and Osiris, chapter 42, it talks about the 17th day, and Pythagoreans have this weird number of 17, and they have a certain uh, superstition about the number. I want to tell you something interesting about this in the Gospels. The number 17 is a perfect triangular number. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 plus 11 plus 12 plus 13 plus 14 plus 15 plus 16 plus 17 equals 153. When Jesus says to cast the net on the other side and they catch all these fish in the net, they capture 153 fish. This story also looks like Pythagoras' story. This are my notes. Plutarch writes that Osiris came to Horus from the other world and exercised and trained him for battle and taught him lessons. And then Osiris consorted with Isis after his death and she became the mother of Hippocrates. It's hard to get more explicit than that. Contrary to Airman, Dr. Carrier and Airman are going back and forth because Airman doesn't believe Osiris came back in the flesh. He spends the entire next paragraph describing, for example, I have come to thee that I may revivify thee that I may reassemble for thee thy bones, that I may collect for thee thy flesh, that I may assemble for, th for thee thy dismembered limbs. Raise thyself up, King Osiris. Thou livest, pyramid text. Raise thyself up, shake off thy dust, remove that dirt which is on thy face, loose thy bandages. It's clearly a resurrection on earth in the same body, this idea that we see that also is very similar to Jesus. And you have to, you really, common sense begs you to have to ask yourself, where did these ideas come from? They, they did not come in a vacuum bubble of Christianity. This stuff's been old. Ideas just floating around in the ancient world. Number three, Dionysus. Before I even read anything that he has to say, I highly recommend reading Dennis McDonald's work on Dionysus and the fourth gospel, the Dionysian gospel is the name of the book, and his work on Greek literature and its influence in the New Testament. Dionysus, also popularly known as Bacchus, had many different tales told of him, just as Osiris did. But in one popularly known, he was killed by his being torn apart as a baby 
This is written in Justin Martyr Apology, Plutarch on Isis and Osiris, Diodorus, Library of History. He was then resurrected by a human woman, Semele, conceiving a new body for him in her womb after drinking a magic slushy made from bits of his corpse. This is a literal resurrection again, just by an elaborate mechanism. The god definitely dies and then returns to life by acquiring the same kind of body he once had, assembled and regrown from parts of his old one. In this version of this myth, he is a full god, son of Zeus and personify, but still mortal, capable of being killed by dismemberment like a vampire. He then is reborn a demigod from the womb of a fully mortal human woman. He was the savior god central to the Bacchic mysteries, one of the most widely known and celebrated in the Western world at the time. Those baptized into his cult received eternal life in paradise, and just like Christians, 1 Corinthians 15, Dionysians could even baptize themselves on behalf of the deceased loved ones and thus rescue those already dead. Number four, Zalmoxis. Zalmoxis was also a resurrected savior. Greeks making fun of the Thracian cult, worshiping him, made up the polemic that he didn't really die. He just hid in a cave and thus pretended to have resurrected from the dead. But this polemic tells us the Thracians did believe Zalmoxis had died and rose from the dead and appeared to disciples on earth to prove it. His disciples then believed they would benefit from his power to bring them into eternal life in paradise. In a book that became standard reading in the schools, Herodotus, which you really need to get a copy of, talks about reports that Salmoxus fed the leaders among his countrymen in a hall and taught them that neither he nor his guest nor any of their descendants would ever die, but that they would go to a place where they would live forever and have all good things and then vanished underground for three years while the Thracians wished him back and mourned him for dead. And then in the fourth year, he appeared to the Thracians, and thus they came to believe what he had told them, thus using his own resurrection to prove theirs. Though I do wonder if it was actually three days, Carrier says, and not years, as that was the case in the resurrection cults of Osiris, Inanna, and Adonis, as we'll see shortly. The story entails these cultists believed in their savior gods a bodily death and resurrection, because that's the only way the Greek polemic Herodotus is citing would make sense, as it imagines Salmoxus appearing in some same body and visiting his followers to verify he was alive again, and not merely appearing in visions, nor as a ghost. Accordingly, Celsus, the earliest known critic of Christianity, included Salmoxus in his list of resurrected deities. Read Origin Against Celsus. Number five, Inanna. Inanna is the earliest known resurrected god. For her, a clear-cut death and resurrection tale exists on clay tablets inscribed in Sumeria over a thousand years before Christianity, plainly describing her humiliation, trial, execution, and crucifixion, and her resurrection three days later. After she is stripped naked and judgment is pronounced against her, Inanna is turned into a corpse and the corpse was hung from a nail. And after three days and three nights, her assistants ask for her corpse and resurrect her by feeding her the water and food of life. And Inanna arose according to what had been her plan all along because she knew her father would surely bring me back to life. These are her words. And the story quotations are from the tablet adopting the translation of Samuel Noah Kramer in history begins at Sumer. This cult continued to be practiced into the Christian period, Tyre being a major center of her worship. By then, there's some evidence her resurrection tale was shifted to her consort Tammuz, one of the several resurrected deities the Greeks called Adonis. Number six. Adonis. 
Adonis was the title of at least one, if not several, resurrected saviors by the time Christianity began, sometimes equated with Tammuz, or possibly one confused with Tammuz, but either way, certainly a resurrected god. Medinger details this in a study of the riddle of resurrection, dying and rising gods in the ancient Near East includes discussion of the pre-Christian manuscript of a private letter in which a man likens his ability to survive several deadly uprisings to Tammuz's ability to always return from the dead, which would certainly suggest Tammuz had by then become the center of his own resurrection cult. This is the same God for whose death even women in Jerusalem mourned, Ezekiel 8. 14 through 15. There's no evidence he remained dead. That letter alone attests it was commonly known he returned to life. And in the third century AD, the Christian scholar Origen says in his comments on Ezekiel, explaining the very same passage, that Tammuz was still worshipped in his own day under the title of Adonis. And as such, certain rites of initiation are conducted for him. First, that they weep for him since he had died. Second, that they rejoice for him because he has risen from the dead. This is confirmed a century later by Jerome's commentary on Ezekiel. Recent pre-Christian finds attest that indeed a period of rejoicing followed mourning the death of Tammuz, which matches Origen's description. We similarly have it described by a pagan author, either Lucian or someone else of the second century AD, who describes national ceremonies of mourning for Adonis's death that are followed the next day by celebrations of his returning to life and ascending into outer space killed by a beast he becomes a dead person then he is buried and mourned and the next day they proclaim he lives and he ascends number seven romulus Romulus was another widely known pre-Christian resurrected god, not a personal savior, so far as we know, but a national one, in his exalted form named Quirinius. According to ancient sources, this demigod was a pre-existent divine being who became incarnate to, in order to establish a kingdom, conceiving a body for himself within the womb of a virgin, possibly by sexual means, it's unclear, who was murdered by the Roman Senate, which is the Roman equivalent of the Sanhedrin after which his corpse vanishes, the sun goes out, and people flee in fear and mourn his death. Then he returns to earth alive again, resurrected in a new divine body, to preach his gospel to the disciples, Proculus, before departing to rule from on high. By some accounts, Romulus ascended directly to heaven, and his mortal body burned away in the sky, but either way, his mortal body dies. I have finished my mortal life, he tells Proculus, Dionysus says, and he returns to preach in an immortal body, then ascends heaven just like Jesus, 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 50. Our fullest account comes from Plutarch, Life of Romulus, 27 to 28, writing at the end of the first century AD, but Romulus's death and return to life are attested in numerous pre-Christian sources. Number eight, Asclepius. Asclepius was also a popular resurrected god. Christian apologists want to try and deny this by saying Asclepius merely, like Caesar, rose to heaven like a ghost upon his death. But that isn't what the ancient worshippers said. Celsus reported that a great many Greek and barbarians claim they have frequently seen and still see no mere phantom but Asclepius himself. Origin against Celsus 3:24. Asclepius was killed by a lightning strike and buried. Hesiod fragments 125. Euripides, Cicero on the nature of the gods. Origin against Celsus 3:23. He was then restored from death to becoming a living god. As Ovid says, by a god he was turned into a bloodless corpse, and then from a corpse became a god, twice renewing his fate. That this was regarded a resurrection is fully confirmed by the narrative. Zeus killed Asclepius for resurrecting the dead. But when the slain's father, Apollo, complained, Zeus relented and restored Asclepius back to life. This time, as an immortal god, Ovid thus remarks that Zeus did for his son's sake that which he forbade be done. 
In other words, Zeus forbade raising the dead, but made an exception for Asclepius. It is thus understood that Zeus rose Asclepius from the dead. He had been a corpse, so he would have remained, but by the miracle of God, now was alive, eternal and immortal, supernaturally powerful, just like Jesus. Number 9. Baal Baal was one of the most ancient of resurrected gods. His death is probably the same mourned under the name Hadad Rimon in Zechariah 12.11. But whether or not in pre-Christian text, Baal's corpse is found by a knot. So in his myth, the god is definitely dead. One text even outright says, and the gods will know that you are dead. And multiple gods actually declare him dead. He is then buried and funeral rites performed. Read Metager Riddle. There are then clear references to Baal's resurrection. In fact, his returning to life and then living forever are used as analogies in pre-Christian immortality spells. Though this god was then not yet a personal savior, but a metaphor for communal agricultural salvation, that was prior to Hellenization. He was transformed into one of the many personal savior gods of the region we hear of at the dawn of Christianity, but are allowed to know nothing about owing to the medieval Christian destruction of pagan evidence. For example, Hippolytus devoted two entire chapters of his refutation of all heresies to the mystery cults and their savior deities. Curiously, those are the only two books wholly destroyed. Go figure. What were the medievals trying to hide? What did they not want us to read? I'll let your imagination ponder. Number 10, Hercules. Hercules, or also known as Melkart, is another of the most ancient of resurrected deities akin to Baal in both his origins and possible future co-option in later Hellenistic mystery cults. His legend became fused with that of Hercules centuries before Christianity and attested by authors of the Roman period. Another person wrote that Hercules was killed by Typhon, but Laulus brought a quell to him, and having put it close to him and ritually burning it, he smelt it and came to life again. And Josephus attests to ongoing celebrations of resurrecting Hercules in Jewish antiquities, mistranslated in Winston, see Medinger. In both accounts, this is explicitly said to be the story of the Tyrian Hercules, which we know meant Melkart, whose base of worship was Tyr. Diodorus tells another story of Hercules killed by a fire, dying of poison. He's burned on a pyre because his bones then vanished when Lalus tried to collect them. The story goes, it was concluded Hercules was resurrected and ascended to heaven. The supposition of resurrection upon the vanishing of a corpse was not only a common motif in antiquity, it is essentially the story told of Jesus. You could take a deep dive into that. The addition of appearance narratives to still the deal also accompanies many of these tales, Romulus, for example, and there may have been such for Hercules, but in any event, it was clearly believed he had died and been raised from the dead and then ascended to heaven with divine power, just like Jesus. Across the globe, 2.3 billion Christians celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25th. Inspired by the tale of wise Persian Magi following a star to find the Messiah. But what if this cherished story is more myth than fact? Join us as we delve into the mystery of the Christmas star. Was it a real astronomical event? or a symbolic part of a deeper narrative. In this documentary, we explore ancient texts, astronomical theories, and cultural lore to uncover the truth behind this legendary star. Get ready to challenge what you know and discover the hidden layers of this timeless story.
Night. As predictable as a sunrise, when the sun sets and the land becomes dark, the sky reveals its true self. On a cloudless night, the heavens are speckled with light, carrying with them the shimmering echoes of space and time. The naked eye finds numerous points of light, the suns of countless other worlds, maybe even worlds with people looking at our sun as one more point in the inky blackness of their night sky. We do not know if or where they are, or what stories they might have about their sky, but we know of another people who did craft tales about the lights in the sky, our ancestors. Millennia ago, People around the world found patterns in the sky, regularities in the heavens, and ways to predict times of warmth and cold. Among the things they observed is that there were times that a day was longer than a night, and sometimes a night longer than a day. The times of the year when the night was longer were colder, and the shortest days fit into the season of winter. Near the shortest of those days, billions of people hold celebrations, a tradition with great antiquity, though normally for different holidays. Today, the great celebration is Christmas. While Christmas is not on the shortest day of the year, its closeness is perhaps symbolic for many, as the light of the world was born in the time of greatest darkness. But then again, was Jesus really born in a lowly lodging in the town of Bethlehem on December 25th of the year 1 BCE? What of the Christmas traditions are based on real history? What are legendary accretions? And might the science of astronomy answer these questions? At this time of year, there's another tradition, especially in America, where the science education institutions known as planetariums try to answer these questions, and their presentations have been repeated for nearly a century. However, this is myth vision, and we will look at the best that history science, and mythology can do to figure out what is real about Christmas. Traditional Accretions Let's start with the date of Jesus' birth. Turning to your Bibles and looking at chapter 2 of the Gospel of Luke, you will see the date is given as, well, <laughs> there isn't one at all. In fact, no gospel says when Jesus was born. The best we can tell, no one has even associated December 25th with the birth of Jesus until the 3rd century, and the clearest evidence of the association doesn't exist until the year 350, long after the composition of the New Testament. Other early Christian sources give many other dates for Jesus' birth, from April to November, as indicated by the writings of Clement of Alexandria. And what about the Christmas card imagery of the baby in a manger, surrounded by animals, especially an ox and donkey? While the laying of Jesus in a manger is biblical, See Luke 2.7. The animals are from the apocryphal gospels in a document claiming to be a Latin translation of the original Hebrew document written by the disciple, Matthew. We are presented with this imagery for the first time. These two animals were actually not random, but were a fulfillment of scripture. According to this other gospel of Matthew, quoting from Isaiah 1.3, the ox knoweth his master and the ass his master's manger. This interesting gospel, however, is certainly not from the same author as the Gospel of Matthew found in Bibles today, and instead the book is usually called the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, but perhaps we should add it into the Bible, since it also makes baby Jesus into a dragon tamer, and having come to a certain cave and wishing to rest in it, the blessed Mary dismounted from her beast and sat down with the child Jesus in her bosom. And there were with Joseph three boys, and with Mary a girl, going on the journey along with them. And lo, suddenly there came forth from the cave many dragons, and when the child saw them, they cried out in great terror. Then Jesus went down from the bosom of his mother and stood on his feet before the dragons, and they adored Jesus. Praise the Lord from the earth, you dragons, ye dragons, and all you deeps. Psalm 148, 7. And the young child Jesus, walking before them, commanded them to hurt no man. But Mary and Joseph were very much afraid lest the child should be hurt by the dragons. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid, do not consider me to be a little child, for I am and always have been perfect, and all the beasts of the forest must needs be tame before me. Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, chapter 18. More additions would come into the story of Jesus' birth, fleshing out the details left by the canonical accounts of the nativity. For example, who were those strange wise men from the east who visited the young child, as first mentioned in Matthew chapter 2? Their names, their number, and their land of origin 
are not given. However, by the 6th century, the tradition was that there were three wise men. Their names were Balthazar, Melchior, and Gaspar. The latter would then become Caspar, as there was a missed stroke of the stylus, and a G became a C. In one tradition, their lands of origin were Arabia, Persia, and India respectively. However, other traditions have as many as 12 wise men visit baby Jesus. What of these names? Bathazar was one of the names given to the prophet Daniel, the same Daniel who predict the killing of a Messiah and the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds. Next, Malchior is a combination of Hebrew words, Melech and or meaning king and light. In other words, the king of light would follow a new light in the sky to find the light of the world. As for Caspar, his original name of Gaspar probably comes from the Hebrew term for treasure, Gizbar, which fits well with the gift-giving wise men. Also noteworthy, the three wise men were not originally called kings. That also was a later addition, and it probably comes from reading from Isaiah 60, 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Gentile kings coming to the rising light sounds like a pretty good connection to the Bethlehem star rising as a light to the Gentile wise men from the east. In fact, later in Isaiah 60, two Two of the gifts of the wise men are mentioned being brought by kings, gold and frankincense. A lot of tradition has been built upon the Christmas story, often with creative, even poetic additions based on scripture citations and clever wordplay. It makes for good story crafting, but not good history. Canonical Conundrums If we go by traditions, we will have a hard time knowing anything about the young man who would be called Christ. So let's return to the stories that are considered sacred. If we look for the stories of Jesus' birth in the Gospels, only two of the four describe anything, Matthew and Luke. Here, apologists will clamor and tell us that the Gospel of Matthew was really written by the disciple Matthew, and therefore it's an eyewitness story of the life of Jesus. But this fails to explain the beginning of the story. After all, Matthew hasn't even met Jesus yet. And won't be called to discipleship until about 30 years later, according to Luke 3.23. So there's no way Matthew was an eyewitness to the birth of the Messiah, and that is if we assume traditional authorship. Similarly, the Gospel of Luke, supposedly written by the companion of the Apostle Paul, was no eyewitness to the Nativity. But even if these two Gospels are not written by people who were there at the birth of Jesus, they have the receipts, right? Well, here we get into so many issues, because not only do the stories of Jesus' Nativity differ wildly between Matthew and Luke, but they outright contradict each other on important details, including the date of Jesus' birth. While neither give an exact day, Matthew places Jesus' birth in the reign of Herod the Great. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king. Matthew 2, 1. Conversely, in Luke, timing of the birth was during a census, during the governorship of a particular figure in Syria. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius, Quirinius, was governor of Syria. Luke 2, 1 through 2. The problem is that Herod the Great was dead by the year 4 BCE, but this census took place in 6 CE, about a decade later. Huge amounts of ink have been spilled to try and fix this problem, from suggesting that Herod died much later, to a second governorship of Quirinius, to retranslating the text to mean before the census rather than first census. All of these solutions fell upon examination. We know when Herod died, because Josephus is clear when Herod began to reign, and for how many years, and the major dates of Herod's activities line up with other historical events. So we see Josephus didn't screw up. Josephus was also using Herod's own memoirs, as well as that of Herod's chief advisor, Nicholas of Damascus. So there's no way Josephus made a decade-sized error. As for the dating of Quirinius's governorship, this is not only confirmed by Josephus, but other historical sources provide a biography of this former consul of Rome. And during 
during the time of Herod the Great, he was everywhere except Syria, and certainly not its governor. As for the changes to the translation, not only does this make no narrative sense, why date an event to say it was before a certain year rather than say what year it actually was, just like Luke does later on in Luke 3.1, but grammar rules do not allow for the proposed amendments. This glaring contradiction is hardly the only issue when comparing the accounts of Matthew and Luke. In Matthew, the Holy Family seem to reside in the house in Bethlehem, and only afterwards are they forced to leave and then move to the Galilee. In Luke, the Holy Family are natives of Nazareth in the Galilee, and then are forced to go to Bethlehem for a census, stay in a loaned out space, and then return as soon as completing government, business, and rituals in the temple. The two Gospels also have accounts that do not contradict, but they differ so greatly one would not think it is even possibly the same story. In Matthew, wise men from the east come to the baby, following a special star. And then everyone needs to flee the wrath of the evil King Herod. There's nothing about a choir of angels, visitations by shepherds, or a census. In Luke, however, there's nothing about a star, wise men, or even Herod as part of the birth story. Rather, a census forces Joseph and a very pregnant Mary to travel to Bethlehem, and shepherds come based on the instruction of an angel. These accounts diverge so much that it is a common premise in arguments about how well Luke knew or didn't know and used the Gospel of Matthew. However, the synoptic problem, that is, now the first three canonical Gospels literally relate to each other, is for another time. It's enough to say the argument exists because these stories are so radically different, it can only be believed by sheer apologetic and dogmatic willpower that this is all the same story. It is also not a great place to look for the events of the life of the historical Jesus. After all, the nativity stories are full of well-worn literary tropes. The miraculous birth of the Messiah is part and parcel with so many other figures, to the point that even early Christians conceded the point. And if we affirm that he was born of a virgin, accept this in common with what you accept of Perseus, just a martyr. First Apology 22. And when we say also that the Word, who is the first birth of God, was produced without sexual union, and that He, Jesus Christ, our Teacher, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those whom you esteem sons of Jupiter, Justin Martyr, First Apology 21. The attempt on Jesus' life by Herod is also a common trope. So many great heroic figures in Greek and Roman myth had their lives on the line while infants. This includes Perseus, Heracles, Romulus, and Remus. And let's not forget the story of Moses. In the story told by Josephus, when Moses was born, Pharaoh was worried not so much by overpopulation by the Jews, but there was a prophecy about a leader who would rise up among them and it was the attempted murder of all male infants that Pharaoh sought to prevent his nation's fate. Perhaps then, there's no wonder that in the Jesus story, the Messiah and the new Moses would also be sought out by an evil king who would slaughter all male babies trying to stop the new leader from reaching adulthood, let alone fulfilling prophecy. The birth of Jesus is usually considered the most historically implausible part of the narratives of his life. But what if we could actually cut through it all and get to facts guaranteed by science? This is part of a tradition that goes back centuries in both biblical studies as well as scientific discourse. And when one enters into the planetarium during the holiday season, you will likely be presented a narrative backed up by observations and equations to present the actual night of Jesus' birth. What does the science say? According to the Gospel of Matthew, a special light was seen by the wise men from the east. Where is he that is born, King of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Matthew 2.2 2. Not many details of this star are given, except that it was seen in the east, but even this has been confusing. The underlying Greek is ambiguous, and scholars have suggested it means the star was in the east or the wise men were themselves in the east when they saw the star. But most modern translations render this not as in the east, but at its rising, suggesting a star rising. And where does the star rise? And where do stars rise? In the east, just like the sun. More details of the star are mentioned later in the gospel. Most importantly, and lo, the star which they saw in the east, 
went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Matthew 2.9 These few verses, along with a bit more context from the narrative, have been the linchpin to efforts to figure out what was this wonderful star of Bethlehem. With the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, scholars began to look at this tale as not about a miraculous light in the sky, but something following the demonstrable and calculable, but something following the demonstrable and calculatable laws of nature. If the star was really a planet in the sky, for example, perhaps we could rewind the clock and discover not only what was seen over the skies of Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, but we may find the exact day of Jesus' birth, as well as the arrival of the wise men. Many astronomers will also see their craft in play, though in a slightly different guise, because the wise men of the story is the translation of a Greek word magoi in Greek or magi in Latin. And these magi were often considered to be astrologers, star watchers who interpreted the skies. If we can read the skies like these ancient observers did and then use computers to go back in time to look at the heavens, perhaps we will find Jesus in those equations. This has been the hope for many and it is a hope one finds replenished every Christmas season in the planetarium. But do the facts bear out what many hope to find? You should probably become suspicious since different planetariums will have different solutions to the problem. Some will say that a special alignment of the planets in 7 BCE is what is described by Matthew. Others will say it was a different alignment in 5 BCE, or others still in 2 BCE. Others may instead suggest a comet, or even an exploding star called a supernova. Even though this is the Myth Vision channel, where we explore the stories of the past, let's become astronomers for a little while. All of the stars in the sky appear to move around us in circles, traveling from east to west. For those in the northern hemisphere, the stars close to Polaris, also called the North Star, do not rise or set. All others disappear below and reappear above the horizon. When those stars rise and set changes throughout the year, but dependably and predictably. Certain constellations are visible all throughout the night during certain times of the year, but then do not appear at all during the night. For example, the constellation of Orion, the hunter, is called a winter constellation for northerners. During the cold months, you can generally see Orion from sunset to sunrise, but in the summer, you likely don't see Orion at all. Conversely, the constellation of Aquila, the eagle, is a summer constellation. The timing of the rising and setting of those stars is all because of the rotation of the Earth and the revolution of the Earth around the Sun. All of the constellations are collections of stars connected together in the imagination because of the images they appear to make. Ancient people imagined all of the stars as attached to a solid dome or sphere, making all of these stars about the same distance away Away from you. However, the actual stars we can see with the naked eye differ in distance by huge amounts. The closest star to our solar system, called Proxima Centauri, is about four light years away. That is at the cosmic speed limit. It takes over four years to get from Earth to this star. With rocket technology, it would take closer to 100,000 years, and this is the closest star. Other visible stars, such as Rho Cassiopeia, are thousands of light years away. Away, literally a thousand times further. More stars in the galaxy are further away still, as our galaxy is about 90,000 light years across. However, the most distant object the naked eye can see is another galaxy in the constellation of Andromeda at a distance of over two and a half million light years. This is also just what the human eye can see. The depth of the universe breaks the imagination and fills it with awe and wonder. The universe is grander than anything in the ancient imagination. Imagination. While the Old Testament speaks of a hard dome over the flat earth and the ancient Greeks and Romans thoughts of planetary spheres, our technology and mathematical models expand our reach beyond any rakia and crystalline sphere. The sky is not the limit. As we can travel to the planets on rockets, peer into the earliest light in the universe older than the sun and moon, by billions of years, and track the motions of the galaxies across the cosmos formed out of the afterglow of spectacular chaos. One could only wish the biblical writers could even fathom the actual glory of the universe. For now, let's return close to home and seek out what we can see. Looking again with the naked eye, there are several points of light that are brighter 
than most stars, but they move in odd ways. If plotting their position over many nights, one can see that they are not in the same place relative to the other stars. Generally, they seem to move from west to east against the background rotation of the sky from east to west. However, sometimes those lights will reverse direction, moving east to west even against the normal rotation of the sky, and then reverse again. These wandering lights are called planets, and their title is derived from the Greek word for wandering. Planetes from Planao, several planets are identified in prehistoric times, and we today call them after the names of Roman gods. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Only with the advent of the telescope did we confirm the existence of Uranus and Neptune, along with many more bodies orbiting the Sun. The motions of the planets are complex, but their back and forth patterns are due to the fact that the Earth and all of the planets orbit the Sun. The orbits of the planets are now precisely known, and their positions thousands of years into the future and past can be accurately predicted. One other observation ancient astronomers noted is that the planets all appeared to move across the sky in a particular band of constellations, and the sun and moon would also appear to travel along that same band. This circle of constellations would become the zodiac. 12 signs that are integral to astrology, not to be confused with the science of astronomy. In antiquity, there was not a hard distinction between these two. Basically, all astronomers were astrologers, trying to figure out what the stars meant or what would happen in human affairs. By the time of Christianity, astronomers in the Greco-Roman world would predict pretty well where the planets would be on a given night. If you asked an astronomer to create a chart of where the planets were on the date of your birth, bearing some calculation errors, they would be pretty close to correctly locating them. However, not everything was so predictable. Sometimes long, fuzzy stars would streak through the skies. These were called comets, from the Greek word for hair, cometes. In the past, the origins of comets was unknown, and philosophers like Aristotle thought they were atmospheric phenomena. Today, we know that comets, like the planets, also orbit the sun, but their paths are not as round, nor do they all fall in the same orbital plane as the planets. Comets are balls, largely of dust, water, and and frozen carbon dioxide. When they are far from the sun, they are cold and inert. When they get closer, the water and dry ice begins to heat up and shoot off, creating the primary tail of the comet. Some comets have orbital periods on the order of a human lifetime, such as the famous Halley's Comet and its 75-year orbit. Others will not return for thousands of years. Since comets were not understood in antiquity, no one could predict when or where you would see a comet. This is not the only unpredictable sight. Occasionally, a new star will appear, sometimes as bright as Venus. In ancient China, they were called guest stars, as if the sky just got a new temporary roommate. In the West, these new stars became known as novas or novae, literally from the Latin word for new. No one living today has seen a nova with the naked eye, as there has not been a new star seen in the night sky since 1604. But you might want to look up tonight, because most astronomers think we are overdue. What a new star is can be several possibilities, but they are all explosive. The smaller versions are a temporary surface explosion. This this can happen if there are two stars close enough to each other that they pull material from each other because of their gravity. In particular, if one of the stars is something like our sun and the other is a white dwarf, a small but dense remnant of a star, then the white dwarf can pull gas from the normal star and that gas builds up enough on the white dwarf surface to suddenly undergo nuclear fusion and explode. But this is only the small version of an explosion. In an event known as a supernova, the entire star explodes with a level of energy that matches the output of an entire galaxy of stars. This was the case in 1604, and others have been recorded in ancient astronomical records in both the East and the West. Like the comet, no one in the past could predict when and where a new star would be seen, and even today astronomers cannot tell you exactly when to expect a nova or supernova. We do know some stars are getting ready for a spectacular death, but even when a star is close to exploding, we may not see it happen for hundreds of thousands 
of years. All of this is to set up the major possibilities for what could have been seen in the skies close to the time of Jesus' birth. With astronomy software, we can pinpoint where any of the planets were in the sky at any day or hour. With historical records, we can identify the most impressive comets and novae that would have been in the sky as well by reconstructing the heavens on any given night. That might match the description of the Christmas star. Scientific facts or mythologized science? The problem in connecting astronomical events to the Gospel of Matthew is how to interpret the text. When Matthew says the star was rising when seen by the wise men, does he mean it was the first time the star was rising and it was seen just before dawn's early light made it invisible? When the star was said to go before the wise men, does this mean the star was seen in the direction of Bethlehem from Jerusalem? Or does this mean the star was going in a certain direction? Astronomers are not trained to read Greek, nor do they read widely in classical sources, so their interpretations are not well informed. One of the reasons there are so many explanations for the Christmas star is because different astronomers will read the words in a different way, and yet very few know the underlying language, while also pontificating that they understand it better than what is found in standard translations. Otherwise, the claim is to not take the text literally, a text most of them literally cannot read. When apologists get their hands on the text, they will either allude to the scientist discussing it as a source of legitimization, or they will disparage the author of the Gospel of Matthew. For example, in the 19th century, Henry Alford said that the gospel used universally inaccurate language. In the 20th, J. Gresham Mackin said it's a baldly literal reading of the text was to make the story seem silly on purpose. Funny how apologists tell us to believe the gospels are literal history, except when that seems silly. With a lack of knowledge of the language, the flexibility in nonetheless interpreting the text and the sparse details in the gospel, the last astronomer David Hughes stated rather interestingly, there are few facts to cramp one style. David Hughes, Review Symposium, The Star of Bethlehem, Journal for the History of Astronomy, 33. Equally problematic is how we think ancient people would have interpreted these signs in the sky. If we don't use good sources from the past and we just speculate what the stars meant to the ancients, we are just imposing on the past. For example, the astronomers who suggest that the Star of Bethlehem was a comet have to explain why a comet in 5 BCE was considered the sign of the coming of the King of the Jews when usually ancient people interpreted a comet as the sign of death and destruction. Comets are usually a sign of death, but this time was different, so the special pleading goes. For those looking to use astrology to figure out how the motions of the planets would have been understood, they will find only confusion. Astrology is based on plenty of mathematics to figure out where the planets are, but the interpretation is less reliable than a poorly translated fortune cookie. Astrology books from Greeks and Romans are filled with contradictions and no step-by-step -step method of interpretation. When testing astrologers, not only do they not predict the future any better than chance, but their agreement on what a start chart means is almost no better than chance, really. When given the same charts and the same personality exams, Astrologers match up those personalities to charts no better than chance, and their choices of which charts go with the, which personalities is almost no better than chance. So what does a given horoscope mean? Whatever you want it to. And if that were not bad enough, we know that the actual magi from the east were not astrologers. The term was used for the priest of the Persian religion named after its prophet Zoroaster, and the Zoroastrian literature was either uncaring towards or hostile against astrology. The planets were evil entities corrupted by the equivalent of Satan, and there are no signs of interest in planetary astronomy or astrology until centuries after the time of Jesus. So why did Matthew say that magi were following a star? This kind of gives the game a way, showing the gospel author was inventing based on cultural norms rather than history. In the West, the term magus had broadened its meaning for any alleged magic user or charlatan, while Greeks who loved to do flimsy etymologies thought that the prophet Zoroaster was an astrologer because of his name. The Greek word for star, aster, 
means Zoroaster was a star watcher, or so the imagination went. In reality, this isn't the prophet's actual name, but this sort of wordplay created an entire genre of pseudepigraphic, magical, and astrological literature claiming the knowledge of the Persian prophet. In other words, the author of the Gospel of Matthew has fallen into believing false things about the East because of the literature in the West. It would be like an American thinking everyone in Afghanistan speaks Arabic because the country is majority Muslim. If you read a story about life in Kandahar and everyone is speaking Arabic instead of Pashto, that's a pretty good sign you're reading stereotyped fiction. What this means is that the nativity story is built upon Greco-Roman stereotypes of Easterns instead of actual historical events. Whoops. This also means looking for astrological explanations for the star Bethlehem is not going to be successful because the alleged planet watchers were in historical reality no such thing. And that's not even the worst strike against astronomical and astrological theories about Christmas. If we stick to the text of the gospel and its actual meaning, there's no room for the astronomer to help. This star was truly magical as it not only traveled south from Jerusalem to Bethlehem while all stars moved from east to west. Moreover, it stopped in place and hovered over one particular house and not hovered up high in the sky, but it was at rooftop level. No, this is not a hyperbolic way of describing normal astronomical observations. The miraculous description of the star is how all ancient and medieval readers interpreted the text. In fact, the star becomes only more wondrous in later stories. For example, in the infancy gospel of James, the holy family is residing in a cave. The star entered into the cave and hovered right over Jesus' head. In a later story called the Revelation of the Magi, the star is baby Jesus himself meeting and talking to the Magi while they were in the East. That star then acts as their guiding light. So Jesus led the Magi to baby Jesus. Sounds like standard astronomy, right? Of course not. We are clearly dealing with the fantastical. And that is what the star of Bethlehem was, a magical GPS unit pinpointing one particular house in Bethlehem. But if we have the fantastical, what inspired the fantasy? Mythical origins in Rome. There are numerous stories of guiding stars if we look around the ancient Mediterranean. One common motif for sailors was the guiding light of the divine twins, Castor and Pollux, collectively called the Dioscori. Here is one such account. But there came on a great storm, and the chieftains had given up hope of being saved. When Orpheus, they say, who was the only one on the shipboard who had ever been initiated in the mysteries of the deities of Samothrace, offered to these deities the prayers for their salvation. And immediately the wind died down and two stars fell over the heads of the Dioscori. And the whole company was amazed at the marvel which had taken place and concluded they had been rescued from their perils by an act of providence of the gods. For this reason, the story of this reversal of fortune for the Argonauts has been handed down to succeeding generations and sailors when caught in storms always direct their prayers to the deities of Samothrace and attribute the appearance of the two stars to the epiphany of the Dioscori. Diodorus Siculus, Bibliotheca Historica, 4. 43. This tale of a voyage by the legendary musician Orpheus was hardly left to the mythic past, as stories of the Dioscuri appearing as guiding stars were told of the Spartan generals Timoleon, 4th century BC, and Lysander, 5th century BC. Both of these men had detailed biographies written by Plutarch in the 2nd century, and Plutarch is just one of the sources describing these guiding stars. But an even greater light was the guide of one of the most important heroes in Roman myth, Aeneas. This survivor of the Trojan War needed divine help to find a place as a new home for himself and his fellow Trojans. As a child of Venus, he could expect his mom to help. Here's how the prayer of Aeneas, his father, and Chyses was portrayed in the national epic of Rome, the Aeneid. Anchises, with exultant eyes, looked heavenward and lifted to the stars his voice in outstretched hands. Almighty Jove, if aught of prayer may move thee, let thy grace now visit us. Oh, hear this holy vow, and if for service at thine altars done, we ought can claim 
O Father, lend us aid, and ratify the omen thou hast given. Scar ceased his aged voice, when suddenly, from leftward, with a deafening thunder pill, cleaving the blackness of the vaulted sky, a meteor star in trailing splendor ran, exceeding bright. We watched it glide sublime o'er tower and town, until its radiant beam in forest mantled Ida died away, but left a furrow on its track in air, a glittering long line while far and wide the sulfurous fume and exaltation flowed. My father strove not now, but lifted him in prayer to all the gods, in holy awe of that auspicious star, and thus exclaimed, Tarry no moment more, behold I come, whither soar ye lead, my steps obey. Gods of my fathers, O preserve our name, preserve my son and his. This augury is yours, and Troy on your soul strength relies. I yield, dear son, I journey at thy side. Virgil, Aeneid, too. I think the similarities with the gospel account are clear, but let's have them really shine through. We have the appearance of a star, leading to exceedingly great joy because of its appearance and movements, and it acts as a guide to their new kingdom. That new kingdom would be to the west of their starting point, going from Anatolia to Rome. The parallelism with the gospel is thus a star, leading to exceedingly great joy because of its appearance and movements, and it acts as a guide to the new king, and that new king was found to the west of the travelers, the wise men from the east. This version of the guiding star of Aeneas was not original to Virgil, as the ancient commentator Servius the Grammarian noted. In the original version, the guiding light was Venus as the morning star. That is an interesting point, because the Christmas star was seen at its rising, and this may mean it was also a morning star, rising in the eastern sky. The star of Aeneas was also important to Roman politics because its imagery was now reflecting another important star, the star of Julius Caesar. On the Ides of March 44 BCE, Caesar, having already been made dictator for life by the Senate, was stabbed to death by members of that same Senate. During the funeral games set in his honor, a new star was seen in the sky. We have observations of this star from multiple sources, both in Rome and as far away as China, so we know it was real, and we know what it was. This new star was a comet, appearing at times with little or no tell, so it was hard to know if it was the ominous hairy star or a glorious sign in the sky. The lovers of Caesar, especially his adopted son Octavian, pushed the narrative that this star was Caesar's soul being taken up to heaven, lifted up by Venus herself. The Lilius Cetus, or Julian star, would become an icon of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, a symbol in the temple devoted to Caesar and worn on the helm of the Emperor Augustus. The coinage of Augustus would include the star, indications of its flaming tail, and inscribed in Latin that this was the sign of the divine Julius, making Augustus the son of a god. We thus see the imagery of a magnificent flaming star in the myth of Aeneas and his guiding star. We know the star of Bethlehem was understood by Christians as comparable to the star of Aeneas, because some made that exact comparison. This is seen in a rewritten gospel using only quotes from the works of Virgil as produced by a Christian woman named Faltonia Batitia Proba in her Cento Virginalus de Ladibus Christi. I probably butchered that, but the title's on the screen. Virgilian Cento praising Christ. She took the very lines from the Aeneid about the guiding star as the description of the star of the Magi. In other words, the star of Bethlehem, acting as a guiding morning star to a new king of the world, was a powerful symbol, understandable in its Greco-Roman environment, but incomprehensible as a literal astronomical phenomenon. Star of David, Star of Christ. Most good stories have more than one source of inspiration, and students in Greco-Roman antiquity were taught to emulate more than one model in their writing at a time. So it should be no surprise if the author of the Gospel of Matthew emulated not just important Roman myths, but also Jewish scriptures. This is perhaps most obvious when we read the so-called star prophecy given by the seer named Balaam. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, 
and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Numbers 24, 17. This passage was popularly interpreted as predicting the coming of the Messiah. It is cited multiple times in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it was part of the propaganda of the rebel leader Simon Bar Kokhba, his name meaning son of the star. In the Greek translation of this passage, the word scepter is replaced with man, indicating the star was a person. In one Aramaic phrase, the word scepter is replaced with king. In the original context, the prophecy was about King David. So would it not be fitting that the son of David, born in David's city, would have a star lead to the newborn Messiah? Come on, people. Ancient commentaries by Christians on the nativity story consistently noted the connection between the the Christmas star and the star prophecy. In one of the oldest pieces of Christian art, deep in the Roman catacombs of Priscilla, Mary is seen holding her child with a star above them. Pointing to the star is one man, most likely the prophet Balaam himself. The Magi are seen elsewhere in the catacombs. It seems clear to the early Christians that Jesus' star was in fulfillment of the star prophecy. And we know that Matthew loved to indicate how this or that thing happened in fulfillment of scripture. So we can be pretty comfortable in the idea that the story was written to make sure Jesus was such a fulfillment. The star is thus myth created from Old Testament prophecy and Roman political legends clear as day, right? Just one more thing. There is one detail that remains a mystery. In the star prophecy, the star is not a separate light in the sky, but it was supposed to be the Messiah himself. This can be seen not just in other Jewish sources, but also in the New Testament. After all, in two books, Jesus is called the morning star. Revelation 22, 16 and 2 Peter 1, 19. We even saw that in the non-canonical revelation of the Magi, baby Jesus was also the star. In another hymn, as recited by the Bishop Ignatius of Antioch in the second century, Jesus was a new bright star in the heavens. What do we make of this? Might there be a connection between the story of Jesus as a star and a star at the birth of Jesus? And if so, in what direction might influence go? Was there first the story of Jesus as a star that was transformed into the Christmas star story? Or was the story of the Bethlehem star made even more mythical to turn Jesus into a star? Here we behold a true mystery. Perhaps then our exploration of the origins of this Yuletide tale is not yet over, but we will have many more Christmases to explore the mythic superstructure of the Bible and the figure of Jesus. Until then, have a happy holiday holiday filled with cheer and perhaps a few good stories around the fireplace. Can we really know that is dogmatized on which version John had in mind? If you're being distracted by an incessant knock at the door, don't worry. It may be an axe murderer, but rest assured it's not me. I'm not trying to share with you the good news that your Christian faith is misplaced or in vain, but it is my task, even if self-appointed, to try to keep you honest when it comes to the Bible. If scripture gives you welcome promises, it also bequeaths you serious doubts, and your faith will not be worth much until you face up to them fair and square. I must admit, also, I left out in particular the Acts situation in Acts chapters 9-11, through 11, where the author of Luke, Acts, is definitely harping back to the Jonah story, utilizing Jonah from the first healing that happens with Aeneas, and then Tabitha, and then Cornelius. You have a miracle of Cornelius getting the Holy Spirit, and Peter's convinced that this unclean person is now clean. This Jonah story appears often in the early traditions, and you have to wonder, is this the point of the resurrection, is that it's going to those who are not Jews? And this is their obvious evidence that the resurrection's true, is that non-Jews are believing the message. I'm highly suspect to thinking that's the case, but never forget, I'm not going to knock on your door, and I hope that you'll be honest. I think it's better to be a doubting Thomas than a blind fool. No one is knocking on my door telling me about their Lord and Savior Romulus Quirinius, who ascended on high, was called a king, son of God, and father of the greatest city ever known to man, Rome. But if they did, I'm pretty sure I'd know what they would say. 
There's eyewitness testimony that he appeared after his ascension into heaven to a trustworthy senator named Proculus Julius, charging him to tell the Romans that it is the will of heaven that my Rome should be the head of all the world. And guess what? It came true, just as he said it would. Therefore, you must believe or be damned forever. But fundamentalist evangelicals actively participate in such activities. So I want to address these issues for anyone who's had people knock on the doors of their hearts, minds, or literally at their homes with such argumentation. You know, I was an evangelical Christian for most of my life. I even dabbled in apologetics when I went to Carolina College Biblical Studies. They used to call it Carolina Bible College. My vision was to become a pastor of a congregation and defend my faith to those who would try to cast doubt. And boy, how have the tables turned. Christian apologists focus their efforts on the resurrection of Jesus, which is supposed to prove everything in their creed. They strive to support their faith in the resurrection as verifiable in real history by relying on six minimal facts. The argument goes like this. Number one, Jesus was killed by crucifixion. Number two, soon after, his followers had real experiences where they thought the risen Jesus had appeared to them. Number three, their lives were changed to the point that they were willing to die for this belief. Number four, that these things were taught very soon after Jesus' death. Number five, that Jesus' unwilling or unbelieving brother, James, was convinced from an experience he had, which he thought he encountered, the risen Christ. And number six, that Paul was also convinced of Jesus' resurrection from a similar experience while he was persecutor of the Jesus movement. This minimal facts argument helps the believing Christian in his engagement with skeptics. By contrast, I want to highlight an argument that is oftentimes overlooked. Let's coin this phrase and call it the minimal doubts argument. The traditions in the New Testament, which depict the disciples as initially doubting the resurrection, deserve new and closer scrutiny. They ought to be troubling for people thousands of years removed from Jesus. If his own followers weren't sure, why should we be so sure? Has Jesus literally appeared to you in order for you to feel his scars and touch his side? Hmm. I will skip over Paul, even though he is our earliest witness, because his alleged experiences were subsequent to those enshrined in the Gospel Easter episodes. Also, Paul doesn't really go into these doubting traditions, but merely provides a roll call of people who experienced appearances of Jesus to validate his own calling as an apostle. See 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Corinthians 9.1. And mustn't we infer that those who rejected Paul's apostleship also rejected his claims of having encountered the risen Jesus? Did they think he was making it all up? And since he lambasted others as false apostles all throughout his letters, can we not infer that he rejected their claims as equally spurious? Let me, let me paint a picture for you. That would mean that fabricated claims of resurrection appearances were circulating as part and parcel of conflicting and therefore dubious assertions of apostolic authority. This calls for a mind with wisdom, i.e. someone with critical thinking, not accepting things at face value, even things we want to believe. I hope one will see that the earliest believers in Jesus weren't so sure about Jesus being the Messiah until they experienced what they call or what they believed to be the risen Jesus. And even then, were, doubts were not out of the question. My sole purpose is to convince you, if you've not actually touched Jesus, hands and side, then you too should be a doubting Thomas. We're going to start with the earliest gospel, Mark. It's obvious to all concerned that Gospels, the Gospels, are written to convince people Jesus is the Son of God and that he rose from the dead. If we look at Dr. Bart Ehrman's approach in how Jesus became God, we see a development of Jesus' tradition from Mark's Gospel to John's. And I want to take this approach on the doubting tradition. Mark, whoever this writer may have been, looks to be the earliest Gospel. He wants to give his readers the distinct impression that no one grasps who Jesus really is. Scholars call this the messianic secret. Because Jesus reveals his true identity, 
only through parables, the meaning of which he hides from his hearers, even his closest disciples remain clueless. Attention was first drawn to this motif in 1901 by William Reed. When the demons recognize Jesus' secret identity, he silences them. Even when the disciples gain an inkling of Jesus' true dignity, they have only reached square one. Jesus remains largely a mystery to them. Jesus even commands Peter, James, and John to remain silent after the transfiguration scene. Why? Jesus himself never reveals his true identity openly. Rather, the disciples only later put the pieces together retrospectively, subsequent to the resurrection. What? Is this some kind of practical joke played on the disciples? It is a cruel game indeed if the stakes are as high as Christian theology makes them. If one's soul is dangling over the volcano pit, as Calvinist Jonathan Edwards imagined, and the only escape clause stipulates acceptance of some Anselmian sacrifice soteriology, are we not way beyond Mark 1.15's gospel tidings? The kingdom of God is at hand! Repent! Does it sound like God wants everyone to be saved? Think about it. Oddly, Mark's gospel winds up placing its readers on par with the unclean spirits whom Jesus continuously silences, since they, unlike the dim-witted disciples, know full well who and what Jesus is. Within the bounds of the story, the disciples have to arrive gradually at the conclusion the demons already know. Only they never do. The Roman centurion posted at the cross experiences a flash of Christological insight, and he says, Truly, this man was the Son of God. The young man who greets the mourning women at the tomb affirms Jesus' resurrection, or and or ascension, but he says nothing of who Jesus is or was. Presumably, Jesus would have explained everything to them at their proposed reunion in Galilee. But the women neglect to relay the invitation to the disciples, for they were afraid. Is the evangelist hinting that the disciples never came to true Christian faith, as Marcion thought? Whereas someone else, i.e. Paul, alluded to in Mark 9, 38-41, did? And remember, at in, this connection to the business about the resurrection encounter stories, functioning offered as credentials for our apostles. Put it this way, if one had to have seen and been commissioned by the risen Lord in order to qualify as an apostle, what does that say about the 12 who missed their appointment in Galilee? Paul is said to have said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision in Acts 26, 19. But the 12 were not. They were rather like those summoned to the great supper and did not make it. Many are called, but few are chosen. Did Mark think that would include disciples? By denying Peter and the rest saw the resurrected Jesus, was he undercutting their claim to apostleship? They were those who were reputed to be something, but what they were makes no difference to me, Paul says in Galatians 2.6. Putting it simply, is Mark's gospel antagonistic to the Twelve, but glorifies Paul as a true apostle while denying the others since they never saw the risen Jesus? But the women were afraid and told no one. Mark 8, 11 through 13 seems to want to rebuke enemies of the Jesus faith, but one has to wonder if those Pharisees really stand for Christian readers who desperately want to believe but cannot persuade themselves to do so, people like me. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. This response seems to be quite odd, because if these Pharisees actually did receive the requested sign and believed in Jesus, why on earth wouldn't this be a good thing? We automatically assume they were already convinced Jesus was a charlatan and we're only trying to embarrass him, but that assumption may be making asses out of you and me. This gospel conspicuously leaves out the sign of Jonah, hence the abrupt ending without Jesus' resurrection appearances. 
Mark seems to be dismissing people's doubts at every turn. You should just have faith and take their word for it. No wonder believers are taught not to doubt, but to believe no matter what. If these Pharisees sincerely asked for signs to know whether Jesus really was the promised one, why wouldn't one be given? Could this all be a way to convince the readers that they will not receive a sign because they don't or shouldn't need one? Though it may not be seen that way to them, or they wouldn't be asking, there's already sufficient evidence of Jesus from what they read or from the testimony of others. Not good enough for you? Well, too bad. This is not exactly a strategy to reassure the doubting soul. Rather, it amounts to a command to suppress one's doubt, as if that is the path to virtue. It suggests that the real business of apologetics is to convince oneself, not others. If, Un if Unification Church recruits began to have second thoughts as to whether the Reverend Sun Young Moon were actually the Lord of the Second Advent, they were told simply to chant, shout out doubt, over and over again. Isn't that what it boils down to? Why not admit what you suspected all along? This is a sin, the sin of intellectual dishonesty. Walter Kaufman explained the dilemma faced by one who puts all this chips on his sheer faith proposition. And this is what he said. Those who pit commitment against reason and advise us to blind and destroy our reason before making the most crucial choice of our life are apologists for one specific set of doctrines, which to use Paul's words, are foolishness to those who have not taken leave of reason. They say their doctrine is infallible and true, but ignore the fact that there is no dearth whatsoever of pretenders to infallibility and truth. They may think they choose their doctrine because it is offered to us as infallible and true, but this plainly no sufficient reason scares of other doctrines, scriptures and apostles, sects and parties, cranks and sages, make the same claim. Those who claim to know which of the lot is justified in making such a bold claim, those who tell us that this faith or that is really infallible and true are presupposing in effect, whether they realize this or not, that they themselves happen to be infallible. Those who have no such exalted notion of themselves have no way of deciding between dozens of pretenders if reason is proscribed. Those who are asking us to spurn reason are in effect counseling us to trust to luck. But luck in such cases is unusual. Such a faith stance is the result of making virtue of necessity, and no one would favor it if they were proposed any genuinely cogent proof, supporting the choice they, like Mark, urge upon you. That quote is over. Let's move into Matthew's Gospel. Most academics believe that is the second Gospel. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is born as both Son of God and King of Israel by virtue of his genealogy going all the way back to Abraham. Unlike Mark's version of the Jordan baptism, Matthew's has John the Baptist tell Jesus that he needs to be baptized by Jesus instead of the other way around. This author saw a problem with Jesus being baptized by John in Mark's gospel. Another very important point to emphasize about Matthew's gospel, present also in the baptism scene, is the notion of fulfilling scripture. Many critical scholars have shown that Matthew is so concerned with fulfilling scripture that one could say that Matthew is not motivated by true history, but by theology. Jesus riding two donkeys rather than one because the evangelists literalize the poetic parallelism from Zechariah 9.9, which intends but a single donkey. And there's more. <laughs> Much more. Let's see what Matthew has done with the Markin story where Jesus challenges to produce a con confirmatory sign from God abruptly refuses and walks away. This is found in Mark 8, 11 through 13. But in Matthew 12, 38 through 41, it has this. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will arise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. 
for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. For those who are Q advocates, the Q version does not go so far, adding only except the sign of Jonah, leaving the reader to figure out what it means. Jonah? Huh? To this, Luke added the beginning of an explanation. For as Jonah began, became a sign to the men of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. But the italicized lines in Matthew that are different than what we find in Mark seek to elaborate Jonah's role further, and in this, two ways. First, he inserts Jesus' resurrection as an antitype fulfilling the Jonah typology. Second, perhaps reading Luke as some think, Matthew interprets the business about Jonah's role as a sign to the Ninevites, as denoting Jonah's unexpected success in persuading the Assyrians to repent of their heathen ways. What do the two Matthean glosses have to do with each other, you ask? Much in every way. One has to wonder if the sign of Jonah was added because of the Gentile mission, after Jesus is done, with the Jewish not-so-great commission. In Matthew 10, 5-6, Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. For Matthew, the Gentile mission may practically be said to be the form in which Jesus rose from the dead. As when Bultmann proposed that Jesus rose into the Kergma, the gospel preaching of the early church, who witnessed Jonah get swallowed by a massive fish and then spat out after three days. The Old Testament author makes no mention of anyone witnessing this feat. Likewise, the Jesus movement did go to Gentiles who certainly never saw resurrected Jesus. Many references to that. But uh, there is a letter of Jesus to Abgarus. It is written concerning me that those who have seen me will not believe, but those who have not seen me will believe. And then in Matthew 16, 15 through 17, highlights ignorance on the part of the disciples. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood but by my Father in heaven. This text again is Matthean embellishment unique to his gospel. The assertion is a close parallel to Galatians 1. I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me, or by me, is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is, this is pretty remarkable. For does it not constitute an admission that even for the ostensible eyewitnesses of Jesus, there was not sufficient evidence to convince them that Jesus was what Christianity claims he was or is? In fact, isn't this also the upshot of 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5? When I came to you, Paul says, brethren, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God in lofty words or wisdom, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. In other words, had Paul managed to convince his hearers with fancy apologetic arguments, their faith might vanish like yesterday's news as soon as someone else came along with and offered a better sounding spiel. The only way to ensure against that is to grab them by the emotions or by some kind of ecstatic experience. That way, they will not seriously consider a rival belief. If you didn't arrive at your belief by reason, no reasoning is going to make you give it up. And I stand by this. How does Matthew's gospel conclude? The short and most familiar version would be that Jesus rises from the dead and appears first to the women at the tomb, which he has ex excited just shortly before. He orders them to relay this to his disciples, the message that he will expect to see them soon on a hilltop in their familiar haunts back in Galilee. Unlike in Mark, the women do as they were directed, and so do the disciples. The ensuing scene seems to overcompress the traditional formula for miraculous stories, and resurrection stories in particular. Initial skepticism quickly overcome by disclosure or gesture. I say overcompressed because the text actually reads, not, but some doubted, rather, but they doubted in Matthew 28. Some would be bad enough, but all of them, in any case, neither would be so bad as long as the statement were leading up to some breathtaking demonstration of Jesus' resurrection and identity. But we don't see that, or do we? 
I suggest that in fact we do. Jesus issues the great commission to evangelize the nations, the Gentiles, and promises he will go with them as they do. The resurrection appearances will extend to the commission or consummation of the age. And that is what overrules their doubts. Albert Schweitzer put it perfectly. He will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts and sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship. And as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experiences who he is. Schweitzer is talking about his own contemporaries and you and me. But the words apply equally to the ancient Jewish Christian missionaries from the church at Antioch for who the gospel was written to serve as a manual for organizing new congregations and catechizing their members. The actual 12, whoever they were, probably never set foot outside of Jerusalem. And here we see the final echo of the prophet Jonah, the solution to our riddle of what Jonah's emergence from the well's gullet had to do with his witness to the Ninevites, as his sopping, wrinkled return from his blubbery prison led directly to his precedent smashing mission to the Assyrians. So did Jesus return from the heart of the earth directly ignite the preaching mission to the heathen nations? The Gentile mission was the resurrection. Now Luke's Gospel. There seemed to me three major occasions of serious and productive doubt in the third Gospel, all of them clustered at the end. First comes the utter incredulity of the disciples at the Holy Women's report of the empty tomb in Luke 24. At first, the men dismiss their story as hysterical nonsense, just like Rhoda's report of Peter's deliverance from death row in Acts 12. When Peter investigates, he finds the tomb vacant, but leaves just as clueless as when he arrived. In pointed contrast to the Gospel of John's beloved disciple, who instantly recognizes what the emptiness of the tomb means in John chapter 20. The second doubting story is that of the Emmaus disciples heading home after their hopes uh, were dashed by the crucifixion in Luke 24. The narrator seems undecided as to whether the Cleopas and his companion were blameworthy because they hadn't been able to accept the truth of the scriptural predictions of the Messiah's suffering and death. God forbid, Lord, this must never happen to you. Matthew 16, 22, or because they had never recognized the existence of such prophecies in the first place, which makes a lot of sense. Jesus' patient exposition of numerous scriptural verses as predictions of his just completed suffering poses another problem. Jesus rebukes them for not noticing these predictions as if they should have been impossible to miss. Martin Luther's perspicuity of scripture. But in order to bring them up to speed, he has to open their minds to understand their hitherto esoteric import. This latter presupposes the Pesher puzzle solution technique of exegesis, which posits the Holy Spirit's encryption of prophetic messages transcending the literal sense of the biblical texts. This approach is on display in the Dead Sea Scroll commentaries, especially the one on Habakkuk, as well as in Matthew. These were not messages to be recognized in advance of the events they presaged. They could be understood only after the fact. But in that case, what is Jesus rebuking the Emmaus disciples for? My guess is that Luke's gospel is written so much later and so far outside of Palestine that he didn't know how the system worked. And the result is confusion and obviously doubt. The more sophisticated apologists usually have some familiarity with Pesher exegesis and so are less eager when they used to be to invoke the evidence of fulfilled prophecies of Jesus. I will suggest here that this wise retreat, though an improvement in intellectual honesty, also marks a genuine concession. They had been shooting blanks with that particular gun and wondered why their shots had no effect. Now they know. Matthew was not quoting clairvoyant predictions that had come true, like Gene Dixon predicting JFK's assassination. He was just offering a new readings of old texts and as little more than literary allusions. Did they know what should happen but didn't believe it, or did they not know? Either way, they did not recognize it was the risen Christ informing them of these things. It was only subsequently at table that they suddenly recognized him.
whereupon he vanished into thin air. Without taking a bite, since it was during the blessing that he vanished, this is surely intended as symbolic of the Eucharist, Jesus being invisibly present among believers at the weekly Lord's Supper. As such, it hardly squares with the next incident, our third in Luke 24, in which Jesus suddenly appears in the middle of the disciples in a closed room, which implies his Jacob Marley-like insubstantiality. They naturally think they are beholding the ghost of the slain. Jesus come to bid them farewell, but Jesus convinces them otherwise. He bids them take hold of his meaty hands and feet, a test which no ghost could pass. And for good measure, he eats a bite of fish, something that neither angel nor spirit could manage, having no longer the requisite intestines. As A.J.M. Wedderburn notes, this is just poorly thought out storytelling. The grossly contradictory story seems de designed to buttress and reassure resurrection faith, but instead opens the gate of doubt even wider. John's gospel is our final gospel that we're going to get into. As far as I can tell, though, belief is prominent in this gospel. As it, it shadows unbelief, the specific motif of doubt dominates mainly the Johannine resurrection accounts. There we find depicted the confession of doubt as well as its resolution. But as with the synoptic gospels already surveyed, the Easter stories of John wind up sowing the seeds of doubt even while it seeks to harvest a crop of faith. We may begin with the confusion of Mary Magdalene as she stands alone at the last known resting place of her dead mentor in John 20. Jesus' tomb is shockingly empty. How could things have gotten even worse after the horror of the crucifixion? But they have. Who has made off with Jesus' body? A cruel fate seems to be twisting the knife. The leery-eyed Mary spots a figure standing nearby in the dawn mists. Who could he be? But the caretaker perhaps he can clear things up oddly he knows her at least her name mary perhaps she doesn't recognize him at first because jesus is the last person she could expect to see but somehow it is he the story forms part of a puzzling pattern of non-recognition in, in that easter in chapter 21 the johannine appendix a different first appearance scene occurs again the disciples, having abandoned Jesus in Gethsemane, have now returned to their secular job fishing. Someone waves to them from the shore. Suddenly, one disciple recognizes him, though presumably all can see him just as well. This implies a veil has fallen for that one disciple. Why only him? We are reminded of the Emmaus Road disciples, oblivious of Jesus' identity until the veil parts. Various students of the Gospels have noted how suspicious this is, You'd think these people, who traveled with Jesus daily for months or even years, would have read, readily recognized him even after the crucifixion. Surely they would think, good God, that's Jesus. Was that somebody else up there on the cross? Or was he taken down alive? Well, who cares? He's back. We are naturally tempted to think, did they miss Jesus so much that they saw a familiar face or form and later wondered, could that have been Jesus? This was Hugh J. Schoenfeld's belief. Others, more recently, have seen in these stories reflections of early itinerant preachers and healers who took as their motto Jesus' words, whoever hears you, hears me. No such speculation disproves the Christian faith, but the possibilities they raise do tend to devalue the traditional appeals to the Gospel Easter stories as trustworthy eyewitness accounts. The piecemeal character of the Johannine Easter episodes cast doubt on several of the links in the narrative chain. As already noted, the fact that the miraculous catch of fish in John 21 seems intended as the first resurrection appearance, but so does the appearance to Mary early in chapter 20. Note also that at tw chapter 20, 19 through 23, the replay of Luke's chapter 24, 36 through 43 cannot follow logically from the meeting with Mary because that one seems to think it is only resurrection appearance since Jesus bids her tell the disciples goodbye for him, implying they will not see him for themselves. But in the very next scene, they do. Likewise, the John chapter 20, 19 through 23 scene must envision the presence of Thomas, since the object of Jesus' visit is to impart the Holy Spirit 
to equip them for their apostolic ministry. Yet retroactively in the following scene, we learn that Thomas was running out an errand when Jesus dropped in. This is because the doubting Thomas scene is motivated by a different theological concern. The point is no longer Jesus bestowing the keys to the kingdom to the College of Apostles, but rather to urge readers to believe without having seen Jesus for themselves. No thought is given to narrative continuity. This is often the case in ancient narrative, where the plot line, such as it is, mainly functions as a string along which to arrange the various pearls or charms, each as aesthetic or didactic object in its own right. But this drives home once more that in the Gospels, we are dealing with literature, not history. The apologetical task might be described as trying to convince readers that the literary is historical in order to give themselves permission to imagine that they live in the fiction, the epic, the myth. And surely one of the most flagrant tip-offs that the Gospel of John is fictive is the moment in chapter 20, verse 29, where Jesus actually seems to be breaking the fourth wall and speaking directly to the audience. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. We can almost imagine Jesus winking. That's how I understand it. Doubt is, of course, a synonym for uncertainty. And for those who, whose faith rests upon the belief in an infallible scripture, any ambiguity in scripture is as bad as blatant contradiction. Since in either case, one is left wondering what one is being commanded to do or to believe. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. But if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will prepare for battle? The devout biblicist is thus left in doubt. And the one thing inquiring minds want to know is, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come back? What answer is John's gospel provide? Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side and do not be faithless, but believing. So for John, the risen Jesus proposed a solid, solid fleshly body. But on second thought, maybe John's Jesus doesn't mean that at all. You see, the ancient Near East was rife with tales of ghostly apparitions, and sometimes the haunting dead drifted insubstantially, composed of misty ectoplasm, but still bore the wounds that killed them. They would display these wounds not to signal they still had flesh, but rather for identification purposes. Yep, it's Vito, all right. He still got that pull cue up his butt, but if the return Jesus were made of ectoplasm, it sure would have been easier to put your hand in my side. Can we really know that is dogmatized on which version John had in mind? In conclusion, if you're being distracted by an incessant knock at the door, don't worry. It may be an axe murderer, but rest assured it's not me. I'm not trying to share with you the good news that your Christian faith is misplaced or in vain, but it is my task, even if self-appointed, to try to keep you honest when it comes to the Bible. If Scripture gives you welcome promises, it also bequeaths you serious doubts, and your faith will not be worth much until you face up to them fair and square. I must admit, also, I left out in particular the Acts situation in Acts chapters 9-11, through 11, where the author of Luke, Acts, is definitely harping back to the Jonah story utilizing Jonah from the first healing that happens with Aeneas and then Tabitha and then Cornelius. You have a miracle of Cornelius getting the Holy Spirit and Peter's convinced that this unclean person is now clean. This Jonah story appears often in the early traditions and you have to wonder, is this the point of the resurrection is that it's going to those who are not Jews and this is their obvious evidence that the resurrection is true is that non-Jews are believing the message. I'm highly suspect to thinking that's the case, but never forget, I'm not gonna knock on your door and I hope that you'll be honest. I think it's better to be a doubting Thomas than a blind fool. Dr. Richard C. Miller, we talked about Justin's confession. We talked about how he's compare, comparing Jesus. We believe nothing different, nothing different than what you do with the Sons of Zeus. You list off a bunch of people, Caesars, eyewitnesses, the whole nine. You've given us some detail on that, and I must—I want to do something 
while we're critiquing the kind of literalist approach, I also want to critique those who want to act like this is Xerox parallelism and like, uh, this is exactly the same story. I've heard some atheist sides that really do not do justice for this whole argument you're posturing for us to see. Right. And, and, and that is, they go, well, Dion Jesus is just Dionysus again in another story. And then Osiris is just another okay. story. It's like almost yeah. like a Xerox copy parallelism. We've seen like some videos circulate on the internet where Jesus has 12 disciples. Horus has 12 disciples. Horus was born on December 25th. Horus was this and Horus. And yeah. it's like, mm, you're not being accurate with the source. So yeah. um, why would Justin or anyone compare Jesus to the other figures? Is there something in their stories that highlights a comparison that is worth noting? Like Hercules dies in a certain way and then ends up becoming deified or what would you say are some of the elements of those myths? Yeah. Well, first I want to point out that those are archetypal figures that he's, you know, Bellerophon, Hercules, Asclepius. These were the, these were the most important. This was the installment of an individual into the classical Mediterranean hall of fame. And those were the archetypal figures. Those were the ones that set the standard on how those kind of stories should be produced and how they would have signaled in the ancient world. And so mimetically, or following Hellenism, that is patterning after prior Hellenistic form or Hellenic forms, the, the, all those that come after them are in some ways echoing many of the motifs and registering many of the same signals in order to classify them within this demigod tradition. It was an honorific tradition, not an ontologically real you know, thought in terms of uh, that that each individual was in fact a demigod in the in the most scientific, pure, knowledgeable sense. Rather, it was an honor that was bestowed on them, almost like a trophy or a, like I said, the Hall of Fame, kind of like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or something like this in the yeah. ancient world. These were the ones that were the most celebrated, the most iconic, and to, in order to get installed in that, you needed to be basically patterning your life in, or, or have your story told in, in a way that patterns after these archetypal figures in one way or another. Um, in terms of the Xerox copy, no, Jesus is a Near Eastern installment in this. He's a garden variety sample from that world, an adaptation in the Near East, a Levantine example, something coming up out of Judaism. It's really kind of bizarre if you think about it, but if you back off a little bit and go, okay, we've seen this before, a, a deity with a demigod son with a storied life that has feats and this sort of thing that's born of a mortal woman and, uh, and, and with a divine parent. And then at the end of their career ascends to heaven or has some other manifestation of their translated state, whether it's a vanished body or any number of other signals that I detail in the book. And so... Um, that was the tradition, and so it's important to take a peek at, or take a, actually a, a very uh, careful look at, each one of those archetypal figures to, in order to kind of piece together, what are we talking about here, and, and, and how did those stories echo and get uh, used, became used as templates for further installments into the you know, classical Mediterranean Hall of Fame? And uh, it's interesting, because I put in, in the book here, I've got a whole list of individuals that were supposedly sired by Zeus. That is, Zeus was their parent in legend, right? And yet they had a, a mortal parent, a, a mortal mother. And so this was a very common uh, practice in order to elevate your king or your founding figure. These were the kind of, even, even some philosophers and generals and stuff made it into this list in various ways. And so it was a it was a way to hype them up, to give them an elevated status, to give them a better better veneration and visibility in the Greek East, where this sort of thing was commonplace and in fact uh, required in many situations in order for for uh, in order to signal that this was a great figure. In the Roman world, we have um, exaltatio memoriae, and this is the kind of the way of exalting the memory of someone. And so these kind of storied embellishments would be put upon them, you know, the Caesar Augustuses and the, the, la the, the later emperors. In fact, you could only do one or the other, according to Seneca. You're either a fool or you're a king. 
and it, and by king they meant something much higher than what we think. We think uh, even the emperors were often not even regarded as kings in Rome. The founding figures were, and so um, so in either way, what he's saying you're either the most amazing exalted one, or we're going to deface you. And so you get Claudius, who's lampooned, thrown into Hades. And that's his pumpkinification, you know, um, which is a, a mockery of the, it's actually a play on the word apotheosis. And so he is, instead of installed into the Hall of Fame, he's, his story is told of being down in Hades and going through toils and all of the people that he upset now uh, making him face all of the, uh, you know, uh, ignoble deeds and, and things that he had done as a tyrant, according to Seneca. And so... Um, so he's getting damn Nadio Memoriae. His, his memory is being damned. And so a lot of his statues would then be defaced and, you know, he's not given honor. In a non-democratic world, this is the one, one of the last major powers that the public had over these figures. They needed then to live up to high standards because they wanted an exalted Nachleben, that is, to be thought of later after they're gone as great figures and, and to have a legacy after them rather than to be denounced. And so in a non-democratic world, this the disenfranchised then, the public was able then to have the power of either exalting these figures after they've passed on, sometimes even before, or even damning them. Now, they wouldn't do that before because they'd be put in trouble, but um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this was this was how that worked. And Seneca is very clear that those are the only two outcomes uh, for any given emperor. You, you're, you're either one or the other. And so um, I think we looking at the archetypal figures, I did want to read this excerpt. So this is from uh, Cicero. He talks about it and he lists the archetypes here. And this is how he sees it. Now, each word in here is, is important. So please not let, don't let me gloss over any of this as as just me reading. So. Uh, human manner and community custom establish that they, as regards fame and disposition, raise up to heaven. In other words, it's a community act. Persons of distinguished benefaction. These are people that are benefiting society, that are esteemed in that way as, as elevating the quality of, of, of ancient life in some way or provided as examples, icons. Thus, Hercules, Castor and Pollux, that's the Dioscuri that Justin mentions. A lot of these are mentioned by, by Justin. Asclepius, also mentioned by Justin. Liber, also known as Dionysus, I think also mentioned by Justin, if I'm not mistaken. Romulus, we've already been talking about him. The, that's the, those, are the, those are the archetypal figures. Now, you might quibble about one or two others in, in the list or whatever, but he's getting at the heart of the matter. He, he carries on and he says, the same one whom you regard as Quirinus, just kind of like what we do with Jesus. He's given a second title. This is lofty God title, right? Mm -hmm. and Jesus is the Christos and uh, Romulus is Quirinus. So um, with their souls enduring and enjoying eternal life are fittingly regarded as gods since they are the best and thus are immortal. And so that's the Hall of Fame. Cicero by the way, let me tell you a little bit about him. So he was, he had proximity. He was during the time of Julius Caesar and Augustus. He was the top senator, the most influential and powerful politician in that world besides the emperor. He had a front row seat to the, the beginning of the emperor cult and in fact was a participant in how that was formed and, uh, and had a, a, an inside look at what exactly that meant and what they were trying to do with the emperors in, re in regard to this tradition. And he writes about this and tells you. Yeah, yeah. And he, he admits all of this and says, this is exactly what we're doing. And so basically, uh, the Roman emperors that come are patterned after these because they also have to be demigods, you know, Caesar Augustus with Apollo and so forth. And so um, now, not each one has this. Some of them have apotheosis. Some of them have the, I imagine if I were to continue, if we were to continue and interrogate all of classical literature, we don't have it all surviving. Right. But, but if, we, if we were able to get access to that, I'm sure that we would find much, much more evidence for each emperor along the way. Pretty much it was the custom. In fact, this is what I detail in the book. How were, what was the funeral for a Caesar like? And so 
basically they'd have a wax effigy of the Caesar. The actual body would be done away with in, in a personal, well, done away with is the wrong word, but a personal funeral for the family. But then they would create a wax eff effigy that would go into the, the auditorium and uh, the, um, the forum and they would bring out, uh, the, the public would show up and there would be this huge ceremony there and they would burn the effigy. Why would they do that? Well, it's in alignment with Heracles, who's, it's Heracles and Romulus that are the two most archetypal in the tradition. And so Heracles, at the end of his trials, um, his, his feats, his proving that he should be Heracles, the demigod, um, at the end of it, he uh, is, is killed on a pyre. He dies a, a sort of a kind of proto-martyr's death on a funeral pyre, a, a burn, you know, a kind of a, a burned at the stake kind of situation. And in this, his, he ascends to heaven and there's no, there's no bones that they come in and they have eyewitnesses go and pick through the fire. They can't find any bone remains. And therefore he's regarded as translated. His body did not see decay. He in fact was a demigod. And so that's the tradition. And, uh, and that gets re kind of ritualized in the consecration of the Roman emperors as each one receives exaltatio memoriae um, at, in their funerary consecration. So I see, even in what you said, <clears throat> his body shall not see decay, like sounds biblical. Um, it sounds Jesus-y and uh, Jesus-y, but it is an interesting thing you're describing here. It makes me think of all of these figures he lists as examples and not in a xerox copy way but as like a prototype like you're saying and, and an example of look we believe he became a god too okay mm -hmm. he's not necessarily saying oh well jesus jumped on a fire and like or you know like some you need to see literally in a story uh -huh. which i find thrown at us skeptics or critics all the time with a secular approach is that and that's, I think, just kind of pointing out why I think so many over-exaggerate, even on a skeptical side, to try and act like, no, identical parallels without the falsifying data. Because right. the reaction typically is, you can't prove, well, if Jesus didn't dump on, jump on a fire, or if <laughs> right. Jesus didn't have a senate kill him, like, like how far are you willing to go? Right. <laughs> like, do you need a Xerox to be proven wrong here about your views? Right. It wouldn't even be believable in that. I mean, it wouldn't even be legitimate if it were exactly the same because none of the others were exactly the same. All of the other predecessors or successors rather to this tradition had their own kind of garden variety variation on it. Some of them died this way and that, but the idea was the body was missing. That's the kind of the linchpin of it all. And so, and, and that's the one theme that you see top to bottom, that the body goes missing. They can't find the body. And what that signaled in terms of what they were trying to say was, it, imagine if the body was found. What does that mean? Oh, clearly mortal. Yeah. You can't find the body. It's got to be gone. It's got to, it's, they have to be translated. And so uh, it became basically one of the signals that, that indicated translation. Now, the other tradition is Romulus, which is a very, is a different kind of story, but has the same underlying meta narrative, the same honorific kind of uh, mode and purpose to it. And it has, this, it, it has many of the same um, uh, character points. And in fact, you find those conflated in various ways in terms of mimicry later and, and, and mimetic um, kind of work against this in, in, in later uh, permutations of the translation fable. And so, and with Romulus, it's a little different. There you get the eyewitness testimony, Julius Proculus and road encounters and uh, great commissions and mountaintop species and a whole bunch of other stuff. And he's taken away in a cloud and, and this sort of thing. And there's a thunderclap and, and, and prodigies. I mean, it's, a, it's very much I mean, in, in the gospels, it's an earthquake. I think in some other accounts, there are also earthquakes. There's so basically following the Romulian tradition, you end up with uh, a number, another set of motifs then that variously recur that are signaling, hey, this guy's kind of, he's, a, he's, a, he's the, the new Romulus, so to speak. And so rulers in the ancient world, the, the, broadening this out a little bit beyond just the translation fable, anyone who wanted to rule in the Greek East, you know, from, the, from Alexander onward, basically, had to have these different signals in, in their life. And they had, and then from then on also, they needed to be 
cast as imitations of each one of these archetypal figures. Once you get to Alexander the Great, he was great in his own right, the greatest. And so from then on, if you wanted to rule in the Greek East, you were measured against the greatness of Alexander. And you had to, in some ways, put your own propaganda forth that you are basically the next Alexander, so to speak. Kind of like Julius, uh, Julius Caesar defeated the Gauls. And literally, they nobody had ever, not even Alexander the Great, defeated them. And he did. And that was a way of going, yeah, even though the feat that really Alexander the Great did was much greater overall yeah. uh, as far as what he accomplished. Yeah. Uh, Julius Caesar was able to say, look, I did something even Alexander the Great didn't do. They were all met, and I've got a great book on that. Maybe we could post it in the in the video or whatever. That's that's and it's by someone that has nothing to do with Christianity. What they're interested in is um, later Alexanders, individuals, and, and this is across the line. And people, the individuals who wanted to rule in that area, in that region of the world, had to, in some ways, imitate Alexander in their coins, in their dress. We have. Uh, even pushing over into Rome, we had individuals imitating Romulus. The, the, the Caesars, many of them would live right in Romulus's supposed house. They had a house there that was supposedly, now we, know, now we know Romulus to be a legendary figure, but they had a house there that they regarded as the actual original house of Romulus. And they would live in his house, dress like him, the whole thing, and, and put in, they wanted down their coins, they wanted everything to look like this is in, in complete alignment with the legacy of Romulus. And so basically they were in lockstep. You go to Mark Antony, he's living with Cleopatra and so forth in Egypt, and he's dressing like Dionysus and Heracles. So he's got the loincloth and he's got the, all of the, 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 he would walk around. In fact, he was almost made fun of in some ways because he took it so far. And so he's, yeah, he, and so in that part of the world, you had to imitate these figures in order to be, in order to achieve ca cultural capital and credibility. And so this was a deliberate uh, propaganda kind of um, strategy that recurred over and over again with each particular ruler. In fact, I don't know of an exception. So, so the, yeah. the, the sum up what you're saying ultimately at the end of the day is that if you wanted to be somebody kind of like John Dominic Crossan when he was debating a Muslim and explaining to the Muslim if Muhammad existed in the first century and he was not a son of God or was not proclaiming a son of God, we probably wouldn't even know who this guy was. Nobody would have wrote about him. He'd have been a nobody little laughable whatever. And if he was mentioned, he was mentioned in mockery, never in fame. So it's because they, he, you know, seventh century Arabia, Christian domination debates within was God, did God die on the cross kind uh -huh. of debates of theology that even allows Muhammad to even come up with his ideas that you see within the Quran that are even able to take off. But you're suggesting like if they weren't doing what the propaganda was in the Greek and Roman world, you can just say goodbye to Jesus ever have taken off. Right. And that's a fact. That is a fact of history. I, I, I think that w basically in that world, when someone was great, you had to frame their life in that fashion. They, it was Think of like a decorative frame in the Elizabethan era or something where you'd have a famous, paint, a, fa a famous figure who's painted. They would take all day and paint them and everything, and they would be in their best dress and everything. Imagine that on the wall. Now you've got this thick, ornate, beautifully, meticulously carved frame that goes around that painting that is itself its own work of art. Think of that this way. And so birth narratives, divine birth narratives, and translation at the end of their career to become a demigod or to be installed in this hall of fame, that was the protocol for elevating the individual. This is a person of extreme significance. Now that's scandalous for a Palestinian peasant to be also installed. Ethnically different, not central, definitely on the margins, in the backwater of Galilee. That's the offensiveness of this. So this was supposed to be reserved for the greatest and, and most iconic uh, figures in classical antiquity. And now you have this group coming forward with their hero and saying, no, 
screw you guys, we've got our own guy. <laughs> and so uh, that's, that's really the offensiveness of it. And that's where you see the edge in the earliest Christian texts. And that's where people are fussing. That's where the discussions are going on. And that's where people are getting killed. It, it really forces me to want to ask you, like, what do you think happened that made this peasant from the backwaters of Galilee even popular? This is a famous thing that I used to hear when I was with Richard Carrier and Robert Price was like, well, if this guy did exist, I mean, you know, he would have been a nobody. And then if he was a nobody, who would have ever made him this somebody, right? So mythicists yeah. have this leg up argument where they're like, there'd be no reason if he was just this nobody. And part of me wonders, I mean, why deify this guy at all? And who was clever enough to have come up with that, you know? Well, so it's the philosophy, it's the way. So the early Christians called, this is the way, right? You find this in Acts and a, and a few other early Christian texts. This is their philosophy that they're bringing forward. This is their, their cultus, their, their system of thought, their strategy, their religious devotion, their piety. All of that's at stake for this. And so basically the frame then, and this is where theologians get it backwards. Not that I like to speak much to theology, but the frame is what gets, gets emphasized in creeds and so forth, that frame that goes around Jesus. But the teachings themselves, eh, you know, that's if people may variously take that seriously, but they take deathly seriously whether Jesus rose from the dead, whether there was a virgin birth, whereas the ancients would not have saw it that way. They would have seen that frame as exalting the philosophy, the founding figure, the icon that's being elevated there. That's what they, that's what they were trying to get to. And so it's the content in the Gospels, not the bookends to it, that is being exalted by this. And so this is a stylistic, literary pattern, a generic pattern that exists in, in many, many, many texts. And I outline hundreds of them here. And so basically... The philosophy being proffered by the early Christians, that's what's being elevated. And this was how they did that. This is how they did that in the ancient world. To exalt a figure, they needed to be embellished with these framing contours. Dennis McDonald debated Mike Lacona not too long ago, about a year ago. And he said in that debate, he goes, it's the 80 chapters of Jesus' sayings and teachings and moral lessons and parables that provoke the five chapters about that frame of what you're describing, apotheosis, birth narrative, death, resurrection, whatever. It's the 80 chapters that people, he says, Christians should be focused on the 80 chapters. They make the five everything and not the 80. And the 80 is where it's at. So it now makes sense hearing you say that, how what you're suggesting makes a lot of sense in, in, in line with what Dennis McDonald was saying. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I think that and, and if anything there, I mean, if there is something to be had from this in terms of just humanistic, the human plight generally, if we were to just kind of divorce it from the religious kind of constructs and sacredness of everything, if we can't extract anything from Jesus in terms of, of value today, it would be there. It would be looking at his love your, love your enemies and, and these core kind of um, valuable philosophical ideas and ideals that he's proposing there. And those are, that's the treasure. And so, yeah, thank you. I hope you liked my dad, Richard Miller, in this interview. Remember to like and subscribe. And never forget, we are Miss Vision. <laughs>